What's up guys? It's yo boy on the Sensei back with Reborn as Tetsuya Shiba in DXD Part 7. If you enjoy my content, subscribe to the channel, like the video, share, and leave a comment. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. It has been a few days since Tetsuya and the others came back to Kuo, and currently Tetsuya and his group were on their way to the academy, since their vacation had come to an end. Well, seriously, it is still hard for me to believe that a vacation just came to an end like that. I mean, it feels like it was just a couple of days since the school was closed. Tetsuya looked at the girls who were discussing among themselves and said, what do you mean by that didn't we experience all we could do in summer vacation? Going to a beach, amusement park, Grimory mansion, etc. Hearing that, all of their brows twitched and all of them said in unison, yeah? but being strapped to a band which does not even allow to walk properly was not something you would do on a vacation. Not to mention how many times our skin got burnt. All of them nodded their head and glared at Tetsuya. Tetsuya just shrugged it off and said, you should be thanking me. You got strong because of that. Not to mention, you were able to last longer in our night sessions as well. And keeping that matter aside, you all had your fair share of fun as well, right? All of them then nodded their heads, but still glared at Tetsuya and said, even so it still sucks. Tetsuya just shrugged his shoulders and said, then in compensation of that, let's have a trip later this year, just us and nobody else. An exclusive group trip for our team, how about it? Ah, no training as well. Hearing that all of them cheered up and nodded their heads with enthusiasm. But then Tetsuya noticed something and looked at Miyuki and asked, what happened Miyuki, you are spacing out a bit. Miyuki who was concentrating on something looked at Tetsuya and said, nothing on Isama, just felt something unusual. Tetsuya then concentrated as well and then noticed something and said, uh, I understand, and kept walking, making others a bit curious. Later when everyone were in their classes, everyone else felt something as well, and all of them except for Miyuki, had a wry smile on their faces while they thought, so this is what Miyuki called unusual, while Miyuki thought, so the trash is here. Soon the teacher in Tetsuya's class entered along with an orange head twin-tailed girl behind her, which made Zenobia and Asami a bit surprised seeing her here. The teacher then motioned the girl to introduce herself to the others. The girl then took a step forward and smiled and said, Hello everyone my name is Arena Shidu, and I will be studying with you all from now on. I hope that we all can get along well. The whole class went into uproar with boys celebrating that a hot girl joined their class, while the girls discussing how cute Arena was. The teacher then silenced the class, and motioned Arena to take a seat beside Asami. Arena then happily sat beside Asami, and then talked to the others. Currently, in the orc, all the members were assembled on the room, and were looking at the two girls who were staring at each other for a while. Though Tetsuya was not interested in it, and was currently gaming along with Gasper. Miyuki who was smiling while looking at her childhood friend said, So I see that some international trash is sent here today. Arena smiled as well and said, Oh, I heard that there was an icy garbage bin here, so I just came to check how it looked like. Miyuki's lips twitched and she said, Ah, uh, then I can dump the trash in that bin. It would be an honor for the trash to be dumped in that bin. Arena chuckled and said, Ah, uh, so you have been picking trash as a part-time lately, Miyuki. Miyuki just placed a hand on her. Hikan said, Well, there have been a lot of garbage here, so someone have to take care of it. And currently I have an at H of throwing some international trash back to the country. And her aura slightly released. Tetsuya who noticed that said, Miyuki don't kill her, she is a friend. And continued to play the game. Miyuki just clicked her tongue but soon smiled and said, What you may be talking about on Isama. I am not a person who will kill like that. I will torture them in a freezing hell till they die. Thought Miyuki. The girls in Tetsuya's group then thought at the same time. Her thoughts can be clearly heard by us. Ria's then separated the two, and then began discussing about why Arena came to Japan. Miyuki just ignored them and sat beside Tetsuya and lied in his lap. Arena who noticed this had her brows twitching and she thought, why do I feel like she is doing it intentionally? But soon their eyes met, and Miyuki showed a victorious smoke to her seeing which she thought, she is totally doing it with intention. Arena then ignored her and started talking with Zenobia and the others, and told them about her becoming an angel, and revealed her wings. Seeing that the Gremory group were a bit surprised and started to ask her about it. Arena who was receiving attention because of her being an angel, puffed her chest and said, I am an ace you know, and that too of Michael Sama. Ah dash, but before she could continue Miyuki said, don't think much about it. She just the same the only difference in her is that previously she was shit, and now she is holy shit. And started playing a game as well while lying on Tetsuya's lap. The whole room got silent and looked at the siblings not giving a fuck to what they all were doing, and concentrating on their games. They then turned towards Arena who was fuming with anger, but was somehow controlling herself. Tetsuya then said, don't take her words at face value. She is just saying that even if you are an angel now, from the inside you are the same Arena as before and continued to play while Miyuki just blushed in embarrassment and looked away from all of them, and hid her face in Tetsuya's abdomen while hugging him, seeing that the rest of them chuckled while Arena just smiled. Tetsuya just patted Miyuki's head and kept the game aside. After all of them calmed down, Ria's decided to hold a celebration for the joining of new member in the club, and started preparing. Asia, Asami and Kagura decided to go for grocery shopping, while Tetsuya just went with Kiba to set up the table, and all in the clue room. Tetsuya who felt someone in his territory smoked and sent a telepathic message to Kagura, 
Kagura who felt her link connect with Tetsuya's, didn't took any time and said, yeah, the asterisk bastard is just in front of us. After Asia, Isami and Kagura left the orc for buying the groceries. While returning back all of them stopped once they heard a voice. Hello. All of them turned around and saw a black haired man whose eyes were barely open, and had a smile on his face, giving off a friendly aura. Suddenly Kagura felt her link connect with Tetsuya's, and informed him about the devil's arrival. Isami noticed the demonic energy coming out of Diodora, and immediately took a distance from him and said, a devil. What are you doing here? Hearing that Asia raised his hand to stop Asami from doing anything in public and said, Asami be aware of your surroundings before you take any actions. Hearing the two of them died or a frown a bit and said, don't you remember me? Hearing that Asami got confused and looked at the male in front of him for a while, and soon she realized something and said, I, I know you. You were the one whom we met in the youth meet, you were trying to hit on Asia but were immediately shut down by her, before you could even give your name. Diodora's brows twitched on hearing Asami talk about him like that, and he immediately wanted to attack her, but still remained calm. Diodora just smiled and said, Do you mind coming with me for a while Asia-san? But Asia just turned around and said, Sorry, there is some work that we have to do. Seeing her walk away without even considering his offer Diodora felt pissed, but didn't show his expression on his face. Seeing her walk away Asami and Kagura just gave a curt bow and followed behind Asia, but soon all three of them noticed him following them. Diodora caught up to them and said, then you don't mind if we converse while you are your way back, right? Let me introduce myself, I am Diodora Astareth, a devil from the house of Astareth. Seeing that they could not shake him off, they just introduced themselves to him, and just gave vague answers to his questions. They wanted to just beat the crap out of the guy following them, but stopped themselves as they were in public places, and unlike them, if Diodora was an arrogant prick, who would not even care about harming the humans near them. Plus there would be some problems from the devil side who will rant out on how three little girls ganged up on a high-ranking devil, and humiliated him in front of the others. Something which would only give Tetsuya a headache, which they did not want to do. Tetsuya who heard the matter from Kagura, said that if they want they can dispose him, and he will take care of the matter. But Asia rejected his offer and said that there was no meaning for him to do something like that as it would just be bothersome. Tetsuya then thought for a while, and then gave Sona a call and said, Hey Sona are you and the student council free right now? Sona then thought for a while and then said, well, we are mostly done with our work, just the devil stuff is left. Is there something that you want my help with? Nah, just wanted to ask whether you wanted to join us at the Orc for a small party. It would be fun if all of you joined as well. Sona thought for a while and then said, Very well then, it can be considered as a reward for my peerage who have worked hard during the whole vacation. Fine, we will be there in 15 minutes. Tetsuya then ended the call and told Riaz about the student council, who immediately approved of it as her friend was joining them as well. A few minutes later Asia and the others came back with Diodora behind them as well, seeing which Riaz and the Gremory group was confused. Tetsuya then said, Well well what do we have here? Diodora gave a bow and said, Hello everyone, I am Diodora Astareth from the Astareth clan. I hope that I didn't bother you. Riaz came forward and said, No no, it is fine. But what is the reason for your sudden visit? Diodora turned around to look at Asia and said, Well I just came to meet the person I love. Hearing that everyone frowned and Zenobia said, Why why you love Gasper? After which the already motionless Gasper started crying and hid behind Tetsuya for protection. Diodora got completely shocked by what he heard and opened his eyes only to notice that Asia was not standing there. And in her place, there was a small vampire girl. He then looked around the room and saw Asia talking to Tetsuya with a smile on her face, which immediately infuriated him. Diodora then waved his hands and said, No no, I am talking about Asia not the vampire girl. Gasper who was standing behind Tetsuya said, I, I am a BB boy, and I am not interested in you. Asia then turned around and said, I already told you that day, I already have a boyfriend, and liked her arms with Tetsuya's. Tetsuya just shrugged his shoulders and said, you heard her man. But Diodora totally ignored Tetsuya and said, Asia Sen, do you really not remember me? Asia without taking any time said, nope. Hearing which the whole Gremory group looked at Diodora with pity. Diodora sighed and took his robe off and opened a few buttons of his shirt and revealed his chest with a deep scar on it along with some prosthetics attached to his body. Seeing the scar the whole room remained silent, but soon Asia broke the ice and said, sorry, but even if you are ready to sell your body, then too I am not interested in you. You can wear your clothes, which made the whole atmosphere around the room completely awkward but soon most of them just kept their hands on their mouths so as to not laugh at the bare-chested devil. Diodora who was completely shocked by Asia's answer said in disbelief, D did you really don't remember? You were the one who treated this scar. Just dash but Asia said even if I treated you there is no way that I can remember all the ones whom I have healed, there are way too many of them. Sorry about that. And gave a helpless smile. Diodora just shook his head and said, no, that's understandable, but still I wish to let you know that at that moment. I fell in love with you. It was just as if my destiny. But then the door was opened and the student council lead by Sona came in with all of them being completely serious, as they already felt a devil's presence inside the room. Sona who noticed Diodora without his shirt, looked at the others for answer to which Tetsuya said, don't mind him the man here is to get rejected for the second time. Tetsuya then looked at Diodora and said, oh, and regarding Asia being the one healing you, are you the one because of whom she was banished from the church? To which Diodora just got dejected and said, I am really sorry about that, and that is also one of my reasons why I want to hell dash Tetsuya then said, just leave it at that there is one thing that I wanted to ask, why the hell will a devil, 
much less someone from a high-ranking house go to Vatican the HQ of Heavens. Not to mention it was Jury G that time when the three biblical factions were not even at peace. Hearing that all of them remained silent and looked at the devil for answers even Rias and Sona along with their queens, narrowed their eyes at him, because now there is a possibility of him being a traitor. Sona adjusted her glasses and said, really, now even I want to know about this matter. Rias folded her hands under her breasts and said, now now don't be like that, let's have a seat, and then we can have a nice long talk. Diodora who was now confronted by the two heiresses, now knew that he cannot get away easily. Currently Diodora was seated on a sofa, and was surrounded by people from the Gremory, Citrian Shiba group, while the leaders were sitting on front of him, with Titsaya's being in the middle of the two girls. Titsaya who was smiling said, don't be nervous, we won't bite. Hearing that Diodora thought, limbs anyone would be able to keep his cow, when surrounded by so many people. But still he smiled and said, yeah, I know you won't. Titsaya nodded and said, then please go ahead. Diodora then said, I know what you all might be thinking. But know that I am not a traitor who gives information to the church or heaven. I was looking around for people to dot join my peerage, but messed up in my teleportation and ended up there. Titsaya then said, out of all places around the world, you teleported in your enemy's HQ. Sucks to be you. Hearing that everyone nodded their heads but Sona and Rias were still dissatisfied with his answer. Sona looked at Rias who looked back at her and shook her head. Sona asked, are you really speaking the truth? Diodora nodded and said, yeah. That is true. What would I even gain from going at places like that? Titsaya then said, Now now Sona don't pressure the guy, he was just unlucky. By the way Astra said there is something else I would like to ask. Titsaya then said, Have you learned to teleport to your desired location? To which Diodora nodded his head. Titsaya just smiled and asked, You see, during the youth meet, I saw that most of your peerage were nuns, which got me a bit curious. So I checked it up with Michael, and came to know that all of them were banished from the church as well. Hearing that immediately all of them looked at Diodora and narrowed their eyes, except for Titsaya, who had a friendly smile on his face. You must be a really nice guy to give all those nuns a home after they were banished. Diodora's brows twitched as he felt angered by how Titsaya was playing with him and he said, Yeah, I just want to help them. Titsaya nodded in approval and said, Yeah, you really are doing a good job. You know, I even come to know that the reasons of banishment though different had something in common. They all were related to a devil somehow. Diodora started to get angrier seeing how the human in front of him was acting. He really wanted to just kill him, but knew that it will do more harm than good to him. Diodora just smiled and said, well, that is the reason why I decided to help them as they were harmed by a member of my race. Titsaya nodded and said, now onto the stuff which I care about Dash. Suddenly all the people in the room felt a strong pressure on their bodies and became stiff. Titsaya who had been smiling this whole time was looking coldly at Diodora, who immediately started sweating on seeing the look in his eyes. Titsaya then asked in a cold tone, with whose permission did you get your ass here in my territory? Rias who was sitting beside Titsaya then thought, he is a goner. Diodora wanted to glare and make the human know his place, but unlike the other times where he was controlling himself to take these actions, this time he was totally unable to do so. His whole body was unable to move, and he could not even match his eyes to Titsaya's cold gaze. Titsaya then said, not only did you enter my territory without my permission but also stalked Asia. You know I really want to know from whom did you got these guys from. Shall I kill you? Hearing that all of them except for Titsaya's group were shocked when they heard Titsaya openly saying to kill him, Diodora glared back at Titsaya but was not able to speak anything seeing which Tetsaya lowered the pressure, so that the devil could speak. Diodora then said, just because you were able to defeat a council man with that weapon of yours, don't act dash Tetsaya, then immediately took out his Excalibur, and immediately all the devils in the room, felt a burning sensation except for Zenobia, but the one who was experiencing the hell, was Diodora, whose holy resistance was near zero, because of T-A-T-S-U-Y-A-C chapter 71 if you forgot. He felt his whole body burning just because the sword was near him. Titsaya smoked and said, what would a saying I didn't hear you, and moved the sword closer to Diodora's neck, making the said devil jump back from his place. Diodora gritted his teeth and said, don't act cocky, just because you have a holy sword. Just be prepared for the consequences. The Astrith clan will not let this slide, not to mention that one of our house members is a male as well. Titsaya just smiled and said, you know, I should ask Ajuka and Serzich's about whether they have any records of sending any devil to Vatican or not. Michael and the others should be knowing about this as well. Hearing that Diodora's face immediately got pale. If Ajuka and the others came to KL about him, then it would totally spoil the plan the Cow's Brigade is making about attacking the Underworld. He would be put in suspicion, and his raiding games where he plans on starting the attack will be lost. Diodora gritted his teeth and immediately teleported away. Once he was gone Sona immediately stood up and asked, Why did you let him leave? Titsaya just put Excalibur away and said, Huh? There was no point in keeping him here anyway, he is not my responsibility. As long as he stays away from my territory and those dear to me, I don't care if he even becomes a mayor. Titsaya then went to a corner and filled a cup with tea, and took a sip and said, Besides, it should be obviously clear to the higher-ups as well, about what game he is playing except for the Cow's Brigade part. They are not foolish, they are overly biased, and are just looking over it. Hearing that both the heiresses narrowed their eyes and Sona asked, What do you mean by bias? We devils always do things fairly. Titsaya just took a seat beside Kaneko and said, So Tan, you are too young to KL how dark politics can get, and that too politics of the devils. 
who thinks that all other races are lower than theirs. You all are even ready to wipe out an entire race, just because someone of that race killed a high-ranking devil. Hearing which Rias and all those who were aware of what he was talking about looked at Kaneko who looked down with a sad expression on her face. Tetsuya just rubbed her head and said, sorry about making you remember something sad. But Kaneko just shook her head and said that it was alright. Tetsuya then said, and it is also not my place to say something about it, when the victim itself is remaining silent. Devils aren't the only ones her to blame, the church too is at fault. And immediately Zenobia and Arena looked at Tetsuya in disbelief. Tetsuya looked at Arena and said, don't look at me like that, the church is not pure as you think it is. There are a lot of unmentionable things that have been done by the church, for example Dash. He then looked at Kiba and said, the Holy Sword Project, and immediately Kiba clenched his fists. Tetsuya then said, the children who were part of the Bi Sword Project, were just killed, just because they were not able to show any results, and not that instead of apologizing and helping the children the church vanished. The one who had made Inchich of the project, who intent to save himself killed every one of his test subjects. But still the church is using the research of the said person to make holy sword welders. Tetsuya then kept his cup down and then said, You see it is easier for the factions to place the blame on someone else, rather than taking responsibility for it. So I hardly believe that something much would be happening to the devil. Tetsuya then stood up and said, Well, I don't think that anyone is in the mood for celebration right now. So let's do it at a later date. Ah, and if you want to deal with Diodora, just think carefully before taking any actions. If you mess up then it will only pull you in deeper shit. And walked out of the room with his group following behind him. After Tetsuya and the others reached their home, all the girls immediately surrounded him and asked. Why were you saying something like you don't care about the problem, when not only you cursed most of his body, but also is stopping him from attempting to do the same to any more nuns? You could have killed him in an instant. Tetsuya looked at the group for a while, and then moved past them and said, yeah. I have indeed keeping his actions in check, so that no more girls get in trouble because of him. But the people back there also need to know that their factions are not as righteous as they think. I don't want them to do as their factions ask them to do without thinking about it. They will be used and tossed aside as pawns if their factions deem them useless. You all have already seen how Zenovia and Arena were sent here to deal with the Excalibur. They were ready to be thrown away if the mission was to get found out. All of them then became silent and just looked at Tetsuya thinking about what he said. Tetsuya then took a seat and said, Besides, I let him live was not because I don't care but to make him take his action hastily and make more mistakes. Arrogant shits like him should be immensely pissed out by now, and he must have already started to take his actions. Meanwhile in the underworld, Ash Asherith territory, in a room which was completely destroyed and had rubble all around, it was a single person sitting in the center of the room. The said person stood up and gathered demonic energy in his hands and fired aimlessly. That human needs to die I will give him the most gruesome death there is he will be begging for mercy from me. How dare he talk to me like that? And that bitch Asia, how dare he look at someone else other than me? I didn't allow her to do that looks like she needs to be punished yeah. That innocent lamb must be disciplined she must know WHO is her master. He then made a magic circle and a projection of a man appeared in it. What happened? Is something wrong at your end? Shoba, make the preparations faster. Someone is getting bold enough to report about my actions to that foolish Ajuka. If I get under suspicion, we will be having troubles in initiating the attack. Hearing that the person who is in the projection frowned and said, who dares to cause interruptions in a plan? Is he strong? Hearing that Diodora snorted and said, strong my ass. It's just a weak human who is trying to bite more than he can chew. Shoba looked at Diodora with hesitation for a while but nodded his head, he then thought, it is not the time to doubt this brat's actions, if what he say really is true then all our effort to attack will be lost. A few days have passed since Daidora came to Kuo, and since then he has been sending a letter daily for Asia, who simply burns them without even reading. Asia, your stalker sent another one, called Hamari. Asia came in the room while massaging her forehead and said, that guy is really persistent now I am beginning to regret declining Tetsuya San's offer to get rid of him at that time. Tetsuya came in the room as well and said, I told you, and shrugged his shoulders. Asia immediately hugged Tetsuya and said, this is getting way too annoying Tetsuya San. Tetsuya just patted her head and caressed her blonde hair and said, then how about we go on a date this weekend to let you get refreshed a bit. And immediately Asia perked up and kissed Tetsuya and said, you are the best Tetsuya San. Tetsuya just pulled her cheeks and said, so the frustration is already gone huh? Taya and I hus Asia said while her cheeks were being pulled. Tetsuya San it hurts, Tetsuya let go of her cheeks which were immediately clasped by Asia who began rubbing them and said, you are mean Tetsuya San. Tetsuya just shrugged his shoulders and said, thanks for the compliment. Amari then said, if you two are done flirting, then what to do with this? And showed the letter to the two of them. Asia immediately said, just burn it. But Tetsuya stopped her and said, now now don't be like that he is sending his feelings to the person he loves. Tetsuya then took the letter in his hand and said, it is unfortunate that he cannot get the girl he loves. But as the nice person I am, I will help him get the girl of his dreams. If anyone don't know who is he referring to as girl of his dreams, check out CH71, Underworld, Asterisk Territory. Diodora who was lying in his renovated room, was giving off a malicious smile, and was holding a letter in his hand. Heh heh heh, so you finally decided to show yourself to me. Ha huh, Asia Chan. Heh 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 I want to see that human's face once he knows that Asia left her side. Heh heh heh. He then got off the bed and changed his clothes, and got ready to be on his date. He immediately teleported back to Kuo, and went to the house whose address was given to him in the letter. He came in front of the door, gave a final check to his appearance, and then rang the doorbell, and held the bouquet in front of his hands. He then heard someone rushing towards the door and smirked, Heh, so excited to see me. 
Huh? But when the door was opened his whole body became stiff and the bouquet fell off his hands. The person who opened the door was a bulked up man slash woman pick whatever you want wearing a magical girl costume and was looking at Diodoro. Oh my, such an handsome man was the one who had been sending letters to this magical girl Miltan. Jeez, how can refuse someone so passionate like you? Come inside. And grabbed the horror struck boy and pulled him inside the house. The woman probably locked the door behind her and looked at Diodoro with passionate eyes, making Diodoro's mind scream in fear. He started backing away but soon came in front of a wall which blocked his path. He wanted to run away, but immediately a hand slammed the wall next to his FACE number cabinet, which scared the shit out of him. The lady looked directly in Diodora's eyes and said, You wrote your name was Diodora, right? Then I will call you Dora-chan, and you can call me Miltan. Diodora who was scared as hell tried to use his magic, but was not able to number wing meant its ire. Miltan then started to lean towards Diodora and whispered in his ears, I will not let you sleep tonight. Diodora immediately shivered and thought, I know I have not been able to sleep because of you for countless nights. He turned his head and wanted to tell her about the problem. But just as he opened his mouth, Miltan grabbed his face and said, So you want to start from a kiss? Very well. Magical girl Miltan will fulfill your wish. And then started to lean forward, after which, the author fainted just from imaging anything further. In front of an apartment from which the sound of someone fighting can be heard. The people who got close to the apartment immediately quickened their pace and rushed off from being anywhere near that apartment. But after a few hours of continuous fighting, the noise stopped, and a few minutes later, the door in front of the apartment opened, and the figure of a young man with lifeless eyes was revealed with his clothes torn from various places. And needless to say the young man was none other than the lucky boy Diodoro, who just came out after spending the night of his life. Diodoro then started walking away though he was limping heavily. He just got to an abandoned alley without making any noise, and made a magic circle and teleported back to Underworld. After a few days the rumors about the Astroth air not coming out of the mansion for five days straight were heard and became the talk of his territory. A few days later, Asia who had stopped receiving letters from her stalker was humming happily while her arms were linked with Tetsaya's. Today is the weekend that Tetsaya promised her to take her on a date, so she was very happy as she was able to spend some time alone with him. Tetsaya who looked at the blonde girl smiling innocently just showed a small smile and said, you know, I can walk on my own and there is also no way that I will just leave you here. Asia just tightened her grip a bit more and said, but isn't this fine as well? I like it more this way. Tetsaya just sighed and said, fine, so is there anything specific that you want to do? Asia thought for a while and then shrugged her shoulder and said, as long as we enjoy then anything is fine. Tetsaya then said, that sounds great. And then both of them just stopped at random stores that they found interesting, played some games at the arcade, and finally had their lunch in a nearby restaurant. As the sun started setting Tetsaya and Asia came to a park, and silently sat on the bench with their eyes closed. Both of them were just enjoying the peace as the only sound which would be heard by them was that of water from the nearby fountain. Tetsaya then opened his eyes and said, I just realized this is the same park where Asami was killed by the fallen angel. Asia opened her eyes as well and said, Here huh? Well I guess this must be it. The silence and lack of people here made it both a good date spot and a good murder spot as well. That fallen was using the date and kill tactics after all. Tetsaya looked at Asia and said, Yeah, and one of them even tried to ask you out while we were on a date as well. Hearing that Asia chuckled and said, Yeah, her acting was good at start, and I totally thought that she was about to ask you out. Tetsaya then said, But you were the one whom she had set her eyes on. Both of them then became silent for a while. But then Tetsaya said, Hey do you remember the first time we met, and how it all turned out with you coming with me? Asia just nodded her head and looked at Tetsaya. Tetsaya then said, I won't say that I think what I did was wrong, but still I want to apologize for not taking care of the devil sooner. If I had did that then you might have been still a numb at the church, but I know that would not have been as exciting as being with us is, right? Asia hugged Tetsaya and said, yeah, it wouldn't be fun at all, and I wouldn't even have any friends like I have now. So you don't have to apologize, instead let me thank you for being with me at those times. It was only because of you that I have a family now. Tetsaya hugged her back and both of them then leaned forward and gave her each other a kiss. Both of them soon serrated and then Tetsaya said, wanna go home. Asia smirked and said, not today. Tetsaya chuckled and said, then a hotel is it, let's get going. And stood up from the bench with Asia following him. But soon a green magic circle appeared under Asia's feet. Both her and Tetsaya looked at the magic circle for a while, and then said at the same time, is the stalker. Tetsaya then said, uh, today must be his raiding game with the Grimry team. Tetsaya and Asia stared at each other for a while, and then Tetsaya asked feeling angry. To which Asia just showed a bright smile on her face. Tetsaya patted her head and said, then go and beat the shit out of him. I will come later as the victim whose girlfriend was kidnapped by some trash. Asia nodded and said, I will make sure to pummel him so much that even shit would look better than him. With a bright smile, Tetsaya just sighed and said, well then enjoy. Asia nodded and then let the magic circle teleport her to Diodora's location. Tetsaya then sat back on the bench and said, let's wait for five minutes before going back to work. Five minutes later, Tetsaya stood up from the bench, stretched his body, and then made a magic circle. He then took a deep breath and said, time for a dynamic entry, and then activated the magic circle and immediately teleported to the underworld. Inth raiding game field where the match between between the Astaroth and Gremory Air were to take place was currently engulfed in a fight between the Cow's Brigade's true Satan faction and the new Satan faction. Suddenly a magic circle appeared in the middle of the field and a black-haired teen appeared from it and shouted, How dare you kidnap her you bastards? 
and release a tremendous force which pushed back all the people far away. Titsaya looked around and saw that nobody he knew was near him, and the rest of them were either blown away or were unconscious, because of the pressure he released. He gave an approving nod and said, yeah my entry was great, totally nailed it. He then located where everyone was, and once he was done he teleported towards them. After Titsaya teleported to the location where he felt others he was met with a sight of many devils firing at each other. He looked around while deflecting any attacks coming his way, and soon noticed Azazel and Surzichs. Yo, Azazel, Surzichs having a party here or what? Azazel and Surzichs turned their heads towards the direction they heard the familiar voice from and said, Oh, brat, yeah, we are having a blast here. How come you are here as well? Did someone invite you? While both of them fired some blasts and spears to random devils, Titsaya was slowly walking towards them, while he also blasted away some devils along the way and said, Yeah, you see the host of the party was so kind that he kidnapped my girlfriend while we were on a date. Hearing that both Surzichs and Azazel's eyes widen, and both of them said at the same time, why the hell would B do something this foolish? Titsaya nodded and fired a beam destroying dozens of devils in an instant and said, yeah, he was even stalking her for a while. Now, that guy's going to be fucked up by her. Azazel rubbed his chin and said, so which one did a host try to court? Asia both Surzichs and Azazel immediately got silent, and then Azazel said, well, he is literally done for then. One less thing to take care of. Soon the Gremory group came to ask for further instructions, and got surprised seeing Titsaya was there as well. Titsaya is here as well. Oni-sama did you call him or was it Azazel? Azazel smiled and said Titsaya is here invited by a host himself. You see he wanted to show his bravery, and for it, he kidnapped the blonde nun from his group, and that too when they were on a date. Hearing that the whole Gremory group got silent as well and Kiba said, well, I pity him. Titsaya then looked at Asami and said, anyway forget about the people who are out to die soon. Asami a surprise test for you. I want you to defeat at least 250 of them. Hearing that Asami got surprised and said, Hey hey isn't 250 a bit too mu dashed Tetsaya interrupted her and said, If you are not able to do it, then I will make Tiamat train you the next time. Hearing that Drake panicked and said, There is no way I am facing that crazy woman. Asami nodded her head furiously as well and said, I agree to that as well. Balance breaker. And got covered in a red armor and took off in the sky, and started destroying the devils with her dragon slayer sword and magic. Soon the other members of the Gremory group started attacking as well, while Citri group joined them soon as well. While this was going on Azazel, Surzichs and Tetsaya were just looking at how much each of them has progressed while also killing anyone brave enough to attack them. Titsaya Chan exclamation point exclamation point exclamation point exclamation point till the tilde and Titsaya immediately turned around and caught the Satan magical girl who jumped on him. Sarah Chan, nice to meet you. Sarah Fall hugged Titsaya and said, did you come to see how this magical girl destroys everything with her magical glittering wand? And waved her wand from which actual sparkles came out. Titsaya shook his head and said, died or I kidnapped Asia on our date. So I am just playing the victim whose girlfriend was kidnapped. Sarah Fall got surprised as well, and soon got serious and said, even a magical girl like me will not do that. Titsaya just patted her head making her transform back to her bubbly self and said, don't think too much. He is as good as dead anyways. Sarah Fall nodded and then joined the other three on seeing how much the young one have improved. Titsaya looked at Asami and said, Asami only 113 done yet. Pick up the pace Asami who just slashed a devil on the chest shouted. I know, I know DDIAIG do your job if you don't want to face that fucking hag. The gauntlet started glowing, and continuous repeated shouts started to come out from it. Boost 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 for our survival boost. Red aura started to come out of Asami as she instantly zipped through the devils, causing small explosion and killing them instantly. Hell yeah, I will survive this after this will be a great fucking session with Titsaya. And started burning the devils with her flames. Sarah Fall, who was standing beside Titsaya, said in a low voice, I will have to make some plans as well. Titsaya who heard him didn't say anything and just left her to her own ideas. If she wants to surprise him, then he doesn't want to ruin it. Soon all four of them felt two strong presences coming towards them, and turned their heads. In front of them two men one with black hair and the other with brown, were standing while glaring at them, while particularly at Surzichs and Seraphal. Azazel rubbed his chin and said, a beals above and an Asmodeus. How interesting. Both of them ignored Azazel and said, so two of the fake mouse are gathered together. Huh? So should we show these fakes the power of the superior blood? If you both kneel and ask for apology, then we might just give you both a painless death. Titsaya looked at Azazel who looked back at him, and both of them said at the same time, it's Shanks who shit time. Azazel rubbed his chin and said, looks like this venerable father should step back and give the young ones a chance to prove themselves. Titsaya crossed his arms and said, then this young master will also observe how talented this young master's seniors are. Azazel nodded and said, this venerable father also wants to see whether the sect leader Surzichs is indeed a talent born in 10,000 years or not. Titsaya had an amused expression on his face and said, here, a talent born in 10,000 years. Then these insects he is facing did not stand a chance. Sarah Fall also decided to play her part and said, then Sister Sarah will help help Marshall brother Shiazet just to crush these insects. She then whispered in a low voice, Surzichs Chan use a punch with enough force to either knock him out or make him spit blood. Surzichs brows twitched and he said, you 
three we are not here to play. We should take them Siri dashed at Saya then said. I heard that Alta Disciple Rias likes this kind of stuff. And Serzuchas immediately said. Let this venerable immortal show you puny insects your place. After which I will make Raya my martial sister. And immediately Lorne head towards the two devils who got in their stance as well. But Serzuchas didn't flinch and just punched the black head Asmodeus in the gut. Which made him cough out a large amount of blood. Azazel smoked and said. Looks like this venerable one did not make a mistake. Tetsaya nodded as well and said. As expected of sect leader Shiazuchas. Seraphor puffed her chest. Hair, martial brother is very strong. He is not called a talent born in 10,000 years for nothing. The black and the brown head devils glared at the four people in front of them and were clearly showing their anger for being looked down on upon by them. Sholba gritted his teeth and randomly fired a lot of blasts of demonic energy towards them. The four of them simply dodged or deflected the blasts coming towards them. While they were dodging Serzichas asked, can't this be stopped between us? We can work together to achieve peace and avoid all the deaths which have been caused by these walls. The black head one snorted and said, peace, alliance and all these things are bullshit. Any race other than us devils should just perish. Tetsaya snorted and said, and that is why you will not be able to join our men of culture sect. Things like race don't bother us at all. Azazel nodded and said, this venerable one agrees as well. Both the devils just got more and more irritated by Tetsaya's and Azazel's rambling, and then started to fire their attacks without even thinking, which made it even more easier for the four to deal with them. But then Serzich's and Seraphol's Siscon sense started ringing bell in their head, and both of them noticed some of their attacks going towards Rias and Sona. Both of them immediately teleported in front of their sister to shield them from the attacks, but Tetsaya appeared in front of the two and fired a beam, destroying all the demonic energy orbs. Tetsaya then said, I didn't know you all were so low to attack their sisters to gain advantage. Yeah, how dare you attack my dear so slash Riatan. Are you both tired of living? Azazel chuckled and said, now you two are goners. Let this venerable one tell you who you are up against. The three in front of you are the elders of Siscon sect. You both are done for. Tetsaya looked at Azazel and said, we are done with Shanksia, so you can stop. Azazel looked a bit disappointed and said, already, asterisk S-I-G-H asterisk whatever, or devils from the old Satan faction. Let me tell you this. The moment your attacks decided to touch their sisters, you were some four. You both have my condolences. Now then Siscon's attack. Currently while Tetsaya and the others were fighting the two old mass, at another location in the underworld, where the whole place was on the verge of breaking down, a black haired teen was hiding behind some pieces of rubble, while a blonde haired girl was happily looking around, probably searching for him with a smile on her face. Asia who had a cheerful smile on her face looked around and said, Hey piece of shit be grateful I'm not using any sensing abilities to find you, but aren't you getting a bit ungrateful by hiding at a difficult place? Bad bastard. A cheerful smile then appeared on her face, and she said, Well this is fine as well, the more time I will take to find you. The harder I will beat the shit out of you. The black haired boy who was hiding was none other than Diodora Astrith, who was also the one who kidnapped the girl. But currently instead of having a smug look on his face, he was just shivering with fear while crouching down and holding his knees. His body was also covered with blood and bruises, which was making it harder to recognize him. Come out, come out wherever you are. Didn't you say that you wanted to play with me? Are you having fun playing this game dash? She then vanished from her spot and appeared near some rubble where Diodora was whispered in his ear, Diodora-san. The boy immediately flinched as fear spread through his body. But before he could do anything a fist connected to his face, sending him flying a few hundred meters away, crashing through multiple boulders and flying right through them. Diodora groaned in pain and opened his eyes only to see the blonde nun who he wanted to torture just right above him flying with a bright smile on her face. But seeing her smile instead of feeling safe, happy or wanting to protect that smile, he felt scared his whole body tensed up, and he just wanted to run away from her as far as possible. The nun then cracked her knuckles and said pummeling time, and punched the boy in the gut, making him immediately crash on the ground as he spit out a large amount of blood. The boy's eyes were becoming hazy as he thought that he was nearing death, his consciousness was slowly fading away. But instead of despair he was feeling happy and a bit excited as well. He could finally escape the hands of this blonde nun, who was beating the hell out of him. Is this how I die? But I don't feel bad about it. Though I wanted to accomplish a lot more things mostly breaking more nuns. But I don't think I would probably do it again. The experience I had with Asia is something I don't want to go through again. Asterisk S-I-G-H asterisk if somehow I were to be reborn again. Then I want to live a peaceful life, not involving any devil politics. Thirst for power, and most importantly the thirst of women. I don't want any of that. I just want a calm life now. Suddenly a blinding light enveloped his consciousness, and soon when it started to die down, a humanoid figure made of the same white light appeared. Seeing him die, Dora was shocked and thought, Huh, is this one of those isekai things? Am I going to actually have a second chance at life? Yeah, now let's think about my wish. But suddenly the glowing man raised his hands and said, Whoa, whoa, stop, jute, stop. Diodora looked at the glowing entity and said, Oh, introductions are in order, but you must already be knowing me. But still, I am Diodora Astereth, and you must be in Rob, now onto the Isaka part. You see I dashed the glowing entity to raise his hand making Diodora stop rambling and then said, Jude, just hear me out. Diodora then asks, What are you not Rob? The glowing entity crossed his hands and said, Of course I am a Rob. But you see Dash Diodora then said, Then it must be my time to reincarnate in another world, right? The glowing entity immediately said, Nah, huh? What do you mean it is not? Oh the blondie still has to beat the shit out of you. B.Y.E. Tilda I just came to laugh at you. And immediately Diodora's surrounding changed. And he opened his eyes only to see the blonde head nun firing a green energy wave at him. Oh, you are awake don't worry I still want to play a bit more. So I healed you. Aren't I nice? 
I did just like how I saved you back then. Diodora who heard her shouted, Nuruuo Asia smoked and said, yes. Diodora looked at the blonde haired girl in front of him and thought, I am going to die anyway. Atlas let me tell you readers what happened to me. Before we started to play hide and seek you see all night. Not so fast Diodora. Ha! Huh. All night. You dare to break the fourth wall. I cannot let this crime go unseen, but author Shaolin don't worry, you ask why, it's because I am here. Cliffhanger smash after Tetsuya and the others were done with the two old satans they looked at each other and Tetsuya asked you all should be able to deal with the rest of them, right? Serzichas and Azazel nodded and said, yeah, Odin should be coming in a moment or two as well. Tetsuya nodded and said, well I am going to see how much distraction Asia caused. See you later. And then started walking towards the direction he felt Asia's presence from. The Gremory group and Citri group also decided to follow him as their older siblings have told them that they can take care of the situation. Isami though was resting on Tetsuya's back as she has overused her powers and was suffering from a serious body ache. You can heal me, right Tetsuya? Yeah, I can. Then why not do it and let your girlfriend out of this pain? Because only if one experienced true pain then only they can know what true peace is. Quote number Nagato. Ah, uh, just sit back and enjoy the piggyback ride. Isami continued to pester him for a while, but seeing that wasn't going to heal her she stopped and just rested on his back. Tetsuya who noticed that said, if you would have fought more efficiently and looked after how much your body could withstand, then you won't be in this condition. Let this be the punishment for you not understanding it. Hey, it was Drake who powered me up. Isn't it his fault? A raid gauntlet then appeared on her hand and said, don't blame me. A sacred gear only answers to the user's wish. It is completely your fault, plus the fact that I don't want to face that crazy woman. See, isn't it his fault for shitting himself because of Tiamat? Whatever, you are not receiving any treatment. Just bear with pain because sometimes you must hurt in order to know, fall in order to grow, lose in order to gain, because life's greatest lessons are learned through pain. Asami and the others remained silent for a while, and then Asami said, where the hell are these quotes coming from Tetsuya ignored her and just continued to walk towards Asia's direction. Once he was close to the location he stopped and gave Asami's body to Kaneko and said, just wait here for a while. I will go first and check how the situation there is. It might be a little too much for some of you. Rias then looked a bit hurt and said, Mon, it cannot be something that be dash. It's Asia who have been interrupted on her date and that too before we were going to the hotel. Hearing that all of them fell silent and tried to imagine what could have happened and just shuddered at the thought. Tetsuya then just waved his hand and walked towards the building, which were now nothing more than ruins. Once Tetsuya entered the ruins he felt some noises and started following it and soon encountered Asia playing volleyball with Diodora where Diodora was used as a ball, while a clone was on the receiving end. I wanna smash, alright, here. The clone then launched the BALL Diodora up in the air as a loud scream came out of Diodora's mouth. Asia then jumped and covered her hand with Kai and smashed her fist in his gut, making him spit out some of the blood which was left in his body, and then immediately he was blown away and crashed in the ground, making a crater similar to the ones which were present all around the ground. Tetsuya then looked at Asia and saw her covered in blood and dust with a cheerful smile on her face. Asia looked at her clone and said, One more time. Looks like you are enjoying a lot. Asia who recognized the voice turned around and saw Tetsuya coming towards her. She just nodded her head and said with her usual bright smile, Yeah, I beat the hell out of him, made his spill his guys out, healed him and then again repeated with beating the hell out of him. Tetsuya then looked at Diodora who was hardly recognizable, and walked towards him and asked, Yo, had your fun playing around with my girlfriend? Diodora looked towards Tetsuya pitifully asking for help, but Tetsuya just smiled and said, Oh, I didn't come to help you. I just came to laugh at you. Hearing that Diodora's eyes widened and he thought, so it was you. Tetsuya then telepathically told him, you thought it was Rob, but it was I Tetsuya. Tetsuya then took out his gun and said, well, it was not nice to meet you goodbye. Diodora looked at the gun in his hand and said, B, but I had officer's power. Tetsuya looked at him with a look which said really and told him, Jude. I literally fuck off us. And pulled the trigger and immediately Diodora's body glow disappeared, leaving behind a white mist which dissipated soon as well. Tetsuya then looked at Asia and cleaned her clothes and body and said, let's get going then. But soon a portal appeared in front of him, and out of it Vali, Biku, Arthur and Office came out and were surprised to see Tetsuya there. Tetsuya raised his hand and said, yo, long time no see. Biku raised his hand as well and said, yo, yeah it's been a while. But how come you are here as well? Tetsuya pointed at Asia and said, Diodora tried to kidnap her, and the rest is history. Hearing that all of them widened their eyes except for Office who just walked near Asia and checked her body for any injuries. After a while Biku broke out laughing, while Vali and Arthur just face palmed at the devil's foolishness. Tetsuya looked at Vali and asked, so why are you here? Vali looked at Tetsuya and said, Oh, I just came to see how good Shoulder is. So where is he? Dead, says it just took care of him and the Asmodeus. Vali just yawned and said, Oh, then nothing much to do here. How is the red dragon by the way? Oh, she is progressing steadily. Might be possible that she can beat you considering that her dragon slayer powers have become more efficient to use. Hearing that Vali got excited and immediately wanted to challenge his rival, but Tetsuya told him that right now she was completely exhausted from her battle and will have to rest for a while. Vali and the other two talked with Tetsuya for a while and then decided to go back to their base. Tetsuya then looked towards Asia and as that she was talking with Office and asked, do you not have to go back? To which Office just shook her head and said, nothing important to do right now, so I will be staying with you for a while. Tetsuya just shrugged his shoulders and said, let's get going then, and then walked out of the ruins and met up with the others. 
While all three of them were walking towards the group of devils, Tetsuya suppressed Officer's aura to the point that it would only read to be that of a dragon instead of a dragon god. Office, who noticed the change in her look towards Tetsuya who patted her head and said, You know what to say when someone asks you who you are, right? Office nodded her head said, I am Tiamat's friend and Raya's cousin. Tetsuya nodded and then continued to walk. Once the devils noticed Tetsuya coming back with Asia and Office, they felt relieved on seeing Asia and confused on seeing Office, except for Kaneko and a certain dragon in the gauntlet. Though Drake could not feel her infinity or his instinct as a dragon, immediately told him who the young girl was, and since he had felt a similar fear, before he came to know who the girl was. Drake was going to ask about what was happening, but Tetsuya immediately telepathically told him, Open your mouth and the whole world will come to know about the Dragon of Domination, wanting to dominate the Dragon of Supremacy. Drake closed his mouth and said, I don't know what you might be talking about. Tetsuya nodded his head and said, Looks like you are quite understanding. He then introduced Office to the others, saying that she came to see Asia and check if there was some problem or not. He then teleported back with the other two, along with Asami, tagging along with him as she was not in a condition to move. Once they reached back to Kuo, Tetsuya looked at Asia and said, Let's continue continue the hotel plan sometime later. Asia who heard that pouted in disappointment but soon calmed down and agreed to his proposal. All four of them then entered Tetsuya's house, with Asami resting over Tetsuya's back. Once they all were inside the older residents of the Shiba house were surprised on noticing both of them. It was too early for their hotel date and too late for a non-hotel date. All of them came out to know what was the matter, and were surprised seeing Office and Asami along with them. Tetsuya asked Asia to fill them in on the matter, while he will go and put Asami in a bed. Once he did so he was about to leave the room, but a gauntlet manifested in Asami's hand and Drake asked, Will you explain it to us later? Tetsuya looked at the gauntlet and said, rest for now, Asami is already tired a lot. I will fill you in on the matter in the morning, and then left the room. Once he came down he saw the girls laughing at what Daidora did, and how she played with him. Roswis was a bit conflicted whether to laugh or not about the matter, but just let it out of her mind. She then noticed the small girl sitting in Tetsuya's lap and eating a cake and asked, who is the kid? Tetsuya patted Office's head and said, oh, you are new here, she is Office, Office she is Roswis my secretary, be nice to her. Office looked at the silver head girl with her emotionless expression and said, don't take my sweets if you are not tired of living, and continued eating her cake. Ross was who received a sudden threat was surprised but didn't press on the matter for long, rather she was thinking that she had heard her name before, and started thinking where she had heard it. Soon her face paled, and she pointed her shaking finger towards office and asked, be by O office, you don't mean that office, right? Tetsuya looked at her and only smiled in response, making Roswis's whole body stiff. Seeing her like that Raya said, What are you acting so scared for? You spent the whole vacation with me and Tiamat. Ah, and if you cannot tell I'm Great Red, nice to meet you. And once again Roswis got shocked and slowly turned her head to look at the other two dragons in the room, which only increased her tension. Tetsuya looked at her and said, Don't think too much. The only thing that you need to know is that if word of office and Great Red leaves your mouth and someone other than the ones whom I have told of about them comes to know, and I find that it was you, then oh Roswis, why not have a drink? And gave her a bottle. Roswis looked at her boss and said in teary voice, Hey? How can you change the topic all of a sudden and what was that threat for AHHH? I need a drink. And took the bottle and glass from Tetsaya's hands. Tetsaya then said, pour some for me as well. Here asterisk CLA and K asterisk cheers Tetsaya and Ross was kept on drinking for a while until suddenly Tetsaya's gaze fell on the three pups. And he realized something. Oh, shit I forgot about my catch. He then took out a master ball and brought Loki out. Loki who came out of the ball, looked around his surroundings and was confused for a while. But then his gaze fell on Tetsuya, and immediately a frown appeared on his face. He wanted to attack him, but for some one reason he was not able to use his powers. Tetsuya then said, If you are done mentally cursing me, then why not have a seat, and let's talk about what you will do next, along with a drink. Loki was immediately going to refuse him, but then the tree pups whom he immediately recognized told him that it was fine, and that Tetsuya wasn't an enemy. Tetsuya then stood up from his seat and sat beside Roswis, who even though was wasted because of alcohol, laid in his lap along with the puppies who jumped in his lap as well. Loki was surprised seeing his son and grandsons acting so fondly towards the human, and also the silver-headed secretary of his father, who was infamous for being single, acting like that towards the human. Tetsuya then gave him a glass of wine and said, Well, I don't think that I need to tell you what kind of situation you are in, right? Loki checked whether there was something present in the drink or not by asking Fenra, who after sniffing it told him that the drink was completely fine. Loki then took a sip, and was a bit surprised noticing that it was better than what he used to drink back in Asgard. He then looked at Tetsuya and said, You mean by the fact that currently a god like myself is under you as a slave? Yeah, I already know about it. Tetsuya smoked and said, Hurts your pride quite a bit, right? Hearing that Loki frowned but still nodded his head. Tetsuya nodded his head and said, Well, I am not going to bullshit like some devil peerage kings, about how this is not slavery or something else. I will just say that your situation currently is like a prisoner of war, though the prisoner is sent to another place to being looked after. And whatever you may say, you still have to agree to the fact that if you were to go back to Asgard or Hades to either of three factions, you would either be killed or sealed. Loki stared at Tetsuya for a while trying to assess how this human was, and nodded his head. Tetsuya then took out a paper and said, Well, since you are currently my responsibility, I will have to take care of you. 
but you still have to earn your keep. So here and pass the paler onto the god. Loki took the paper and Tetsaya said, choose whatever job you want to do and make sure to choose something that you are able to do at least. Loki looked at paper and saw various job offers listed on it with the conditions and salary. He got infuriated seeing that the human was asking a god like him to do these lowly things, and slammed his fists on the table. Tetsaya who was still calm, patted the troubled Roswes who was squirming in his lap, as she got surprised by the noise. How dare you ask a god like me to do something like this? Do you really think that I am going to do these things? Well, if you don't want to starve, wear the same clothes without even taking a bath for weeks. Then yes, you will do those things because your abilities are sealed. So you won't be able to cause any troubles, and just a fact even these pups are owning their keep by working. To which the pups sat up and puffed their chests with pride, seeing which Tetsaya patted them while Loki's lips were twitching. Loki then continued to argue with Tetsaya for a while, still not willing to abide by his rules, and being prideful. Tetsaya also didn't press him too much, he knew that he is still a god, and has the pride and power of one as well. It will take some time till he will calm himself down, and come to think about things realistically. He looked at Loki and said, well, then I will call you again tomorrow. So if you have a change of heart, then you can tell me later, oh and here. And threw a bottle of water and bread towards him. Loki caught them and was then once again called back to his CELL Master Ball. Seeing him vanish away the pups felt a bit sad. He was still their father slash grandfather who had raised him, and seeing his situation while they can't do anything about it made the sad. Tetsaya then comforted the pups, and said that Loki would understand soon and will be back with them. The pups just nodded their head, hoping that what their new master told him was true. Meanwhile inside the poke ball, Loki who was lying on the something like a clod whose ends were nowhere to be inside and said, that alcohol was really good. Not to mention what he told about me being killed or sealed was true as well. But what I cannot understand is Dashi then took out the paper with job offers and said, how come there is a job of working in a cross-dressing bar as a pole dancer at that with the highest pay among all of these jobs? He then once again went through all the jobs written on the paper, and then kept it back and went to sleep. A few weeks passed and Loki's pride finally went down a notch, and he decided to start working as well. He decided to work under Tetsaya as as a south chef of one of the chains of his restaurant in the same town. Tetsaya didn't have any idea that Loki was good at cooking, and was surprised when Loki was able to keep up with him in the kitchen, seeing that Tetsaya decided to teach him some of his own skills, and then make him an instructor for the new people who will work under him later. He also sent two of the pups with him for protection, as the current Loki was not able to use his powers, and at best, could take on peak big class level beings. Odin, Thor, Hela and Freya even came to see Loki working. Once Tetsaya told them about it upon seeing which all of them teased Loki a lot, much as oh his annoyance. Boss it is the end of the month. Oh, here your paycheck, right? Yup. Currently Tetsaya and the other residents of the Shiba house which now includes Loki and the pups as well were playing cards. And currently Fenrir was the one who was winning. Hey then what about mine? How can you forget about this god? HH. Hardy I saw that. Don't cheat, you have just started working and you want a paycheck. At least have some dignity, you are still a god though a powerless one. But you do have some talent in cooking Loki sand to be able to keep up with Oni Sama is no small feat. Heh, nothing is impossible for a god like me, much less keeping up with a human. Whatever, oh Loki san, skull is peaking. You little shit of a grandson, stop cheating. Arf arf? What do you mean by I am in no position to say something like that? Arf arf, huh? I was the god of trickery. So what trickery and cheating are different? And Hardy stop cheating arf arf. By no means what you are doing is trickery. That's boo cheating. Arf arf. How dare you swear at your grandfather ah. Fenrir Chan won again. Arf arf arf. Well I will win the next one. Hamari is going to lose again. Huh. What do you mean by that ice bitch? Are you so incompetent that you cannot understand it you idiot? Both of them then started releasing their aura. And the room started to get hotter and colder at the same time. Tetsaya then gave a hand chop on their heads and said. No fighting inside the house. Oak. That hurts on ESAMA Tilda, and Miyuki received another hand chop, and Tetsaya said, and what's with that tone? Miyuki then groaned, but Tetsaya ignored her and said, oh, school trip for the second years is approaching as well. Hearing that both the second and the first years perked up and looked at Tetsaya. The second years with excitement and the first years with annoyance. Tetsaya then said, Ross was pack your stuff we will be leaving for Kyoto in a day or two. Hearing that all the girls were surprised and Hamari asked, W wait a minute there is still S week before the trip ride. Tetsaya nodded and said, yeah. But Seraphal said that she was going to Kyoto to make an alliance with the Yakai and Shinto faction and asked me to come along with her so that she can enjoy a bit. But since I'm going there I was thinking of taking Roswas with me so that she can help Shuri and teach her some of her tricks. So I will meet you all directly at Kyoto Station. Hearing that the second years were a bit sad but still felt happy that he would still be there on the trip. Roswas who was just told that she would be going as well got surprised and immediately got sober and asked. But is it fine for me to go with you? Tetsaya nodded and smiled and said, yeah, it would be fine. I have no problems with it. Plus you are my secretary. So you will have look after the work, and also I cannot think of anyone better you for the job, and Shuri's work efficiency is decreasing as well. She can get help from pros as well. Hearing that Ross was got serious and nodded her head, her boss was trusting her with this opportunity. So she cannot let his expectations down. Plus she could enjoy the trip there as well. A few days later in front of the Shiba residence a Sarah Fall who was not wearing her magical girl costume, but instead casual clothes, was standing along with Tetsaya and Roswiss. 
Titsaya looked at Seraphol and said, We can just teleport there. Seraphol pouted and said, But that would not be fun. Let's go buy a car instead. Besides, the sooner we go, the sooner I would have to start working. Titsaya sighed and looked at Kirumi and was about to say something. But she raised her hand and said, I am co.ing as well. So choose some else's and chuch. And went inside Titsaya's body. Titsaya blinked in surprise for a while and looked towards Shizuka and said, you are the inchage, make sure they don't go overboard and destroy the country while playing. Also call me immediately if something goes wrong. All of them nodded and hugged Tetsaya, and then Tetsaya summoned the car and turned back to his adult form and said, let's get going you two. And Sarah, you will be in the middle seat. Hey, you cannot do that. Of course I can. I will be the one who is driving, and since I am on a vacation then that means no power usage, just simple human T-H-I-N-G-S unless it become necessary, which somehow will occur, and I don't want to kill someone who decides to have an accident with us. And I can definitely say that you will not stay calm and will disturb my driving. Sarah fall pouted and then tried to use puppy eyes. But Tetsaya just pinched her cheeks and pulled her and made her sit in the middle seat. He then sat on the driver's seat and finally Ross was sat in the front seat and then Tetsaya left for Kyoto. On the way just as Tetsaya predicted Sarah fall went all bubbly and excited looking here and there and talking with the other two. With your giving them much space for the argument and soon got tired from both the excitement and the mail work that she had been doing for the past few weeks, and went to sleep. Originally there was still a week till Seraphol had to go to Kyoto, but in order to set up a trip with Tetsaya, she worked herself to the bone to complete her work, which made all the people even the mass and her family completely shocked. They had never seen Seraphol working this diligently, and it was a total surprise for them to see the bubbly mare like that. Ross was just looked at the mare who was sleeping peaceful withdrawal coming out of her mouth. She just gave a wry smile and then looked away. Seeing someone who can level countries with ease with an expression like that was just something unexpected for her. Now that I think about strong. She then looked at Tetsaya who was driving with a small smile on his face and soon a blush appeared on her cheeks. She then thought, isn't it just like we are on a drive date? And she immediately averted her eyes from him, but still looked at him from time to time. For someone who had been longing to get in a relationship, it was one of her dreams to go on a driving date with a guy. And since Tetsaya was currently in his adult form and was looking more mature, and both of them being in the front together within the silence in the car, just made the atmosphere feel like that of a date to her. She then covered her cheeks with her hands and shook her thoughts away. Calm down Roswiss, he is your boss, don't think about such things but... Wait a minute, what is the problem with us being boss and secretary? There are no prohibitions in a relationship like that, and it is not like a forbidden relationship as well. Plus even though he is still a high schooler, age-wise we are still around the same age. So just what the hell are you thinking get your mind off the gutter? Tetsaya who noticed Ross was squirming in her seat, looked at her and asked, is something wrong with you Ross? And immediately Ross was looked at Tetsaya and said, no problem at all. Tetsaya looked at her for a while, and then gave her a bottle of water and said, anyway, this might help you calm down a bit. And don't hold back, if something is wrong just tell me about it. You are the part of the family now Ross. Ross was took the bottle from his hands and nodded her head, but then she realized something and thought, DD did he just called me by a nickname, and immediately gulped down the whole bottle of water. Tetsaya who was not using any of his powers right now as he didn't want to use them on the trip, didn't know that currently Ruswas's imagination was going wild and just focused on driving. After Tetsaya and the others reached Koto, he dropped Sarah Fall at the hotel which was under her family, so that she can do some work before meeting the Yaokai. She wanted Tetsaya to stay with her as well, but was denied as Tetsaya had to check on his subordinates and branches in Kyoto as well. Tetsaya and Ross were soon reached their destination and got off the car. Ross was, was finally able to calm herself down, and was now back to her secretary mode. Both of them then entered the building, and as soon as the receptionist saw them her eyes widen, and she immediately bowed her head. Greeting sir, it is a pleasure too for us to have you here. Do you want us to inform the manager? Tetsaya shook his hands and said, no need for that, a surprise would be better than her being informed about us. Hearing that the receptionist's lips twitched and she thought, Shurisen is done for. The receptionist then personally led them to the manager's office, and once they were in front of the room, Tetsaya asked her to go back. Once she was gone, Tetsaya looked at Roswes and said, don't make a noise. Roswes nodded and said, I undash. But Tetsaya immediately covered her mouth with his hands, while placed his own finger on his lips, gesturing her to remain silent. Roswes, whose mouth was being held by Tetsaya, was not able to think properly and just stayed quiet, while her imagination once again started running wild. What is he going to do to me? He first led me to a room, then sent the other person away, asked me to keep quiet, and is now covering my mouth, so that no voice leaks from my mouth. I tease definitely one of those tropes I once saw in an AD asterisk LT video Tetsaya, then pulled her body closer, making her blush getting deeper, and then silently phased through the door, along with Roswiss. Once both of them were inside Tetsaya left Roswiss, and crept closer to the person who was sitting on the chair facing the other way. So a new item came. Huh? A whip modified to give electric shocks as well. Definitely gonna buy it. A new gag as well. Oh, so many new toys to play with. Tetsaya then said, you seem to be enjoying yourself. 
Yeah, today came the new catalog and Dash suddenly she stopped and turned around and saw Tetsaya looking at her with a smile on her face. Looks like you are working nicely, seeing that you have the time to look at the new toys catalog at work. Shuri started sweating when she saw her boss's smile and didn't know what to do. So how is the work coming along? Shuri immediately stood up and took out some files from a bundle and gave it to Tetsaya. Here, sir. Tetsaya took a file and gave it to Roswas who immediately took it and started going through them. Tetsaya then took his and started going through it as well. Shuri, who saw Tetsaya and the silver-haired woman who she didn't knew going through the files, immediately hid her catalog and asked someone to bring tea and snacks quickly. A few moments later once both Tetsaya and Roswas went through the files, Tetsaya looked at Roswas who shook her head. Tetsaya looked at Shuri who flinched at his gaze. Tetsaya then said, Lucky, she had all the files done this time around. I was totally in the mood of seeing my mother-in-law making excuses to not fire her. And then clicked his tongue. Hearing that Shuri sighed while Roswas chuckled. Shuri then looked at Tetsaya with a smile on her face and said, Sorry to disappoint you boss. I have been working diligently for a while. But you know Dash, before she could continue Tetsaya said, you are not getting a raise. Hearing that Shuri flinched and then said, as perceptive as ever, just raise it a bit, I have to buy some toys. That man of torture is earning as well, he is more than sufficient to buy the stuff that he likes. Shuri then clicked her tongue and then took her seat as well and asked, so why are you here? Don't tell me that you came here to just meet your beautiful mother-in-law. Hearing that Roswas looked at Tetsaya and asked, Ikeno Sam. Tetsaya nodded and said, yeah, she is Ikeno's mother, Shuri, Shuri this is Roswas, my secretary. Roswas bowed her head and said, nice to meet you. I am Roswas, a former Valkyrie from Valhalla. Shuri bowed her head as well and said, Shuri Himajima, former member of the Himajima clan. By the way are you a S or M? Roswas's lips twitched and Tetsaya said, ignore her antics. By the way, how are the things going on the supernatural side of Kyoto? Shuri looked at Tetsaya and said, nothing much is happening here. Not much of open problems, though the ones in secret are not in my knowledge. Tetsaya nodded and said, well, whatever we came here along with Sarah. She has some peace talk to do Yakai and Shinto faction. I am on a vacation for the week, after which I would have my school trip. Shuri widened her eyes and asked, Peace talk, are they making an alliance? Which side are we on? Tetsaya laid back comfortably and said, None, we are staying neutral. It's better to stay out of the ways of those old and prideful factions. Oh, but your daughter and husband are a part of the alliance. Shuri nodded and then asked Roswis, So are you the secretary, huh? How much is he paying you and making you work? Roswas and Shuri then started talking with each other as both of them felt a connection between them. Their boss makes Slash used to work them to the bone. Tetsaya. For Shuri and Odin for Roswas, Tetsaya then left them on their own and said, I will be in my room. Ask someone to give me the keys of my suite. Shuri then took out a card from her pocket and said, Already did. Here. And threw it towards Tetsaya who caught the key and went to the suite which only belonged to him. Later that evening Tetsaya talked to Seraphol and both of them decided to visit the Yaokai faction the next day as Seraphol wanted to rest a bit longer. Tetsaya then decided to take a bath and went in the bathroom. Once he was done he came out only wearing shorts and lied down on the bed to sleep. Roswas, who got her key from Shuri decided to rest as well. She really liked talking to Shuri and exchanged contacts with her to talk to her. Once she went back with Tetsaya, it was very rare for her to find someone who was able to understand her situation, and since talking to her was enjoyable, she decided that they could be good friends. She entered the room and switched on the lights and went inside. But once she got in she was completely shocked. In front of Roswas Tetsaya was lying on the bed wearing nothing but shorts. Seeing that a blush immediately appeared on her face, and she didn't know what to do in such a situation. Suddenly she received a message on her phone, and immediately took it out, so as to distract her mind. Message is Shuri Himajima. So how is my gift Ross Chan? Great right? No need to thank me. Just think of it as a gift for our friendship and enjoy to your heart's content. Yes the room is completely soundproof you can scream as loud as you want. Roswas immediately put her phone back and covered her cheeks and thought, what the hell do you mean by enjoy to your heart's content my heart is going to come out of my chest in this kind of situation. She then looked at the sleeping Tetsaya and stared at his face for a while. Handsome, right? Out of nowhere she heard a voice and jumped back in surprise. She then looked at Tetsaya and then noticed the body started to manifest near him and soon that Kurumi came in her sight. Seeing her Roswas sighed and said, don't scare me like that Kurumi-san. Kurumi chuckled and said, oh, don't mind me. It's just a bad habit of mine. By the way why are you here? Planning to attack him while he is asleep. You are sly one, eh? Well I will join you to keep you company. Hearing that Roswas immediately shook her head and started explaining what happened. After hearing that she immediately placed a sound barrier around Tetsaya and started laughing loudly, making Roswas more embarrassed. Once she was done she looked at Roswas and said, so what will you do now? You can attack if you want to. But Roswas immediately rejected. Hearing that Kirumi smirked and said, well aren't you good natured if any of the other girls from back home were to see him like this? They would at the very least take the opportunity to snuggle up to him. Kirumi sighed and said, Well, I guess he would be happy about this as well. His fatigue has really taken a toll on his body. So letting him rest is a good idea. Hearing that Roswas asked, What does he do aside from going to school that he is tired? Hearing that Kirumi gave a wry smile and said, Well, from the point of view of all of you, you may not know, but for someone like me who is a part of him, and occasionally go and reside inside him, know how much he is working, though not physically. 
There are more than thousand clones that are working for him, and each day after they disperse the amount of info from all of them let's just say, it is not comparable to anything I've seen. And he is doing that every day, so it is natural that he is tired. Hearing that Roswas's eyes widened and she asked, seriously, how much mental resistance does he have? Kirumi snickered and said, comparable to Raya, and it is only because of it that he can withstand all this. Not even all the members of the group combined can take in and process that much information on a whole day much less an instant like he does. Compared to us, his work is way too much. There are many clones who are mighting the balance between various races, so that conflict did not arise between them. Roswas was totally surprised hearing about the things that her boss is doing. She cannot believe what Kurumi was saying was the truth, but still the tone of her voice and the look in her eyes made her feel that the woman in front of her was indeed telling the truth. Suddenly she realized something and asked, wait a minute, you are saying that he is maintaining peace between various faction around the globe. Hearing that Kurumi smoked and said, I don't have the exact details as even I don't have the complete authority to look over his memories, but I can still tell that he have enough gained enough favors and acquaintances, that he can make Atlas an average size faction if ever needs. Roswas who had her fair share of reactions today, just accepted the fact that her boss was awesome, and didn't question him. She then looked at Tetsuya and then asked, by the way, where would I be sleeping? Kirumi snorted and said, just get on the bed, I can guarantee that he wouldn't do anything. I hardly believe that you are willing to sleep on the floor when this comfortable thing is right here. And then pushed the mattress a bit which immediately engulfed her hand, showing how soft it was. Roswas then thought for a while and then lied in the bed as well though she made a wall of pillows between the two of them. Kirumi also lied beside Tetsuya and then asked, don't tell the others about what we just talked about, he don't want them to worry about him. Roswas just nodded and then slowly drifted off to sleep. The next morning when Tetsuya woke up he turned around to get some more sleep, but immediately crashed into something soft. He then moved his hands to check what it was, and after giving it a squish or two he thought, Kirumi ha. He then turned the other side, and once again the same thing happened. But this time he was confused, who else had the guts to come into his room and sleep beside him? He opened his eyes and saw his silver haired secretary sleeping peacefully next to him. He then looked at both the girls who were sandwiching him and muttered, so that's why I felt a bit stuffy while sleeping. Tetsuya then scratched his head and said, well whatever, let's wake these two up, it's already getting late. We have to meet Yasaka as well. He then shook their bodies lightly making the two girls squirm a bit as he smiled seeing them frowning in annoyance. But suddenly he felt something and immediately turned towards Kirumi, and started shaking her more violently. Kirumi, Kirumi, wake up. Hurry up. You need to tell me how did it happen. Kirumi finally gave in and woke up while yawning and rubbing her eyes. Good morning Tetsuya. What's the fuss about? Tetsuya pinched her cheeks and asked, how and when the hell did you get a real body? Kirumi whose cheeks were getting pinched by Tetsuya, had some tears at the corner of her eyes. But as soon as Tetsuya asked the question, her eyes lit up, and she said with a smile on her face, I A A U I O O A K E A O N E E E. But unfortunately, no one understood what she said, as she could not speak properly while her cheeks were getting pinched. Tetsuya then stopped pinching her cheeks, making Kirumi immediately rub her now red and swollen cheeks. You are a big meanie. Why did you do that to me? Leaving that aside, now repeat again I was not able to understand what you said at that time. Kirumi's brows twitched, but she still calmed herself down and said, I say Raya to make me a body. And she did just that. Now I have a normal body as well, not just one of those formed by Chakra. And when the hell were you going to tell me that? It's your own fault for not realizing it sooner. I was thinking of surprising you as well. Tetsuya then bonked her head lightly and said, It's not my fault and anyway congratulations on getting a body. Kirumi then puffed up head chest proudly and said, Fu fu fu. Tetsuya then sighed and then looked at his secretary who was still sleeping and asked, And why is she here? Kirumi chuckled and then started explaining about what happened for us was to come here. After listening to everything Tetsuya sighed and said, Looks like she really wants me to cut off her salary a bit. He then patted Ross with his head and said, wake up Ross, we have work to do. Ross was who was smiling on being petted, took some time, but soon woke up as well, and immediately got embarrassed once she noticed her boss was the one who was petting her. She immediately jumped off the bed and dashed towards the bathroom, not allowing any of the two to say anything. Both Tetsuya and Kirumi looked at each other for a while, and Kirumi with a shrug of her shoulders said, she must have built up quite a pressure if she had to rush to the toilet that fast. Tetsuya just smiled wryly and lied back on the bed, seeing which Kirumi soon snuggled beside him. Later that day after the trio were done with Ross was continuous apologies for getting in his room, and hearing Shuri's pleas to not cut her salary, all three of them along with Seraphall, were heading towards the Yakai faction. Surprisingly Seraphall was wearing a kimono, seeing which Kurumi decided to wear one as well, while also making Roswas wear one. All of them soon came in front of the temple and then started climbing up. Soon they came in front of the entrance of the Yakai faction, and the guards who noticed them appeared with their sparrows pointing towards them. But once they saw Tetsuya they bowed and said, Tetsuya-sama we apologize for pointing out weapons towards you. Tetsuya just waved his hands and said, no need to worry about that, you guys were doing your duty, right? Anyway, are Yusaka and Kunu here? Hearing that one of the Tengi guard raised his head and said, yes, they are here, shall I inform them about your visit? Tetsuya shook his head and said, nah, leave it. We will just meet her besides I hardly believe she will not come to know about us visiting her. The guards then stepped aside to let them a step inside, and just as the four of them passed through the gate, the surroundings started to change. In front of them a wild settlement filled with Japanese-style buildings and architecture appeared, and various yakai from different races were visible to them as well. The yakai who felt the presence of Tetsuya and the other three, immediately looked at them with fear. 
But as soon as they noticed Tetsuya and Kirumi, all of them sighed and started greeting the two of them. Roswis who saw what happened was overwhelmed seeing the popularity of her current boss. And immediately the words that Kirumi told last night came to her mind. Soon a lot of children started surrounding Tetsuya and started asking questions to him. And some of them started to drag him to play with them as well. Tetsuya was in dilemma about what to do and was about to reject the children as he had still some work to do. The children who felt that Tetsuya was going to reject the offer lowered their ears and looked at him with puppy eyes, which made it very difficult for him to reject them. They even offered to let him touch their ears and tail, which was something that most of them knew was his weakness. But he being the diligent man he was he looked away towards his companions and said, you guys go ahead, I will meet you later, and was immediately dragged away by the children who were shouting with joy on their victory. Seeing him getting easily swayed by the children, Roswas had some complicated thoughts in her mind and thought, is he a pedophile? A few days have passed since Tetsuya and the others camps to the Yaokai faction. Seraphol has been negotiating with both Yaokai and the Shinto faction for all these days, still working to come to an agreement. Tetsuya on the other hand was just enjoying his vacation relaxing in the territory, talking with Susanoo and Tsukiyomi, and going on dates with either the foxes, the magical girl or the goddess Amaterasu. He has been peacefully living there as Roswas has been taking care of the documents in his stead. He was really grateful for her help, and even promised to do any one thing she wants. Currently Tetsuya who was waiting for Yasaka and Kunu to come back from the meeting with the leaders of the five clans while reading a book. Suddenly the door of the room opened, and Kunu came in totally worried. Tetsuya looked at her worried expression and widened his eyes in surprise. He immediately hugged her and started to console the crying girl. He immediately activated his powers which he has not been using for the past few days, so that he could relax, and in that instant he activated them a huge surge of energy enveloped the entire world. But in an instant it died down, not causing any major problems, except for the strong people from the major factions, getting surprised by the power. He then checked Hulu's memories, as she was too panicked to talk and come to know that the hero faction was trying to kidnap Yusaka, who was currently fighting and trying to protect Kunu from being kidnapped. He immediately called Kurumi, and told her to take care of Kunu, and teleported towards Yasaka's position. The leader of the hero faction Kao Kao, who was wielder of the true Longinus along with his team, was fighting against Yasaka in a dimension made by Dimension Lost, which made escaping for Yasaka very difficult. What happened leader of Yakai? Having trouble dealing with us, Yasaka didn't say anything and just narrowed her eyes and said, Who are you and why have you come to our territory? But before they could answer Tetsuya appeared in front of Yasaka and said, They are hero wannabes who don't even have the knowledge to say I am here. Seeing him suddenly appear in front of them Tetsuya raised his hand and said, Yo. Seeing him the whole hero faction was surprised, not because he was able to enter the dimension, but because all of them could feel that he was a human just like them. Kao Kao narrowed his eyes and said, Shiba Tetsuya, I presume, looks like the word about a strong human associating with the three biblical factions was true. Tetsuya smirked and said, Oh, aren't I a famous one? And you must be Kao Kao the wielder of the true Longinus, I guess. Kao Kao smirked as well and said, so you know of me as well. Pleasure to meet you, or so I would like to say. But why are you here? And pointed his spirit at Tsaya. Tsaya just raised his hands gesturing him to stop violence and said, Calm down. I am here for a vacation, and was searching for my girlfriend. I will just take her and go back. No need to get violent here. Man, I don't wish to fight during my vacation as much as possible. Hearing that Cal Cal snorted and said, Stop taking us as a joke and tell us what is your purpose of coming here. Do you wish to join us fellow humans and show the world that we are the greatest? Tsaya chuckled and said, No, I am not taking you for a joke. I really came to take her back and regarding joining you. Nah not interested. So Dash he then turned towards the one wearing glasses and said, It would be better if you could stop using your sacred gear and destroy this dimension of yours. I don't have problem destroying it, but it will only hurt you back as I can see that you are already pushing the limit of your gear to the maximum you could, so destroying it might injure you. Suddenly a sword slash came towards Tetsaya's way by the six-handed swordsman of the hero group. Tetsaya looked towards the sized armed swordsman and said in annoyance, Man are all you swordsmen retarded. Why the hell do you all attack someone whom you don't know of so star forwardly? He then took out his favorite spoon and casually parried of the swords and said, Full counter and immediately various slash marks appeared on the swordsman's body and was thrown away. Seeing such a thing happen right in front of them, the hero faction members were totally speechless and George immediately started healing Siegfried. Tetsaya looked at Yasaka and asked, You okay? Feeling pain anywhere? But Yasaka shook her head in denial. Tetsaya nodded and looked back at the hero faction who were now all aiming their weapons at him. Kao Kao who was angered by the actions of Tetsaya, started Padiji his aura in the spear, making it glow and said, Looks like I need to show you the power of the spear that killed the dash Tetsaya, immediately teleported in front of Kao Kao, not giving him any time to register what happened. He then took his spear from his, snapped it in half, and had the two halves back to him, and then teleported back to his original position. God. Kao Kao then looked at his broken spear and then at Tetsaya, then at spear and then back at Tetsaya. He did it for a while. And so he digested what happened in his brain, his eyes widened in shock, and he said, What the hell did you do to my spear? Tetsaya's gaze lowered a bit, and with a smirk on his face he said, Jude, you are not big enough to call that a spear. Hearing that all of them blinked for a while, but soon George realized what Tetsaya meant, and looked towards Kao Kao's crutch and muttered, Yes, he certainly is not that well endowed in that department. Kao Kao looked at George and then followed his gaze, and immediately his brows twitched and he said, That has nothing to do with it. Jian and the others understood as well but didn't know what to say. Kao Kao immediately unsummoned his spear, and then called it back, and it appeared completely fixed. 
Seeing that Tatsuya sighed and said, That's why I don't like my opponent to have soul-liked weapons. So are you really set on fighting? All of them pointed their weapons and magic circle towards Tatsuya, making him sigh in annoyance. And I thought I can have a nice vacation. Tatsuya then took out his Neo Server Esther. If you have forgotten about it, check out CH-37 and activated it. And a purple energy blade manifested over the handle he was holding. He then brought the sword forward and said, You should go back Yasaka. I will come back later. And then Force teleported her out of George's dimension. Seeing her getting teleported, Cal Cal frowned and thought, You really are acting like a new since in our plan. Tetsuya shrugged and said, What? I am just protecting my family. You two will do the same for yours as well, right? Cal Cal smirked and then immediately dashed towards Tetsuya and tried to stab him, but Tetsuya intercepted his attack. Yeah, but only for my family. But unfortunately our mission takes precedence over it. Tetsuya then pushed him back and tried to slash him, but Jian made a wall of swords to block Tetsuya's attack. But Tetsuya immediately destroyed it with his sword. Cal Cal, who was now back to his group said, And it doesn't seem like you will let us do as we please. Tetsuya then said, Oh, believe me I am the most neutral guy you can find. If someone who is not related to me is your target, then I can assure you that I won't do anything about it unless I myself have something to do with it. Cal Cal smiled and said, Oh, is that so? Then we will be very grateful for that. But unfortunately this time our target is someone is someone related to you. Tetsuya's sword then changed to green, and he said, Sorry I cannot allow that. And then he slashed the air, and immediately six long green energy blades moved towards all the individuals of the hero faction, making them either dodge or block the slash. That was just a warning. Next time won't be that easy. All of them except for Leonard clicked their tongues, and George then fired a large amount of spells towards him. Tetsuya's eyes then turned red with a pattern inside the eye, and immediately a huge grey skeleton appeared around him, and blocked all the attacks. Yes, his Susanu is grey coloured. Seeing the giant skeleton all of them were surprised, and George asked, is that a spell or a sacred gear? Tetsuya shrugged his shoulders and said, who knows? Hearing that George narrowed his eyes and then looked towards Leonardo and nodded his head. Leonard then raised his hands, and soon his shadow started to expand, and various humanoid beings started to emerge out of it. Tetsuya looked at the creations for a while, and then turned towards Leonardo and asked, Does Annihilation Maker allow you to make as many monsters you are capable of making without any side effects, like mental strain or something? Or does it have a mental strain transfer as well? Hearing his question Leonardo's eyes widened, and he looked towards George to ask what to do seeing which George smirked and shifted his glasses and said, Who knows question mark quote Tetsuya gave him the same answer all of them except for George Sweat dropped at his answer, and even his leader looked at him with a look which was saying, Really? Tetsuya then said, does it really felt good copying me? If yes then I'm flattered. Tetsuya then looked at Cao Cao and asked, so why are you after Yasaka? Cao Cao kept his spear to the side and said, there is no harm in telling that. We want her power to affect the Li lines surrounding Kyoto, and summon the Great Red, so that we can have a battle of legends between the heroes and dragons. Tetsuya then said, but there hasn't been any distortion in the dimension to open a path to the dimension gap to our world. So how will you open the path? Cao Cao smoked and said, eh, a few months ago someone opened the dimensional gap. We don't know who. But since then there has been a slight distortion in the space-time bridges between the two. So by using the power of Li lines, and the power of dimension lost, we will summon the dragon. Tetsuya who heard the whole answer side and thought, that idiot must be me and Raya. Looks like our battle caused some ripples in there, I will tell her to fix it later. He then gave a tired sigh and said, anyway if you are still going to continue, then please go all out. I don't have time for all this. Cow Cow and his team got serious and narrowed their eyes. He then said, don't look down on us Shiba Tetsuya, we are the hero faction, even if you are strong we will not back down. Show him you all he should know what we are capable of all of them, then started to charge their power for a big attack. Sensing which Tetsuya said, that spear is really something. To be able to release that much aura even when the balance breaker is not activated is amazing. Cow Cow smiled and said, want to retreat. Tetsuya put his sword back in his storage and said, you know what? I guess I will fight you all a bit seriously. After all you really are thinking rock much of yourself. If you are not even using your balance breaker or your trump card against me. He then moved his hand to his side and soon a glow started to come out of his hand making all of them close their eyes because of too much brightness. Soon the glow died down and a huge spear with a broad blade and a glowing energy blade in the middle of it appeared. Dot number Vasavi Shakti. Tetsuya smoked and said, so how do you like my spear? It can kill gods as well. He then started pouring energy inside it making the spear release its already powerful aura which made the hero faction widen their eyes in surprise. Tetsuya then started to levitate in the air, while charging the spear and said, willing to use your balance breaker yet. Cow Cow gulped his saliva and asked, why is that spear's energy similar to his? And just as he said that a man appeared in front of the hero faction wearing an aloha shirt and a pair of sunglasses, because it was made by me. But the real question is how do you possess it? Tetsuya looked towards the newcomer and said, so, the backer is here as well. Uh, oh, and this spear. I bought it in a garage sale a few years ago at a cheap cost. A hell of a deal if you ask me. So are you going to take your guys back or you are joining as well? Tetsuya and Indra were staring at each other for a while, both not speaking a word making the tension in the surrounding rise by a lot. Tetsuya who was getting slightly impatient asked, So, you um, you going back or should I kick your ass before you want to go back? Frankly saying, 
I am not really in the mood for something like this as currently I am on a vacation, so. Indra started to fly as well and came to the same height as Tatsaya and asked, Why are you able to use something that should only be usable by someone whom I have given the authority over it? Are you Kana's incarnation? Tatsaya shook his head and said, No, I am not anyone's incarnation, I am just me. Indra narrowed his eyes and said, Do you think that it is some kind of joke forget? It, just give me back my damn spear. Nope. Hearing that Indra's brows twitched in anger and he then said, Boy, don't drag this for long. That spear is rightfully mine. Tatsaya shook his head and said, how can I believe that? Are you feeling any sort of connection to this spear? If so, why isn't it reacting to you? Indra then started to release his divinity, but was not able to feel the connection he expected he would get from the spear, making him surprised. Tetsaya smirked and said, not able to feel it, right? Indra glared at Tetsaya and said, what game are you playing? Why can't I call my spear? Tetsaya then said, um, I don't know, maybe it's not yours, that's why. Indra then summoned a spear and pointed it towards Tetsaya and said, Give it back, you are not worthy enough to wield it. I don't know what thing are you using to block my connection with it, but I will not allow you to use it. If I am planning to wage war on Shiva, then I might need all resources I can gather, and yet I am not able to get access to something that belongs to me. Tetsaya just stared blankly at him and said, First of all, this spear is not yours. It's something that I see IATED copied. Second, you are in a territory that is technically MINE while Yusaka and Amy are technically with me. Third, killing you will only cause more problems for me in the future, so I would rather not do that. Indra then said, Firstly, I don't care. Secondly, we are currently in George's dimension. Thirdly, how can killing me cause you more problems? If I am not around anymore. Tetsaya then said, It's simple, currently you are still not blacklisted from the Hindu faction, and killing you will agitate many gods and people of your faction, which will in turn come to me seeking for revenge. I destroy the faction, then the allies of your faction will come seeking for revenge. I destroy all the allies, then the remaining factions will try to group together and deal with me, as I am a supposed threat for their faction. I destroy them, no factions left. I will have to take responsibility to take care of the areas left behind by those factions. It's nothing but trouble. Hearing that all of them got silent and looked at Tetsaya with a deadpan expression on their faces and thought at the same time, isn't he thinking way too deeply? Stop speaking nonsense, you are talking as if you can defeat all the factions on your own. Tetsaya didn't say anything and just looked at him with a neutral expression on his face, seeing which Indra's lips twitched. And he thought, is he really thinking that way? Cow Cow looked at Tetsaya and thought, so he is as confident as us knowing that we humans can best them all. He then smirked and thought, his thinking is just like us. Tetsaya who heard him thought, not even a bit. I have no wish of flaunting my status to the whole supernatural world. I already have enough on my plate to take care of. Suddenly Tetsaya moved the spear blocking an attack coming towards him. So you can react to such an attack, huh? Looks like you will not be that boring. Tetsaya looked at Indra who had a smirk on his face and sighed. He then stared directly in Indra's eyes and said, Don't say that I didn't warn you before, and you are the one who is picking fight with me. He then pushed Indra back, and immediately thrusted his spear towards Indra's chest. But Indra moved immediately as well, and blocked the attack with his own spear, but was pushed back a few meters away. You pack quite a punch as well. He then narrowed his eyes and said, Let's start getting serious, and started releasing his aura because of which the dimension started to shake, and threatened to collapse at any moment. Seeing his dimension shaking George started to panic, but Tetsaya immediately maintained the dimension, and looked towards the hero faction and said, I don't think you all will be able to get out for a while, just stay back and put a barrier or something around you. The hero faction jumped back and took a reasonable distance from the two, and George immediately formed a barrier around them. Cow Cow looked at his spear, and felt that it was trying to tell him something. It must be the god slaying ability of the spear, it must be sensing his divinity. He then turned around to focus on the two fighters, but immediately his eyes widened in shock. He looked around at the fellow members of his team, and saw that they were completely shocked by the sight in front of them as well. Indra who was done powering up, summoned another spear and threw it towards Tetsaya, who just destroyed it with a slash from his own, but then immediately tilted his head, when he noticed the god trying to stab him with his spear. He then thrusted his spear towards Indra, who just deflected it with his magic. Both of them took a distance from each other, and stared at one another for a while, when all of a sudden both of them vanished from their spots. Asterisk boom asterisk asterisk boom asterisk asterisk boom asterisk a series of large explosions could be heard by the others but the onlookers were not able to make out what was happening. Siegfried and Cow Cow who had fastest reaction times in the group, had cold sweat dripping down their foreheads, and both of them gulped their saliva in Cow Cow. What is this kind of speed? Siegfried nodded his head and said, Yeah, I could only see their after images at best. Hearing what the two members of their team said the others were looked at the two for a while, and then back at the sky. Is this happening just from the two of them clashing with one another? In the sky Indra and Tetsaya were constantly attacking and blocking each other's attacks, and Indra, who had an excited expression on his face, felt that they were almost at an equal level. But suddenly he noticed something, and immediately his expression changed, and he now had a frown on his face. He gritted his teeth in anger, and used a bit more strength in his next attack, which Tetsaya blocked once again, while having a neutral expression on his face. I glared at Tetsaya and said, You, you are not even half serious about this, right? Tetsaya didn't say anything and just stared at him with his usual cold expression, which only made the god more pissed at the human in front of him. Cow Cow and the others were confused by what Indra was saying and asked, what's the matter? Indra continued to glare at Tetsaya, while trying to push him away and said, this boy, is mocking me by not even using half of his strength in the battle. Hearing which all of them got even more surprised, Tetsaya who was blocking the god's attack thought, well, he is correct in a sense. 
I am not even using half of my physical capabilities, and regarding magic or anything else, well that would be overkill. Suddenly Indra used his covered his whole body got covered with lightning, seeing which Tetsuya pushed him back, wanting to know what the god was trying to do. But just as he pushed him back a flash passed by him making Tetsuya a bit surprised, and he then moved his spear and blocked the spear, which was going to pierce him. Again a flash passed by him and once again he blocked the spear. So you can keep up with this as well. Huh? Indra then took some distance from him and summoned a large number of lightning around him and fired them all towards Tetsuya, who just teleported behind Indra and tried to stab him. But Indra noticed that immediately flickered behind Tetsuya, and once again fired the spears at Tetsuya. Tetsuya immediately used a barrier to block the attack, seeing which Indra smoked and said, So you finally decided to use your magic? Huh? And then immediately rushed towards towards Tetsuya with a huge spear in his hand trying to stab through the barrier and attack Tetsuya. But all of a sudden a huge pressure enveloped the dimension, making it start shaking once again. Everyone in the dimension started looking around to see what was happening. But then noticed Tetsuya, whose eyes were glowing. While a small amount of his aura was leaking unconsciously, Tetsuya looked at Indra and immediately Indra stopped moving, making the god look at his body in surprise. He then looked at Tetsuya who was staring directly in Indra's eyes, making the god feel a chill run down his spine. Which made him shocked, he felt fear from the human in front of him. Indra noticing this internally cursed himself and glared at Tetsuya. Tetsuya removed the barrier around him, and then stabilized the dimension so that it wouldn't collapse and said, so shall we get serious, now? And for the first time since the beginning of the battle smiled at Indra. Indra who looked at Tetsuya's smile, gulped his saliva and tried to move away and attack him, but some mysterious force was preventing him from moving. He glared at Tetsuya and asked, is this your doing? Tetsuya shrugged his shoulders and said, what? I'm trying to be a bit serious here, so of course I will hold back a little less. Now onto the main topic dash, Tetsuya then looked directly in your Indra's eyes and asked, so how do you want to get your ass kicked? The boring way or the cool way? Oh and of course, I would be the one who will look cool here. Indra glared at Tetsuya and said, do whatever you want but keep this in mind I will not back down. Tetsuya looked at him with a deadpan look and said, so let's go with cool mode, if I use the boring way you will break instantly. Tetsuya looked towards the hero faction or more particularly at Kao Kao. Seeing his gaze all of them got stiff and gulped their saliva, hoping that the monster and human skin don't come their way for the attack. Tetsuya just focused on the true Longinus and traced it, and then looked back at Indra and said, you want a spear, right? And then smoked and said, then let's start with the cool slash tuny process. Rap style I am the bone of my sword steel is my body, and fire is my blood I have created over a thousand blades unknown to death, nor known to life. Have withstood pain to create many weapons yet, those hands will never hold anything so as I pray, unlimited blade works. Jutsu suddenly the dimension started to get bright, and soon all of them shut their eyes from the brightness. Soon the light started to die down, and Indra and the hero faction opened their eyes only to find themselves in a different location, one where the ground was stabbed with countless weapons. Indra and hero faction looked around with a confused expression on their faces, and Indra asked, where are we? Suddenly Tatsa appeared out of nowhere and said, well, you are currently in my dimension. I thought that the previous dimension could collapse any moment, if started to get a bit serious. So now we are here. He then smiled and said, now, time for your spears. And raised his hand in countless number of true Longinus, Vasavi Shakti, and a lot of different kind of spear, came out of the ground and floated behind him. Seeing the scene in front of them the hero faction was completely speeches, especially Kao Kao, as he noticed countless number of true Longinus behind Tetsuya. While Indra though was a bit surprised by the scene he was mostly pissed, as he could clearly feel that there were countless number of the spears he had made yet, he could not control any of them. Tetsuya then pointed his finger towards Indra and immediately all the spears rushed towards him, and a frightening speed. The hero faction immediately jumped back not wanting to get in their way, while Indra once again covered his body with lightning and started dodging and firing spears of lightning towards an incoming wave of spears. Tetsuya who saw Indra using all he had to dodge the spears chuckled and said, looks like you can still keep up, then how about this? Suddenly the whole ground glowed and various spears appeared on it and pointed towards the sky, making Indra pale, not because of the number of spears, but because he could feel that each and every one of the spears below him was a god slayer. Tetsuya chuckled and said, looks like this is still not enough for you. And then his eyes turned into Sharingan, and a huge grey Tengu came inside of Indra and the hero faction, making them completely speechless. The Tengu then moved his arm, and a huge spear appeared in its HAND like Shisu Susanu. Indra looked at Tetsuya, with his eyes and mouth wide open in shock, not able to think what to say about the situation he was currently in. There was no way that he could dodge or protect himself from any of this not to mention Dash. Why the hell are you making me not move at all Atlas give me that much freedom? But Tetsuya who still had a smilab in his face looked at Indra and said, Oh, is this still nothing compared to you? Then let me get even more serious. And then made 24 more clones of himself clad in a Susanu, making a total of 25. Seeing 24 more giants appear in front of them both the hero faction and Indra wanted to cough blood at this sight. What no match for Indra, it was straight up bullying now. Indra wanted to argue and opened his mouth, but Tetsuya immediately interjected him and said, No need to say anything. I understand what you want to say, this is still nothing compared to your godly caliber, right? Then let's get even more serious here. And various more clones this time without a Susanu appeared on top of the Susanu's head with different swords and weapons in their hands. Though all of them could feel that the weapons were strong as hell, especially a sword-like weapon with a golden hilt, and a three black spiraling parts over it which were releasing a huge amount of energy knot. 
to mention half of them were wielding the same sword-like spiraling weapon. Indra and the hero faction were not sure anymore what to say about the current situation. This cannot be called even bullying anymore. Titsaya was clearly playing with him now. Titsaya who was hearing their thoughts for a while smiled and said, You all must be thinking that I am just massacring him. But don't worry I am not cruel. I give you all my word that Indra will not die apostrophe even if he wanted to. Titsaya then looked at Indra and said, In fact you will not even feel any of these attacks hit you at least till we wake up. Indra who heard that wanted to ask what he was talking about. But then Titsaya appeared in front of him with his Sharingan activated and said, Now look into my eyes and drift off to dream land of hell. Suddenly the scene in front of Indra's eyes changed, and he found himself in a completely dark space, with his hands and legs bound by some sort of chains. He tried to break free from them, but all his efforts were in vain. He gritted his teeth and said, Why is this happening to me? I just wanted that spear or you wanted a spear. Out of nowhere Indra heard a voice and turned his head only to find a bulky man wearing a magical girl costume. The man slash woman then took a magic wand and said, Don't worry magical girl Miltan will fulfill your wish. And shook he wonder some glitters came out of it. Indra looked at the man slash woman with an annoyed expression and thought, what the hell is this comedian doing here? A slash N. What else he or she is going to do some T I G E D Y asterisk C O U G H asterisk asterisk C O U G H asterisk comedy. Comedy? Do some comedy. Yeah, that's all. Suddenly when the glitter coming out of the want fell on the ground, a few more men slash women appeared near the previous one. The original looked at the newcomers and said, Magical girls, a friend here is in need of a help, darling want some spears. The group nodded enthusiastically and then walked towards the chain god and then surrounded him. Indra looked at all of them and asked, What the hell are you all worritos doing? Release me this instant. One of the bulky man slash women said, Oh, we will help you in your release. Indra nodded and waited for them to release the shackles, but then felt something on his butt and his whole body shivered. He wanted to turn around and look who was it. But then he felt another pair of hands holding his head in place, and saw the man slash woman's face just an inch away from his own, making him flinch on instinct. Now then let us show you a spear w-i-e-l-d-i-n-g tilde, and immediately someone tore off his clothes. Indra's eyes widened in shock, and it was at that moment he knew he f-u-c asterisk ed up got f-u-c asterisk ed. After months of closed door cultivation Indra, who was on the verge of having a mental breakdown, got out of the darkness, and was once again in the dimension from where it all started, but not ice, that his whole body was pierced by a lot of spears, and his wild body was covered in blood. He could feel pain even while breathing, and was barely able to open his eyes. Titsaya who noticed that the god was now back to his senses, unsummoned all his clones and weapon, including the ones impaled in his body, and went towards the god. Once he was in front of him, Titsaya lifted his hand, and Indra was now back to his original state. Indra looked at his body and tried to move it, but didn't say anything. He was afraid that if he were to say anything the human in front of him would get even more serious, and that was not good for him. He don't want to see feel any more spear wielding. Titsaya who heard his thoughts smirked and asked, was that enough, or should I get even more see dash Indra immediately raised his hands up and said, no need I surrender, I surrender. Don't get any more serious. I have seen enough please I beg you don't get serious anymore. And then immediately got on his falls while floating in the air. The hero faction who looked at their back are prostrating in front of the human was surprised but not that much. Though, they might not be aware of all the things that happened to him. What all they had seen was enough for them to think that Indra was dome for. They had seen many spear piercing him over and over again, and how his body kept on healing as well, which was continued by even more attacks by the giants, and spiraling sore thing Dotsusnu and EA. Titsaya looked at the god who was begging him for mercy, and with an innocent smile on his face asked, Eh? Didn't you want this spear? And moved the spear which was in his hand towards the god who immediately backed away a few meters from him and said, I am not going to touch any spears from now on, and by any I mean any you understand, that I dot am dot not dot touching dot it. And crossed his arms in a cross-like manner. Dot number Wakanda salute. Titsaya just stared at Indra for sh, while he was looking back at him with a reluctant look on his face. Titsaya then smoked and moved the spear forward, and Indra immediately moved away from him. Don't bring that thing near me. But it's yours, right? I don't want it, no. I don't even want to look at it. Oh, don't be like that. Come here, take it. And then once again moved forward, and Indra started running away, and Titsaya started chasing him. For some reason he found chasing after the god who was scared as hell. Just on seeing the spear felt amusing to Titsaya, and he did it for a few minutes before he felt bored and stopped. Indra then landed beside the hero faction and Titsaya in front of them. Both the parties stared at each other for a while, with the hero faction getting a bit wary and uncomfortable being in presence of Titsaya. All of them remained silent for a while, when suddenly Indra said, Cow Cow can you keep that spear away from me? Cow Cow who heard him looked at him strangely for a while, but soon complied with it. Titsaya looked at Indra and said, I am surprised that you can still be rational after all that. Indra felt a shiver run down his spine, just remembering about what happened to him in that back world, and looked at Titsaya and said, that was way too cruel of you, and you dare use that against a god like me. If I haven't sealed my conscious in meditative state, I would have broken down long ago. Titsaya who heard him widened his eyes and nodded his head and said, I see, so there is a way to counter this technique by the normal people as well. I thought only people like Barakil can overcome this. But it seems that I was wrong. Well, I get to learn something new anyways. Indra looked at Titsaya and asked, So what will you do now? I have tried, but I cannot leave this dimension. So what will you do to us? Hearing that the hero faction tensed up as well and got prepared to fight, even though it would just be a useless struggle on their part. Titsaya looked at them and said, Ah, uh, keep your weapons back and go back to the attire with which you all go in public. 
I will get us out of here now. All of their eyes widened, and they looked at Tetsuya as if he had grown a second head. Cow Cow came forwards and said, Wait, 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 you will let us go just like that? We literally attacked you, and we even tried to capture the Yakai leader. Tetsuya just shrugged his shoulders and said, Your attacks meant nothing to me, and regarding the attack on Yasaka, there was not even a scratch on her, and you would not have been able to beat her anyway. And if by some method you would have captured her or made a fatal attack on her, a barrier would have activated which would have notified me about that. And you all would have been dead the moment I came into the field. Besides, I already beat you all more than enough earlier, so all's fine. He then looked at Indra and said, And regarding you, there was no reason for us to fight in the first place. You just started attacking me for the spear, and I fought back in self-defense. It's not like you all were here to kill anyway, and I am on a vacation as well. So I don't want to deal with the annoyance of capturing or killing a god, who is still not blacklisted in his own faction, and a faction from the Cow's Brigade, which would make them try to neutralize potential threat, which will lead to further killing, and then more brave idiots will come, which will make me do more killing, and then more and more finally no faction would be left, and I would have to maintain the whole world, no thanks I already have enough to deal with. Hearing that all of them once again felt a reich on their brows, hearing that Tetsuya was still thinking that he could take on entire factions on their own, but this time they thought that it was somewhat possible after seeing his strength. Tetsuya then snapped his fingers, and all of them came back to Kyoto. Indra looked around and after confirming that he was back in his world, he sighed and apologized to Tetsuya for the inconvenience, and then left. Kao Kao and the others were about to hoe back, but Tetsuya stopped them and said, You all are not thinking of doing something funny here again, are you? All of them stopped on their tracks and looked at Tetsuya and didn't say anything. Tetsuya stared back at them and sighed. He looked at Kao Kao and asked, What is your goal? Kao Kao was surprised for an instant but then said, to show the whole world that humans are on top. Tetsuya nodded and said, yeah, and do you really think that the method that you are using, will help you reach that goal? Kao Kao who heard Tetsuya looked at him with a confused expression on his face, and wanted him to continue what he wants to say. Tetsuya said, I mean just think about it a faction that appeared out of nowhere, summoned the strongest being of the world, which let us assume that you all somehow managed to defeat, not that you all will last even a second against her, but let's leave it at that, how many do you think going to believe that? Hearing that all the hero faction members thought about it for a while, and so thoughts about what Tetsuya was saying was true came in their minds. Tetsuya then said, And if you all get killed while fighting Great Red, then forget about making a name for yourselves. No one will even know that you all ever existed. And let us assume that you were somehow able to defeat the dragon and some people believed that as well. Then the many factions around the world will come for your head, and let us assume this as well. That you were able to defeat all the factions as well. Then too your mission will fail. Cow Cow raised his brows and asked, How? Tetsuya nonchalantly said, Just think about it. If there is no supernatural factions around the world, who will tell about your supposed legends to the others, and soon your names will be forgotten as well. And if you are killed by someone else your aim to show the world that the humans are on top will automatically fail. Not to mention your names will go down as criminals in the history as well. All of them got shocked by Tetsuya's explanation and didn't want to believe him, but were not able to retort him. George then asked, So what do you think that we should do? Tetsuya looked at George and smirked seeing that they took his bait and said, Why not start making your name by fighting beings at your level, not in the way of killing them, rather challenge them to a duel. This will both serve as your goal and training. Not to mention you would be able to form connections with other supernatural as well. And even if you don't work with them, you all still would not be on their wrong side hopefully. But still that will help you all slowly make your name in the supernatural world, without getting bad rumors about you all. George and the others thought about what Tetsuya said and began pondering about the topic. Seeing Tetsuya decided to give the final blow and said, you know even Vali and his team fights with gods and other supernatural often, and don't have that many bad rumors about them, as they usually ask for a formal duel or training from their opponents. They have many connections as well. You know Vali. Yeah, he usually comes to get his butt kicked from time to time, not to mention Kiroka is my mate too. All of them were surprised by the sudden information, but Tetsuya then said, There is one more thing that I want to talk about, but I will tell you that when you all decide to change the path you all are walking on. Here, take this calling circle. I don't think I need to tell you how this works. George then took the paper with the magic circle inscribed on it, and then scanned it and nodded his head. Tetsuya nodded and said, Well, tell me when you change your mind and a warning no. I promise to you all. I don't care whether you change your ways or not. But if you dare threaten someone related to me whether knowingly or unknowingly, I will not show you mercy like this again. Today, I let you all go just because you all didn't came with the intention of killing or hurt Yusaka by mistake, but I know this as well. That mistakes don't happen all the time. So be careful who you choose to target. He then waited for them to digest all the information and saw them teleport away. He then made sure that no other suspicious person was in vicinity and said, well they did have valuable info in their brain that Varley didn't have. Looks like he isn't like much in the cow's brigade. Well, if they change I might take them under me as well and make them work undercover for me. If that does not happen, then me letting them live was a bad gamble. Not something that I can't take care of. Varley's gramps is working fast as well. He then gave a tired sigh and said, which means that more problems to take care of will arise. And I just happen to govern the center of most problematic events. He sighed once again, and then went back to the base of the Yaokai faction. Tetsuya returned back to the Yaokai faction and was immediately tackled by Kunu, 
who kept crying and thanking him for saving her mother. Titsaya comforted her for a while, and then put her in bed as she cried herself to sleep. Titsaya then decided to report the incident to Yasaka, without mentioning the involvement of the Hinder God, as the matter with the God was his own conflict, not theirs. All of them discussed about the matter, and finally the Shinto and Yakai faction decided to join the alliance, as the security issues were getting a bit problematic. Since the members of Kao's brigade were able to enter their territory without any problem, Sarah foresight seeing that she was finally able to convince the factions to join the alliance, but still felt a bit bitter as it was because of the Kao's brigade's invasion, and not her negotiating skill because of which they decided to join the alliance. Titsaya who noticed this consoled his magical girl for the whole day, but was not able to make much of a progress. He sighed and said, well, looks like I don't have any other way, and carried her in his arms much to the mayor's surprise and said, tonight I will have a battle with magical girl Sarah Tan in the bed that is, and took her to his bedroom. Sarah Fall who was feeling depressed for the whole day, was surprised by the sudden events, and was not able to register what was happening. After she was able to digest what was going on in her brain, she found herself to be in a dimly lit room with Titsaya sitting in front of her on a futon. A we wait Titsaya Char Dash, but Titsaya stopped her from saying anything by sealing her mouth with his own. Sarah Fall who was kissed out of nowhere by Titsaya, blinked her eyes in surprise, but soon went along with it, and started kissing back. Titsaya noticed that and inwardly smoked thinking that he was finally able to distract her. He then slowly pushed her back on the bed, and then started to open the kimono that she has been wearing from the time she came to Kyoto. He also undid her hair bun making her long hair to be seen in full glory, which was very rare for him as he had never seen her hair without being tied. He then stopped kissing her and moved a bit back to let the devil take in some breath and said, So were you saying something? Sarah Fall looked at Titsaya still gasping for air and said, I was saying that let me prepare my heart for it but it's fine now. She then looked at her almost open new carter and untied hair and said, no point in stopping here anyway. So how do I look with my hair like this? Titsaya caressed her hair and said, lovely. Sarah Fall chuckled and said, now then, let this magical girl show you some of her tricks. And then pushed Titsaya back and got on top of his, and started kissing him once again while taking of his shirt. Titsaya also noticed someone sneaking inside the room, but knowing who the person was he let it be, and then placed a barrier around the room for no sound to escape front the room. Sarah Fall who felt the barrier around the room smile mischievously, but then she realized someone else was in the room as well and tensed up, but soon calmed down feeling who the person was. Yusaka san it is not good to enter someone else's room. Ara, Seraphol san, I thought that something fun was going in here, so I decided to join. I hope you don't mind. Seraphol turned around and saw Yusaka wearing her usual yellow kimono with her ears and tails out. Seeing that Seraphol narrowed her eyes and said, Seeing that you have your ears and tails out, you decided to play serious, right? So me saying that I mind doesn't matter at all. Yusaka just chuckled and said, I don't know what you are talking about. Phew phew phew. Seraphol sighed and said, Fine, I am a generous magical girl. So I will let you in. Oh, then you won't mind me either, right? And then Kirumi who was inside Tetsaya materialized beside him and kept Tetsaya's head on her lap. But once Tetsaya and the others saw her all of them were surprised. Tetsaya moved his hand forward and caressed something and asked, Kirumi, since when did you have fox ears and tail in your human form? Phew phew phew, well when my body was made by Raya. I asked for some customizations. You like it right? Tetsaya caressed her ears and tails, and immediately her started rubbing his face with her tails and said, Yeah, they really are soft. And had a small smile on his face. Yusaka looked at Kirumi and said, So you also got your own tails and ears? Huh? Well looks like a new teammate to the fox ear group. Kirumi who was feeling ecstatic by her tails and ears being caressed by Tetsaya only gave a nod to her, before she was subdued by Tetsaya's caressing. She now understood why those Nekashu, Kunu and Yusaka always pester him to caress their ears and tails. It really felt like a bliss to them. Sarah Fall who being left behind by the other was a bit upset. But then she realized something and said with a smile on her face, Oh, don't underestimate the magical girl. And took out a Raiji out of nowhere and wore it and immediately a pair of bunny ears and tail appeared on her body. This magical girl have her own ways, Pyan. Titsaya and the others were surprised seeing Seraphol having a pair of rabbit ears and tail, but had to admit that she looked cute. Seraphol chuckled and said, You like it right? You should have there is no way that all that time I gave up on pestering Ajuka chan To make me this would be wasted. Suddenly her ears changed to cat ears along with her tail, and she slowly walked towards Tetsaya on her fours, and licked his cheek and said, Or, you like this instead, NYAA Tilda Tetsaya caressed her ears, and found that they were indeed real and not an illusion, as he noticed Sarah fully up, when he caressed her ears. Tetsaya pulled Sarah fall close to him and laid her on his lap, and asked while caressing her, So you made a juke make a device which will give you the features of different animals. Sarah fall who had a silly grin on her face, nodded her head Maki G the others, except for Tetsaya a bit surprised, and Kirumi and Jusaka said at the same time, so that means you can take any animal features, and you are using it for something like this. Sarah Fall looked at the two foxes and said, like you are one to talk, aren't you both doing the same with yours as well? It's not like you need to be in your yakai form, when you are planning to do something like this. Tetsaya then hugged her from behind and said, now now, no need to fight, rather, shall we start from where we left off? And without even saying anything Sarah Fall pushed his back and once again got on top of him. Sure, but Sarah Tan will be first. A few days have passed since Tetsaya's confrontation with the hero faction and Indra, and currently he was in his Kyoto branch office, going through some documents. Asterisk KNOCK asterisk asterisk KNOCK asterisk enter. The door of the room opened and Roswes came inside and said, it's time. 
I just got the call from Miyuki telling that the train have left the station. Tetsuya stood up from his chair, stretched his body and said, Then I should get going and join them on the trip. He then walked towards the door and was about to get out of the room. But then Roswa said, You cannot hoe there in your adult form. Tetsuya stopped on his tracks and then looked at his body and then towards Roswa, Thanks for telling. And patted her shoulder making the silver-haired lady smile in response. Tetsuya then changed back to his teenager form, and also changed to his school uniform and said, Well, see you in a few hours. I have already booked a room for you and Shuri in the hotel we will be staying at under my name. So tell her that she can take a day off. Roswas nodded with a smile on her face, and then thanked Tetsuya. She was happy to be able to work under such working conditions, where both the pay and treatment were good, and had pledged to herself that she will never let go of this job. Tetsuya then teleported to the train's washroom, and then casually came out of it, and noticed Asami near the basin, with Asia healing her. He went towards the two of them, making both of them surprised noticing that someone else was there as well. But both of them sighed seeing that it was Tetsuya, and not some random human, whose memories they had to remove, because of seeing something supernatural. Tetsuya gave both of them a peck on their cheeks and asked, So what happened for you to be treated during the train trip? Asia looked at Tetsuya and said, She was asked for a jewel by Sarai Xan, and well, in simple words she lost pretty badly. Tetsuya looked at Asami who immediately averted her eyes and said, What? Don't look at me like that I didn't go all out. I didn't use my Dragon Slayer powers. Tetsuya shook his head and said, Nah, you would still have lost even if you had used your Dragon Slayer powers. He can beat you pretty easily. And why did you not use your Dragon Slayer powers? Asami looked at Tetsuya with pout and then said, Well, he was a devil and not a dragon. So it would not have been effective much anyway. And it was just a casual duel. So showing up all my cards in the first place, without knowing his true intentions is totally foolish. Tetsuya smiled and said, And did you know something about his intentions after the duel? Asami sighed and said, He is just a battle maniac who only wants to fight someone strong. Especially those who are power types and go out in an all-out brawl. Tetsuya nodded and said, Good deduction. He then placed his hand on her shoulder shoulders and asked. But that still doesn't explain how you are still injured. Asami then looked towards Asia, who with a smile on her face said, Well, the fact that she lost a Sereg is still truth, so some extra punishment as a training must accompany the loss. Asami narrowed her eyes and said, That doesn't mean you and Shizuka sang ganging upon me in a not-so-mock battle. Tetsuya looked at Asia who was smiling and said, Don't need violent to others, especially your friends. Asia then said, I did that only for her own good, so that she can beat Sereg in the next battle which is the raiding game which will happen soon and doesn't tarnish your name. Tetsuya nodded and said, but still don't hurt her this much, that she needs to get treated on the train trip. And Asami get ready for the next training session, it will be with Tiamat. Hearing which immediately both the Sacred Gear and his host panicked, but were not able to refute when they saw Tetsuya's smiling face. Tetsuya then used his magic to heal Asami faster, and then left the washroom. All of them then got to their seats, and Tetsuya found himself sitting in between Hamari and Zenobia. Tetsuya looked at the two girls, one lying on his lap and the other on his shoulder, and asked the other girls, So what group am I in? Kagura smiled and said, You will be in our group with me. Hamari, Asia, Asami, Zenobia and Arena. Tetsuya was surprised and asked, Seriously such a convenient group was able to be formed. I thought the others will protest, especially the boys for me being the lone boy in the group of girls. Asia smiled and said, Don't worry the things went smoothly. Our classmates are surprisingly supportive. Asami looked at her and thought, You were the one threatened the homeroom teacher to form that group, and why was the one WHO threatened the whole class to shut up or you will shut them up for eternity? Tetsuya who heard her blinked his eyes in surprise and looked towards Asia and said, You should not threaten the classmates and teachers Asia. Asia whose lie was caught by Tetsuya just looked away and started talking to random girls of the class, seeing which Tetsuya just sighed and said, Whatever I will do with her and Hamari. I know you are already awake. Hamari who was pretending to sleep in his lap, slowly opened her eyes and saw Tetsuya looking at her and said, Don't mind me. This place is just comfortable, plus I can fill up my Tetsuya reserves for the days that you were gone. Don't act sportsy, how Kagura is behaving. Learn from her example. Oh, her turn to refill her gauges during night, we made the Nekishu agreement. The day is mine and the night is hers. And then snuggled in his lap, Tetsuya looked at Kagura who just smiled at him. More importantly tell the other one who is sleeping using your shoulder as a pillow. Tetsuya looked at the blue-haired girl who was dozing off before he even got there and said, Well, she looks genuinely tired as she has black circles under her eyes. Seems like she was finishing up her assignments before going to the trip. So let her sleep. Tetsuya and his classmates soon reached Kyoto, and Tetsuya then decided to wake up the blue-haired girl who was using his shoulder as a pillow. Tetsuya shook her a bit making Zenobia squirm a bit and saying, you um, just a bit more, and snuggled up to Tetsuya even more grabbing his arm with both her hands. Seeing that she's was not going to wake up easily, Tetsuya did the most logical thing he directed his killing intent on the blue-haired girl making the holy sword wielder, and the former church exorcist immediately opened her eyes and take distance from Tetsuya while preparing for a fight. Zenobia looked around only to find her classmates picking up their things and getting seated as they were about to reach their destination. Tetsuya looked at the confused Zenobia and asked, we are about to reach the station, so I took it upon myself to bring you back from the world of dreams. Zenobia looked at Tetsuya for a while, till she finally realized what was happening, and widened her eyes in surprise. She then sighed and said, I was very tired you know, 
you should have just let me sleep. Like I said, we are about to reach Kyoto, so it was important to wake you up. You could have just let me sleep till we reached there. Anyways, you still were able to perceive my killing intent even when you were asleep. Looks like your sense have not dulled even after living in comfort for a while. Don't try to change the subject. And yeah, there is no way that I will be totally defenseless while sleeping. Titsaya grinned and said, says the one who was sleeping like a baby while leaning on my shoulder just a moment ago. Looks pretty cute and defenseless to me. And patted her head. Zenobia who heard what she just did blushed in embarrassment at her mistake for being defenseless. But then she realized something and thought, Huh? Did he call me cute? She was about to ask him. But Tetsaya suddenly stood up and said, Well, we are here. Let's get going. And then got in line to get off the train. All the other girls stood up as well. Except for the confused Zenovia who soon followed the others. And got in the line as well. Hamari, who was standing beside Zenovia, whispered in her ear, Yeah, he called you cute, so stop being dazed. Or you will bump into someone. Zenovia looked at Hamari and then asked, Is that true? Will he make babies with me if he thinks that I'm cute? which immediately got the attention of all the other girls from the group. Arena immediately said, Now now, there is no way that will happen right, and looked at the other girls. All the other girls nodded and said, Well, he is not someone to do that with anyone he finds cute. Asia then said, The chances are higher though. Phi CHA in office took the least time to get laid after understanding her feelings for him, and he finds her the cutest. All of them got silent, but then Asami said, Well doesn't that depend on the opportunity and him being in relationship with the said person? Hamari nodded as well, Correct? It doesn't just depend whether he calls someone cute or not, even Sona whom he constantly teases, because of her being cute is still virgin. Kuo Hai, student counsel sitting on her desk Sona, who was going through some documents, suddenly sneezed making her queen to turn around and focus on her queen. Sona rubbed her nose and said, who is talking behind my back? Subaki went back to her work and then nonchalantly said, must be someone popularizing your virginity, making Sona immediately glare at her queen. Subaki just ignored her gaze, but then suddenly realized something and said, uh, I totally forgot. She took out her phone and walked towards Sona and said, Sarah Forsama sent a message, and showed her phone to her king making Sona wide in her eyes in surprise. In the phone screen, Seraphor was lying on bare-chested sleeping Tetsaya while kissing his cheek with their bodies covered with a sheet. There was also a message written on the bottom of the picture. One each chan wins. Tsubaki then took the phone back and looked at Sona who was still surprised and said, want to form an alliance for the greater good, and moved her hand forward. Sona immediately came out of her stupor and grabbed Tsubaki's hand and said, for the greater good then. And both of them shook their hand while both of them thought at the same time, I will be going before you, though. Zenovia who was confused about her situation asked, so will he or will he not? Kagura placed her hand on Zenovia's shoulder and said, if your only intention is to have his babies, then he will definitely not. If you don't have any affection towards him then it is just impossible. Zenovia stared at Kagura for a while, and then started thinking about it but was soon brought out of her thoughts when Tetsaya said, Well, looks like you all are enjoying the talk, bye please keep your surroundings in check. I had two made a barrier around you all to keep your talk to yourselves, and just so you all know we are already at the hotel. All the girls immediately snapped back to reality, and looked towards the hotel building and said at the same time, When no how did we come here? Tetsaya threw their bags back to them and said, By the hell of yours truly. Now take your bags and check in your rooms. Text me if you have some plans about going around or resting. We are free to leave me anyway. And then went to his assigned room. All the girls looked at Tetsaya's back, and Asia suddenly said, Ah, uh, he didn't tell us which is his room. Suddenly all of them heard a voice. Fear not because I am here. Quote number all might face. All the girls turned around and saw a black haired lady with a small ponytail, and wearing a kimono with a hand on her cheek. Shuri san, long time no see. Are you again slacking off on your work? Tetsaya will get angry at you. Shuri chuckled and said, Ara Ara Hamari chan, don't worry, I have boss's permission to take a day off. In fact, he was the one who gave me this day off. Isn't that right, Roswas? And turned her head to the side. A silver haired lady who was sitting on the bench wearing kimono looked towards the person who called her name and said, Yeah, Tetsaya indeed gave her a day off. Hearing that, all the girl from Shiba residence were surprised and said, You are joking. Right? Did you actually started working seriously? Shuri's brows twitched, and she said, Well, I can see how much do you all believe in me. Asia then cheerfully said, Just be happy knowing that we have a better image of you compared to your husband. Which made all of them silent remembering the Barakiel's deeds. After the girls went to their assigned rooms and kept their luggage in, they decided to tour around Kyoto. And even though the girls from Tetsaya's team had already visited Kyoto a lot of times, while meeting the Yakai and Shinto faction, they too were a bit excited to go around and guide Asami, Zenobia and Arena around the place. Tetsaya who got this information called in Kunu to join them which she happily did. She too was happy since her friends were visiting her after a long time informed her mother and her guards about Tetsaya's invitation. Yasaka agreed to it, but told her to be careful, as it has only been a few days since the hero faction attacked her, and ordered her guards to follow them in secret without disturbing them. Tetsaya and the others who were waiting outside the hotel for Kunu, were talking to each other as the girls who had not came to Kyoto before, were asking about the places that they could visit from the experienced bunch. Tetsaya who was sitting on a bench, suddenly noticed a blonde haired girl wearing a shrine maiden outfit running towards them. Tetsaya Nai. Kunu who saw the group immediately started running faster and was about to jump on Tetsaya, 
but Hamari caught her and said, Whoa, whoa, not so fast, Ku Chan. Don't forget about us. Kunu, who was caught in Hamari's arms, tried to struggle her way out, but was unable to. Finally, giving in, she sighed and hugged Hamari and said, Long time no see, Hamari ni. I missed you. Hamari smiled at her response and hugged her back and said, I missed you too, Kunu chan. Let's have fun together. Soon the other girls started to gather around Kunu and Hamari and started introducing themselves to the new girl. All of them were excited to meet Kunu, especially Zenobia and Arena who had not ever seen a Shrine Maiden. They happily introduced themselves along with Asami, who was curious as she could feel that the girl was a Yakai, but couldn't point out which one is currently Kunu, was in her human form. Titsaya then interrupted their introduction and said, Well it's nice and all to introduce yourselves, but let's get going and look around before it gets too late. You can talk while we are walking. All of them nodded and then discussed which place to visit first. Titsaya left the decision to them as he didn't have any problems anywhere they decided to go, and let them do as they pleased. Titsaya and the others who were walking around Kyoto led by Kunu, who decided to take the role of the guide, were happy as the atmosphere around them was peaceful compared to what they had been experiencing for a while. No fights against the cow's brigade, no training, no school. They were totally happy that nothing of such sort was happening and Tetsaya felt happy as well, since there was no danger from the cow's brigade now, as he had taken care of the hero faction not too long ago. Can you really eat all that? Tetsaya turned around and saw Zenobia looking at him curiously. He then looked at his hands which were full of different food items that he was planning to eat and said, yeah, without a doubt. Bet if there is anything that you want, then feel free to take some. Zenobia looked at the food items and then said, Then don't mind if I do. And took a bit of every time as she was a but interested in the food as well. The others who looked at the two gluttons just sighed and let them do what they pleased. They came here to enjoy, and if the two were enjoying eating, then they didn't have any problems with it. Kunu looked at the two and said, If you two eat too much, then you will get fat. Titsaya just looked at her and said, Don't worry I will burn the fat later at night. And smiled making the girls blush immediately, and Kunu immediately looking away in embarrassment. Zenobia looked towards Titsaya with a neutral expression on her face and said, you will be working out at night? Then I guess I will join you during your workout. Titsaya looked at her with a deadpan look on his face, while the other girls looked at her with pity. Arena as well prayed to God to give her friend some common sense. Titsaya just took something from the bunch of food from his hands, and moved it towards Zenobia's mouth, who just took a bite without hesitation. Seriously, just how much lack of common sense do you have? And patted her head, making the already confused girl tilt her head. Titsaya and the others just sighed and decided to drop the topic and continue their tour. On the way Titsaya and the others met Kibo and his group and talked to each other for a while. Titsaya invited him and his group to have lunch with them, but they all refused as they still had some places that they had to visit. All of them just continued their tour and later dropped Kunu back at the Yaokai faction and greeted Yasaka and Seraphol. Yasaka asked to let the others stay the night at the Yaokai faction, but Titsaya and his group rejected as they had to report back to the teachers and they didn't want to be under the surveillance of the others during the trip. Later in the evening Titsaya and the others came back to the hotel and met with Roswiss, and Shuri Sho just came back as well. Both of them greeted the others, and Shuri immediately dragged the others to the bath, as she had come to know that currently the bath was totally free, and they could have it for themselves unless someone came in late as well. Titsaya too decided to take his bath since it was free as well. He didn't like to be in with his other male classmates, since they would always pester him to set them up with some girls, or tell his own experiences with others. Once they were gone and were in their respective bathing areas, Esami suddenly said, alright, time to peek on him, and stood up with a serious expression on her face. All the other girls looked at Asami in surprise for a while, but soon sighed seeing their antics. Kagura then said, Why are you getting so excited? Haven't you already seen him naked before? Asami smirked and said, That is that and this is this. Just imagine Tetsaya in a bath with completely wet body and hair, isn't it stimulating in a different way? She said with a bit of blood coming out of her nose. All the others looked at her for a while, and then started to think what she just said, and Asia immediately said, I will be taking my leave first, don't mind me. But just as she tried to walk away, Hamari caught her leg and said, Now now Asia, don't be like that, I will accompany you. Or better, you can stay her, and I take my leave first, you should bar for a bit longer. Roswiss who saw what was happening said, everyone don't act shamefully like this. You have to maintain your image. Shuri patted her shoulder and said, don't be like that Roswiss, it is their time to enjoy such things. Let them do what they want. You two must have done same things with your crush when you were at their age, right? Roswiss immediately blushed and said, WW what are you talking about I have never done something so as shameless. Seeing her reaction all of them were speechless, and Shuri immediately grabbed both her shoulders and said, looks like this one needs the peeping treatment the most. Okay Isami-chan, I guess you have already found a peeping spot for the men's area. Isami just grinned and said, that's the first thing I did when I came to the hotel in the morning. All of them got speechless and thought at the same time, she really has a passion for her things. Shuri have a fake cough and said, okay, Roswiss wear your clothes we are going going to start your treatment. Roswiss who still had a blush on her cheeks said, like I said, I am not going to do something dash. Shuri leaned closer to her and said, 
Are you sure? You are getting the opportunity to see your boss's fully chiseled naked body. Do you really want to give up this chance? Just imagine about what all you can see. Ross was shuddered hearing the whispers near her ears and tried to imagine what she'd just heard. And her cheeks started to get redder and redder with the more she thought. Seeing that her words were working, Shuri smirked and then whispered once again. What? Started imagining already. But it looks like you can't imagine what he is like in the bottom, right? And Ross was immediately gulped her saliva. Shuri, who noticed her reaction, knew that she was spot on and said, then why don't you go with them and widen the horizons of your knowledge? I, I, if you really plan on doing something like that, first learn to discuss about it quietly. All of them got surprised when they heard the familiar voice and started looking around. Up here. All of them immediately turned their heads and saw Tetsaya looking at all of them from the top of the wooden wall, which was in between the male and female sections. I was just behind this wall, and you all were making a fuss from that side. Atlas control your volume when you are discussing something like this. All of them blinked in surprise on being lectured about something, but suddenly Roswes realized something and crouched down hiding her body with her hands. Kaya I have been defiled now, I cannot marry anymore. After the incident all of them decided to get out of the bath. There was an awkward atmosphere around Roswes, and she was keeping a distance from Tetsaya. The others who saw that didn't think much about it, except for Shuri, who occasionally pushed Roswes towards Tetsaya's direction. Tetsaya who noticed that looked at Shuri and asked, You know I am thinking that the salaries of some of my employees is quite high. And Shuri immediately took some distance from Roswes. She kept on smiling without looking towards Tetsaya's direction. Roswes sighed and then looked towards Tetsaya to thank him. But once her gaze fell on her boss, she immediately averted her eyes with a blush on her face. Tetsaya just ignored that and said, Well let's go and have our dinner. All of them simply nodded their heads without thinking much about it and went to the restaurant side of the hotel. After they were done eating the girls decided to rest up for tonight as they still had a lot of places to cover tomorrow and went to their rooms. Tetsaya, Roswes and Shuri who were left behind were drinking along with Azazel who joined them after he was done with some of his paperwork. Azazel and Shuri were discussing about how unlucky Barakiel was while Tetsaya and Roswes just silently listened to them while drinking. They just give their opinions either on Barakiel or Odin in between their talks and then silently listen to the conversation while drinking. Once Shuri and Azazel were wasted after having a drinking contest, Tetsaya just sent them to their room and sat down comfortably on the chair. He was not in the mood for sleeping as he has been doing so for the past few days at Yasaka's house. He looked at her silver head secretary who was just on the verge of being wasted and asked, Ross, want to go out right now to get in some fresh air? Ross was looked at Tetsaya and blinked her eyes in confusion for a while. Tetsaya who noticed that used his magic to get some of the alcohol out of her system, making her a bit sober. Ross was who was now about sober was able to process what Tetsaya said a bit clearly and just nodded with a blush on her face. Tetsaya nodded and took Roswes's hand and teleported away from the bar, after placing the money on the table. Immediately both of them appeared on top of the Kyoto Tower, and Tetsaya made a cushion for both of them sit on, and looked towards Roswes and said, Shall I remove all the alcohol out of you, and make you sober? You are wobbling a bit. But Roswes ignored him and took the bottle that she brought with herself, and started gulping down. Tetsaya immediately caught her hand once he saw her wobbling too much, and slowly made her sit down on the cushion, and himself lie down on his, after placing a magic on Roswes, so as to not make you fall of the tower. Tetsaya just silently stared at the sky with Roswes silently drinking her alcohol. But all of a sudden Tetsaya said, I know that it is water, so you can drop the act now, or you will have to rush to the bathroom. And Roswes immediately flinched and looked at Tetsaya with a surprised expression on her face. Tetsaya looked back at her with a smile on his face and said, Before you ask, I already knew it from the beginning. Ross was whose mouth was slightly open in order to ask something immediately closed, and she looked away. Tetsaya just sighed and said, You don't have to worry I am not going to take advantage of you. Ross was looked at Tetsaya with a surprised expression on her face, seeing that Tetsaya realized about what she was thinking. No, I am not thinking about that. Tetsaya looked at Ross was and just stared at her making her uncomfortable. Finally you able to bear his gaze she looked away and said, Maybe I thought a little about it. A little fine. Yeah. I has been thinking about that for a while now. Good, you should be honest with yourself, and sorry for making you feel uncomfortable. Ross was nodded and said, you should be. Tetsaya looked at her with a deadpan look on his face and said, seriously, you should be shaking your hands and say no no it's alright, no need to be sorry with Ankish on your face at this part. Looks like the rumors about you being uptight being unable to find a boyfriend because of it were true. And immediately the aura around Ross was darkened and she said, IT's not my fault for being like that I am just a virgin ex Valkyrie even I want to do pervy things with my boyfriend. And you don't have to say anything. Because of you my body is now defiled, and I will never be able to marry anybody Tetsaya, who immediately caught her arms which were ready to fire spells at him, tried to calm down the raging silver-haired lady, but was not making any progress. Then how about I take responsibility for you for your defiled body? And immediately Ross was stopped and the black aura around her started to die down. And how are you going to take responsibility for that? Just the same way that you are thinking right now. Hearing that Ross was immediately flinched and said, Are you able to read my mind? Tetsaya smirked and then telepathically said, Even better that you can read your own mind. Which made Ross was even more shocked. But we wait a minute do you mean that he have been reading my thoughts for quite some time now? She then immediately hid her face behind her palms and started sobbing and said, I have been mentally defiled as well. Seeing his secretary crying, Tetsaya sighed and started patting her back to console her, and gave her a bottle of high quality alcohol, to make her mental health stop degrading any further. Ross was snatched the bottle off Tetsaya's hand, and immediately started gulping down the content in it. Hey dilute at first, it's very strong. 
But she ignored him and gulped down the whole bottle in one go. She then threw the bottle away, and turned around to look at Tetsuya with a flush face. She is totally drunk now. Let's take her back to her room. But before he could do anything Russ was pushed him back, got on top of him and grabbed his collar and said, Are you asterisk HIC asterisk really going to take responsibility? And looked at him with narrowed eyes. Let's agree to her demands for now to let the matter settle down soon. Yeah, really, yeah, really. You are asterisk HIC asterisk not planning on going back on your words are you? Have I ever gone back on my words? Ross was stared at Tetsai's face for a while and then made a magic circle while summoned a sheet of paper. She then lifted Tetsai's hand and used her magic to form a small cut on Tetsai's thumb and then pressed his thumb against the paper. She then smiled with a foolish grin on her face and hugged the sheet tightly. Heh heh, now you cannot go back on your words, finally, finally, finally. I too have a boyfriend now. And then sent the paper back to and hugged Tetsaya tightly and said, You cannot leave me now. Tetsaya looked at the silver-haired lady lying on top of him and said, Actually it is the opposite. It is you who cannot go back and move a bit away. You are way too drunk. Ross was used her hands to support her body and look at Tetsaya with a neutral expression on her face. But soon a grin formed on her face. And she hugged him once again and said, Eh, I got a boyfriend. Tetsaya looked at his secretary and said, I should have given her a weaker alcohol. She has lost her reasoning. Tetsaya just sighed and let the drunk woman do what she wanted and closed his eyes and thought, she would be making quite a lot of ruckus in the morning anyway. Let's just lie here till then. The next morning Tetsaya felt some movement on his chest but the console that was in his hand back to his storage and waited for his secretary to clear her mind. Ah, my head head hurts like hell. Ross was sat up while grabbing her head with her eyes shut complaining about her hangover. I told you to dilute it a bit. Sorry my bar dash by suddenly she opened her eyes widely and looked at Tetsaya and soon her cheeks started to get redder. Before you start to complain about sexual harassment or anything else, let me tell you, you were the one who pushed me down and got on top of me after you were drunk. So I am the victim here. Ross was who got the sudden information was totally shocked and said, WW what are you talking about there is no way I would have done something like that. Tetsaya looked at her with a frown and said, So now you are going to act like that huh, even though you did all that in the name of taking responsibility for that incident, and now after doing all this, you are refusing to take responsibility. How can you be such a horrible person? You even made me forcibly sign some paper that you summoned with you are magic circle. You are really cruel. Ross was immediately got off from Tetsaya and said, There is no way that I would do something like that. And what document are you talking Abo dash she paused midway, and her expression immediately changed as if she realized something. She then formed a magic circle and summoned a paper once again, and stared at it intensely. After staring at it for a while her body felt weak and she fell on her knees, and the paper fell from her hand. Tetsaya who already knew what the paper was still took the paper to fit in the roll more correctly and read it. You actually had a marriage certificate completely filled except for the my signature. How much desperate were you for a boyfriend? Tetsaya thought to himself. He then looked at Roswas who had an expression of disbelief in her eyes. Her gaze met with Tetsaya's and both of them stared at each other for a while. Tetsaya who thought that he had messed with her enough was about to tell her about what actually happened. But out of nowhere Ross was bowed in front of Tetsaya and said, I am sorry for defiling you with this body of mine. I know that I cannot ask for forgiveness about such a situation, but I promise that I am going to take full responsibility for my actions. Tetsaya sighed seeing how serious his secretary was. He was about to say something. But once again Ruswas interrupted her and said, You may have already seen that certificate now. And yes, it is a legitimate marriage certificate given to me by my grandmother, and since I have forcibly made you sign it, I am going to go through it to the end. Once again I ask for forgiveness for my actions while I was drunk. Tetsaya just stared at Ruswas who was staring back at him. But soon a blush appeared on her cheeks, and she looked away and said, D don't stare at me like that. Seeing her acting like that Tetsaya really wanted to tease her more, but didn't give in to his temptations and asked, Are you really sure with this? I mean if you want we can just tear apart this contract, and then Dash Roswas looked at Tetsaya and said, I am totally fine with this. I have no intentions of going back on my word. Besides you don't have to feel guilty that I am doing this without my will. I will be totally honest here, except for you having a harem part you are totally my type. A handsome young man with a bright future who takes care of his partner. I am totally satisfied with this, and I am even ready to share you with the other girls, since this is my fault. Tetsaya just signed and said, just hear me out, and started telling her about what actually happened. After Tetsaya was done telling her about what actually happened, Roswas was backing her head with the roof of the Kyoto Tower, while having a blush on her face. Tetsaya who saw this just let her do what she wanted till she was able to calm herself. After waiting for a while Tetsaya stooped her started healing her swollen and bleeding forehead. Just calm down now, it was partly my fault for giving you alcohol at that time. Roswas who tears in her eyes, was looking at Tetsaya with a slight blush and a bloodied forehead. Seeing her expression Tetsaya sighed and wiped the blood off her face and said, there, back to your beautiful self. Roswas who was totally embarrassed by the current situation, was not able to look at Tetsaya properly, but still managed to look in his eyes. She gulped his saliva and said, T thank you. Tetsaya just smiled and said, no problem, I was at fault as well. So shall we go back? Roswas just meekly nodded her head and stood up and patted the dust off her clothes. Tetsaya stood up as well and said, 
So shall we destroy this bar dash? But Roswiss immediately snatched the paper from Tetsuya's hands and said, No, 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 don't. And both of them continued to stare at each other. Roswiss gave a fake cough and said, T, this is not a simple marriage contract. Tetsuya, who heard that, scanned the contract and immediately his eyes widened in surprise and said, Why the hell are you carrying such a cursed item for marriage hunting? Roswiss started shaking her head and said, No, no, no. I am not at fault here. Well, I am a bit at fault here. But still, that's not the problem. This thing here is made by my grandmother who made this when I was fussing too much about having a boyfriend to the point she got annoyed and made this contract. Your grandmother made a contract for death if this is ever destroyed. All the rules are not followed for your marriage. I really want to meet such a loving grandma. So I don't think that it would be wise to destroy this. Tetsuya thought for a while and said, Seems the best choice to me. This is even more well made. Than the one I was black dash asterisk c-o-u-g-h asterisk asterisk c-o-u-g-h asterisk requested to make by the other girls. And it looks like nullifying this will have the same result. Seriously, your grandma is hella scary. I don't want to get on her bad side. Ross was blushed in embarrassment and then said, T then D does that mean we are a couple from now on? Duh, what else would you be after you made him sign something like that? Suddenly a voice was heard by the two which made Ross was surprised and Tetsuya sigh in annoyance. So you finally decided to join us? Kirumi. And in an instant Kirumi materialized beside Tetsuya. Welcome to the inner circle secretary San. No, now you are a sister huh? So Ross was quote Ross was pointed her finger at Kirumi and asked, since when you were here? Kirumi tilted her head to the side and said, I was with you all since last night's dinner. You really can go wild while being drunk. I I I. Kirumi placed a hand on her shoulder and with a smile on her face said, you are going to take responsibility for what you did right. Hearing the word responsibility Ross was immediately became serious and said, yes, I am ready to take responsibility and as I said earlier, I am very happy to be in a relationship with him huh? Kirumi patted her back and said, good good, now then let's tell the news to the others, Tetsuya got a new wifey, and teleported away. Ross was blinked in surprise and said, ww what just happened? Tetsuya looked at Ross was band patted her head and said, you just got a ticket to spend your first wedding night with me, future wife Ross Chan. Ross was blushed on hearing that and immediately tried to separate herself from Tetsuya, but stumbled on the roof. Tetsuya immediately caught her hand and said, now now don't be that nervous, you said that I was your type, right? And we have known each other for quite a while now so don't get flustered so easily, and pulled her back and made her stand properly. Tetsuya then bowed his head a bit and then said, well I am a butt late, but still let's do this, Roswiss, will you hoe out with me? Although you literally have no choice in this case, I promise that I won't cause you any trouble well, except for the training part. Roswiss also bowed her head, although a bit in a hurry and said, yes, I am happy let's get along in future weight. A minute what are you doing Tetsuya looked at her and said, giving you a proper confession, although it is meaningless as you made me sign that contract, but still I thought that you would be happy if you got a proper confession. Ross was stared at Tetsuya for a while, and then sighed and said, the first confession I ever got was one where I had no choice about it. I really am unlucky in these kind of things. Tetsuya chuckled seeing Roswiss's expression and patted her head and said, Don't worry even if you were not so lucky in this situation. I promise you that you won't regret it in future. She looked at Tetsuya who was patting her head and asked, Why are you patting my head? Well, it is calming. She just stared at him for a while and then let him pat her head as it was indeed a bit calming. The incident about the cursed contract was over and all the girls congratulated Roswiss for finally being in a relationship. And although she felt that it was a bit wrong as it was because of the contract the other girls cheered her and told her to just go with the flow and not think too much about it. All of them soon returned back to Kuo, as their trip was finally over, and now the devils were preparing for their next event after their relaxing trip, the youth raiding games. Isami who had been defeated by Sereog once was now thoroughly taught to train by the others along with Saji, who was also training under Tetsuya as he requested him to train him once again. Roswas as well was now being trained more severely so as to not being overshadowed by the rest of Tetsuya's group. There was a new determination in her as the Torta training was actually doing wonders for her making her enthusiastic, as she had something new to focus on. Tetsuya himself was now quite busy as he had taken a week-long vacation, and was now back to his hectic life, with his clones back to work. The other noteworthy things that happened were Ravel joining the Kuo Academy, much to Kaneko's annoyance. Though she was now a bit happy, as her classmate Nekishu gave her some tricks for her growth, which made Tetsuya slightly sad. A few days passed by and currently Tetsuya and his group were preparing to vote to the underworld for the raiding game between Riaz and Sereg. Tetsuya looked at the girls and said, Okay, we will be going now, but make sure to not cause any trouble. And you too dash, while pointing at Raya and Office, don't let anyone know your identity by releasing your aura. I have already suppressed it, but don't go overboard because of that. And you Kuroka just ignore anyone who try to mess with you. I have already asked Sersages to clear your name, so there won't be any problem. And last but not the least Asia, don't pick a fight with someone who tried to accuse you for Diodora. All four of them just nodded their heads in approval. Tetsuya nodded as well and looked at Roswiss who made a magic circle to Underworld. A few moments later all of them appeared in front of a building which they presumed to be the stadium where the raiding game was going to take place. They were about to walk in, but suddenly all of them heard a voice. Hey, so you guys finally came. 
Huh? They turned around and saw Azazel coming towards them, along with Serzich's, Grafio and Seraphal. All of them greeted each other and said, Yup, so anything interesting going on? Azazel shrugged his shoulder and said, Nothing much, just meeting with some gods for peace and all. Nothing of your interest. So who are you betting on for today's game? Sereg. But if Rias has some cards up her sleeves, then the matter is different. Hearing that all three of them were surprised and Azazel asked, immediate answer, you really don't believe in your friends much, right? Titsaya shrugged his shoulders and said, I have overseen the training of two of Rias' teammates, and I have been in contact with the others of his group as well, and given pointer to all of them, so I am more than aware of their powers though Gasper can change the whole situation of the game, if he used the move which I taught him at the right moment. This time even Titsaya's group got curious hearing what he said and Serzich's asked, what move? Titsaya smiled and said, where is the fun in telling you now? Wait for the surprise. Serzich's just sighed and nodded his head, but soon he turned back to his cheerful self and said, Don't worry Rhea Tan will surprise you all. He then looked at Tetsaya with a smirk and said, You are not the only one who have been giving pointers even Rhea Tan is serious this time, and has asked for help from her on each chan though someone doesn't let me enjoy those moments. And glanced towards the silver haired maid standing behind him. Grafia glared at him and said, You were fooling around the whole time on the first day she came to ask for your guidance as a man. It is totally unsightly seeing you acting like that, and it is also my job to make sure that you do your work on time. Serzich's wanted to refute. But just as he saw the ice-cold glare from Grafia's eyes, he immediately turned around and said, Well, let's get going. The match could start any moment now, and started walking towards the stadium. The rest of them didn't thought much about it, and just followed behind him. But soon all of them stopped when they saw a group of people coming towards them. Serzich's looked at the group with a smile and said, Good evening to you, Lord Bale. Are you here to watch your son's match? The new Devil Council just stopped and looked towards Serzich's and the group behind him. Lord Bale then looked back at Serzich's and said, No, we just came to check whether the preparations were well made or not after all. A lot of people from other factions will be coming to see our raiding games from now on. Titsaya looked at the new council and saw some familiar faces in the group, though seeing someone there immediately made him fell, like punching the person's face, and the fake smile on the person's face, while looking at him, just made the feeling even stronger. The said person just came forward and said, it's been a while right, should become. Titsaya smiled back and said, it certainly has been quite a while Lord Gremory. Looks like you are a council man now. Congratulations. Ha ha ha, thanks a lot for that, they just wanted some experienced personnel. After someone killed most of the council men during the youth meet, and miraculously even I was selected. You mean by bribe right? Titsaya thought. Titsaya who was still smiling said, Well, whatever might the reason be you still became a council man is a thing to celebrate. I just hope the thing that happened to the previous council men don't happen to you. And immediately Zodicus's smile got a bit stiff. But he still said, Yeah. I hope so as well. Right, we still had a lot of work to do. So shall we get going gentlemen? The rest of the council looked towards Lord Bale, who just nodded and started walking away. Once there were a knot in their sight the whole Tetsaya's group thought at the same time, I really wanted to punch his face. Tetsaya looked at his group and said, Shizuka you can now release Asia. Shizuka released Asia's hand which was being held by her and said, Why the hell were you crushing my hand? Asia just smiled and said, Ah, uh, I just wanted to express my feeling to him with my fists. Sorry got a bit out of control there. Shizuka raised her hand which was completely swollen and said, are you calling this just a bit? Asia just playfully stuck out her tongue, and then started healing Shizuka. After Asia was done healing Shizuka all of them once again started walking towards the waiting rooms. After entering the Gremory group's waiting room, all of them saw each of them either warming up or trying to calm themselves. Rias and the others who glanced towards the door to see the visitors, were happy seeing them, but before anyone could say anything, Serzich's walked towards Rias and stared at her with a serious expression on his face. Rias stared back at her brother for a while with a serious expression as well and said, we will win. Serzich's smiled and patted her head and said, do your best. Rias pouted and moved Serzich's hand away from her head and said, don't do that, Oni-sama. Hey hey Rias Tan who is pouting is cute as well. But suddenly he felt someone grab his ear, and it didn't even took a second for him to understand who the person was. Grafia looked at the others and said, Well then ladies and gentlemen, Serzich's Sama has a lot of guests to entertain, so we will be leaving first. Best of luck to you all, and Tetsaya Sama and the others, please call me when all of you are done with your talks. I will guide you all to your seats. Abu we wait a minute, Rhea Tan needs her Oni-chan here to motivate her. It's my responsibility as her Oni-chan to take care of this. She must be waiting for her Oni-chan to give her a loving hug. Grafia looked at Serzich's with a glare making him stop struggling and said, Do I need to remind you that you are a man Serzich Sama? And then started dragging him away. Seraphal soon followed them as she too had to greet the guests. Azazel left them as well as he had some matters to take care of. Now that only the Gremory and Shiba group were present, Tetsaya looked at all of them and said, As a friend, here's an advice from me. Don't get overconfident in the game, especially you Rias. Rias looked at Tetsaya with a surprised expression on her face and asked, Why me specifically? Tetsaya looked at her with a deadpan look on his face and asked, Do I even need to tell you how you won your first game? Rias, who was now reminded of her victory against Ryza, just averted her eyes, and with a pot on her face said, You don't need to talk like that. I won't do something stupid this time around. I have been even training how you instructed me to. 
Hearing that all of them were surprised making Rias twitch her brows and ask, does the fact that I was trained for the game that surprising? All of them didn't say anything and just stared at her making her pissed at her friends. Fine then I will show you all how serious I am, and how hard I have worked for this. She then pointed towards Tetsuya and said, so make sure to watch me. Tetsuya who saw the serious look on her face, was a bit surprised as this time he genuinely felt that she was determined. He chuckled making Rias glare at her thinking that he was making din of her. Tetsuya then looked at her and said, then how about this? If you were able to show me that you were determined and worked hard for the game through your actions, then I will fulfill one of your requests, though just a simple one, not anything supernaturally, just simple thing that normal people can do. Once again all the people in the room were surprised by Tatsaya's declaration, but Rhea smirked and said, don't go back on your words. I can ask you anything that a normal person can do, right? Tatsaya shrugged his shoulders and said, yup. Tatsaya then started walking towards the door and said, I am now going to check on Sereg and his group. Best of luck to you all. Oh. And Asami of your performance was probably prepared to experience hell. Asami who heard him flinched and said, Hey why am I the only one WHO is threatened Tetsaya? Just ignored her and left the room to meet the other group. Soon he came to Sarayeg's waiting room and knocked on the door. Soon the door was opened by Kusha who was surprised to see Tetsaya. But immediately a smile came on her face and she hugged him. Tetsaya hugged her back and said, I missed you. Kusha who was hugging him pinched him and said, Like I can believe that from someone who is surrounded by girls 24 sevens. Tetsaya chuckled and said, I am telling the truth though. Kusha stopped pinching him and said, fine fine, whatever. So who are you here? Tetsaya broke the hug and said, just came to visit you before the match to make sure that you are not nervous. Kusha smiled and said, then your visit is wasted, sorry, but I'm not nervous. Not nervous huh? Then we can say that I came here just to meet you. If you are just here to flirt then just go back. Don't ruin the mood before the match. Tetsaya looked at the voice who said that, and saw Koreana looking at the two of them. Kusha just smiled and said, now now, don't be jealous, just because you recently had a breakup. And immediately Koreana had some tick marks on her forehead. Tetsaya who saw that a fight was about to start between the two girls, looked towards the other males and said, Yo, ready for the game. All of them looked at him with enthusiasm and nodded their heads, and Sarayag said, Hey, we will show them how hard we have worked for this by winning. More importantly, when are you going to fight me? Tetsaya sighed at the Battle Maniac's question and said, I will think about it, so let's talk about it later. Sarayag nodded and said, Fine, but don't forget about a spa. Tetsaya nodded and said, Well then I will not disturb you all so do your best. All of them just nodded and thanked Tetsaya who was walking towards the exit, but his hand was grabbed by someone. He then turned around and saw Kusha looking at him. Tetsaya smiled and made a soundproof and invisibility barrier around him, and kissed Kusha, who started to kiss him back. After a while Tetsaya separated himself from her and said, Once this game is over let's go out on a date. Kusha smiled and nodded her head and gave him another peck on the lips and said, Cheer for me. Tetsaya smiled and caressed her cheek and said, I will, but I am not going to be partial. And immediately she pinched his waist and with a smile on her face said, I know. She then got out of his embrace and said, Now get going the match is about to start. Tetsaya smirked and bit her earlobe and said, Then see you later and teleported away from the room, leaving behind a slightly blushing Kusha who was now visible to everyone, as the barrier was now gone. Koreana looked at her fellow female teammate and said, you really like to rub it off, don't you? Kusha looked at her and said, what? It's not like you saw what we did. Koreana snorted and said, oh, please, I can easily see what is going on your mind right now, and I don't even require any kind of power for that. You lewd blondie. That's what you are called, though. Koreana clicked her tongue and just looked away from Kusha, not wanting to continue the argument. Tetsaya and the others were done meeting with the teams, and were now sitting in a room along with Miss Lara and Venelana, who came to watch the match between their children. All of them were talking to each other when the announcement of the two peerages entering the stage was heard. After the rules about the dice figure game were made clear to the public, and the commentators were introduced to all, the two kings were asked to come up on the platform and roll the dice. Riaz and Sarayag both got on top of the platforms and took the dice in their hands, and threw it in the bowl. Participant Sarayag rolled a 1, and participant Riaz rolled a 2, making a total of 3. That means both teams can either send out a knight or a bishop. There will be 5 minutes for both teams to discuss. And then the area where both the teams were sitting was seen closed by an opaque barrier. After the time was up Kibber from Rhea's peerage and Beluga from Sarayag's peerage came forward. So a match between knights. Huh? Who do you think is going to win? Asked Mesla looking at the others. Tetsaya's group didn't even took a second and all answered at the same time, Kibber. Seeing them answer in unison both the mothers were surprised, but soon chuckled and Mesla said, Looks like this match is in Rhea's favor. Miyuki looked at Mesla and said, Don't worry the tide of the battle will turn around once Sarayag or Regulus enters the game. They all are still no match for those two except for Asami, I guess. After all Onisama trained her himself after she got her as handed to her by Sarayag last time. Seeing the girl trying to lighten her worries, Miss La smiled and said, thank you. Miyuki waved her hand and said, no need for that. I only told what I thought was true. All of them looked back only to see Kibba and Beluga being teleported to the raiding game field. Kibba and Beluga were facing each other, with Beluga wearing his armor and sitting on his horse, while Kibba holding his holy devil sword. So you are Kibba Yuto from Ria's Gremory's peerage. Tetsaya Sen has told me that you are a great swordsman. Kibba smiled and said, well, it is good to hear that. So now shall we begin? Beluga smiled and covered the lid of his helmet and said, I really want to see who the better knight amongst the two of us is. Kibba gripped his sword tightly, and Beluga gave the order to his horse to move forward. Both the knights immediately disappeared from their spots. 
and in an instant appeared at a different part of the field, with their weapons clashing. Seems like what Tetsuya sent told about you being fast ain't no joke. Kiba smiled and said, thanks for the compliment you are pretty fast as well. A tick mark appeared on Beluga's forehead, and he said pretty fast huh? Then how about something like this? And once again both the knights disappeared from their spots and started clashing against each other. They continued to strike at each other, and then disappear from their spots only to clash once again. You can keep up with this, huh? Beluga told Kiba who just smiled in response. Beluga smiled and said, then how about this? He used his other hand to strike at Kiba who just made another sword and blocked the attack. Seeing that instead of getting worried Beluga smoked though Kiba couldn't see that as Beluga's face was hidden by his helmet. Suddenly out of nowhere the horse used his front legs to attack Kiba, who out of surprise was not able to either defend or dodge the attack and was pushed back a few meters away. But soon Kiba stood straight without any difficulty and said, that was a heavy hit, looks like the horse get proper treatment. Seeing him standing as if nothing happened both the horse and his master were surprised. How is that possible my horse's kicks are as powerful as normal rooks? Kiba smiled and asked, have you ever trained being a meat shield for Asia-san? WW what? I did that once, those are the most painful times I can ever remember. I had to receive hits all over my body, without rest, without injuries. The only thing that I received was pain. I was not even allowed to pass out. The moment I started to bank out, I was healed once again to start from the beginning. The whole day I was hit even walking felt painful all those times. Have you ever trained like that? Hearing that the whole audience was silent looking at the blonde head boy with shocked expression on their faces. Though in the room where Tetsuya and the others were sitting, all of them were looking at Asia, who was the one who trained Asia during the training camp before the match with Ryza. Hamari looked at Asia and asked, do you really had to break him that much? Asia looked at Tetsuya and said, weren't you the one who told me to train him like that? Tetsuya looked back at her and said, I never told you to break him. What would you have done if something got awakened in him at that time, and he became like Barakiel? Just imagining Kiba acting like that will give you shivers. All of them who had met Barakiel early on were familiar with his nature, tried to imagine Kiba acting like that. In the next instant all of them shook their heads to get that image out of their minds. Back to the raiding game. Kiba then closed his eyes and said, but still, because of those punches, I have developed enough resistance to shake off attack like those without any problems, now it's my turn. And then got into his stance. The Luger immediately got into his stance as well, and formed multiple clones of himself. Seeing the clones Kiba said, I can deal with them with my new trick. But Dash he crouched down a little and said, let me show you the speed which Tetsuya must have told you about. And vanished from his spot once again seeing which the clones vanished as well. But this time instead of them seeing clashing against each other, it was Kiba pointing his sword towards the fallen Beluga, who had his armor filled with dents, and his helmet cracked. His horse was lying down somewhere else totally unconscious. Beluga looked at Kiba with blood coming out of his mouth and nose, and said with difficulty, your speed is really something else. Kiba smiled and said, I had dodged some of those punches as well, you know. Beluga chuckled and said, looks like I have to ask Sarah Exama to hit me as his punching bag from now on, and then got dissipated in light particles. Seeing the body disappear Kiba sighed and I summoned his swords. The winner of the first round is Kiba Yuto from Ria's Gremory's Peerage. After Kiba got back to the team, the others congratulated him for his victory. The announcer made some comments after which both the kings were called once again to roll the dices. Ria's and Sarah Egg once again came forward and stood on their respective platforms. They took the dice in their hands and then rolled it in the bowl. Both the participants rolled a 5, making it a total of 10. There are a lot of combinations that could be made here. Once again both teams are given 5 minutes to discuss the strategy. Both of them got back to their peerages, and once again a barrier surrounded them. After the 5 minutes were up, Kaneko along with Zenovia came forward from Ria's peerage while Liban and Godoma came forward from Sereg's peerage. All four participants were then sent to the raiding game field, and once again a huge screen appeared. Once all four of them were in the field they looked at each other, and the knight from Sereg's team decided to introduce themselves. I am a knight from Sereg's armor's peerage Liban Crisel, and the big guy beside me is Gandoma, a rook. Kaneko Taju, a rook. Zenovia Quarter, a knight. Liban nodded and said, well then, shall we begin? And got into his stance which was soon followed by Godoma. Seeing those two both Kaneko and Zenovia became serious. Zenovia immediately took out extra Randall, while Kaneko turned into her Nekishi form. But just as she started transforming the power enveloped her body, making her a bit surprised. But then she heard a voice in her head. Kaneko-chan, mind your surroundings. You are going to flash your panties to the audience. Hearing that Kaneko blushed and thought, S senpai, and once again she heard the voice, yeah, it's me Tetsuya, but anyway focus on the game. Best of luck. Kaneko after hearing that looked at her opponents with a serious look on her face, though she had a slight blush on her face. Senpai saw that. I mean I don't mind if it's senpai B but, and immediately her mind started to make various fantasies. But she soon snapped out when she felt something coming towards her and jumped up. Just as she jumped a huge fist went through right under her. One should never be distracted during a battle. Kaneko landed a bit away from him, and glared at the rocky humanoid giant. Seeing the glare the giant flinch a bit, but soon got into his stance and thought, what the hell happened to her all of a sudden? Kaneko who was glaring at the giant thought, you piece of rock dare to interfere when SENPA either one she was imagining was patting me you will be crushed, and immediately ran towards the rock giant. Gendoma who saw the Nekishi coming towards her punched forward, but Kaneko easily dodged the punch and jumped on top of his hand and started running on it. And once she got close to the giant, she covered her fists with demonic power, Taki and Senjutsu, and punched the giant's face. Not even a second after the punch Gandoma was thrown away and crashed into the wall. 
Kineko looked at the huge giant implanted in the wall and said in a low voice, never disturb me again during my patting sessions. While this was going on the other two participants had also started their fight, Liban was striking Zenovia at a very high speed, making her go totally on defense. Kiba smirked seeing Zenovia struggle and asked, what happened, am I too fast for you? Zenovia looked at the smirking Liban and then smirked as well, seeing the smirk Liban was confused, but then suddenly his face turned into a frown. Zenovia used her extra randle to summon her Excalibur destruction and slashed towards Liban with full force. Seeing the sudden appearance of the sword Liban was surprised, but still still dodged the slash and said, eh, looks like you missed. But Zenovia still had a smirk on her face and said, oh, really? And continued her attack, and the Excalibur hit the ground, making many cracks appear on it. And soon an explosion occurred making the ground blown apart, throwing away Liban in the process. Zenovia kept Excalibur back to the extra randle, and looked at the fallen Liban and said, looks like your mind is not as fast as you. Liban gritted his teeth and was about to use his sacred gear on Zenovia. But Zenovia then said, now let's see if you can catch up with me or not. And used the Excalibur rapidly's ability to increase her speed, which was already boosted by her night piece. In an instant she appeared in front of Liban and used her sword's blunt side to attack Liban's gut with full power. Just think of this as how ASTA Black Clover beat Seki, the bar hard guy, during the night selection. Liban's mouth opened wide with and blood came out of his mouth. He looked at Zenovia who still had no intention of stopping her attack and then smashed the guy along with her sword in the ground, making Liban ho unconscious with her eyes turned white. Zenovia looked at the now unconscious Liban with a confused expression on her face and thought, that was easy. I thought that these opponents were considered one of the best. Suddenly she heard a crashing sound and turned her head and got in her stance but only saw Kaneko looking at the wall. She then looked at the wall as well, and saw the huge rock guy implanted in the wall. She stared at the rock guy for a while, and then turned towards Kaneko. Suddenly realization hit her, and she widened her eyes in surprise. It is not that these opponents are weak. It is the fact that the people I am being around are way too strong. They have messed with my common sense of power levels. Though it was because of these overly strong people that I became stronger naturally. Kaneko then looked towards Zenovia and then at the unconscious knight, and then back at Zenovia. Done. Zenovia snapped out of her thoughts and looked towards Liban and nodded her head, yeah. And as if to justify her claim the announcement was heard. Serei Iksama's Rook and Knight are unable to battle. The winner of this round is Kaneko Taju and Zenovia Quarter of Ria's Gremory's Peerage. All four of them were then transported back, and Zenovia and Kaneko got back to their teammates. Ria's looked at them and said, good job you two. Congratulations. Ismai nodded and said, yeah. You two just one shot both of them that was really cool. Akeno nodded and said, yeah, you two were great, but still don't you think that you two did too much. Even Yuto-kun took some time even if he could win easily. Kaneko just blushed and looked away. Now that she could think clearly the reason for her to act like she did in the game was not something she could tell them easily. Even thinking about the situation that she fantasized about made her embarrassed. Zenovia on the other hand plainly said, oh, I was just trying to make an impact. Hearing her all of them got curious, while Kaneko just sighed in relief seeing that Zenovia brought the spotlight on herself. Riaz looked at Zenovia and asked, impact. Zenovia nodded and said, a few days ago, I got some knowledge that in a pack of wolves, the one who is the strongest is able to attract the opposite sex quite easily. Ha, huh, W, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Zenovia tilted her head and said, impressing someone. Isami shook her head and said, no, 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 I am not talking about that. Who the hell told you this? Zenovia looked at Asami with a confused look on her face and said, What? Is something wrong with my theory? Asami nodded and said, First of all, why the hell are you taking wolves as an example? Aren't men called hungry wolves? Aika Sen told me that. Hearing that all of them sighed and looked at the innocently corrupted girl with pity, Asami placed her hand on Zenovia's shoulder and said, Stop asking these types of thigh GS from her, she is beyond common sense of normal people. Heck, I even believe that she has a sacred gear which allows her to measure someone's dick size. Just ask me if anything like this comes to your mind. Zenovia just nodded thinking that her information was wrong and decided to take Asami's help. Riaz looked at her knight and asked, By the way, who were you trying to impress? Zenovia looked at Riaz and said, Oh, that's Dash IT was me, Dio take two colon. Zenovia looked at Riaz and said, Oh, that's Dash. But before she was able to finish the announcer got their attention and called Riaz and Sereg for the next match. Riaz and Sereg got on top of the platforms, took the dice in their hands and rolled it inside the bowl. Participant Sereg Sama rolled a 3, and participant Riaz Sama rolled a 5, making it a total of 8. Both teams have 5 minutes to discuss. After both the kings got back to their places the peerages got enclosed by a barrier. Inside the Gremory peerage area before anyone could say something Asami announced, I will go. All of them looked at Asami for a while, but Riaz just nodded her head and said, don't exhaust yourself too much. Asami smirked and said, don't worry, my stamina is very high thanks to my regular training with Tetsuya. Hearing that all of them just sighed except for Gaspar and Zenovia, Zenovia just thought that Tetsuya trained her in a way to increase her S-T-A-M-I-N-A-A slash N. Well she is correct in a sense I guess number even if you are correct doesn't mean that you are right. While Gaspar, who had an intense blush on his face, just hit his face with his hands while mumbling something like Tetsuya Senpai is being too manly inside the barrier of Sarayag's peerage. Sarayag and his peerage were discussing about who to send out, and Kusha said, since the value is 8, the only people who can come out are the knight who fought before, the bishop. 
The Red Dragon Empress which I think is most likely in the King Rhea's Gremory herself which I don't think will happen. All of them nodded and Sereg thought for a while and said, I don't think they will send the knight, as his match was over not too long ago, and sending a bishop alone, when the value is this high, is not very likely especially for a Gremory who care for their servants a lot. So the most probable answer should be the Red Dragon Empress. He then looked at his peerage and asked, but who will go against her? All of them remained silent for a while, when suddenly a very skinny man raised his hand and said, I wish to experience the power of the Red Dragon Empress if you allow Sereg Sama. Sereg looked at the man and with a smirk on his face said, want to check who the better dragon is, eh? Fine, but don't underestimate her, she is very strong. Not to mention she is under Tetsai's tutelage. Hearing that the old man named Ladora nodded his head with a serious expression on his face, Sereg then looked at his peerage once again and asked, so we still have a margin of three. Huh? He then looked at his bishops and asked, any of you want to accompany him? Hearing that the robe boy raised his hand and said, I will go. If something goes wrong for Ladora, I will seal her sacred gear for a while. After all, we cannot let the match go any more out of hand. As he said that the three people who just lost became a bit dejected, seeing which the robe boy names Mistita immediately apologized to them. After the five minutes were over Asami from Rhea's side, and Ladora and Mistita from Sereg's side came forward. In the room where Tetsaya and the others were sitting the whole Tetsaya group just sighed seeing the contestants of this round. Seeing them Sai Mislara and Venelana looked at them and asked, what happened? Is something wrong? Kirumi chuckled and said, nothing much, it's just that the match this time is totally in Asami's favor. The team which Sereg picked is the worst possible team that he could have thought of to face against Asami. Hearing that Misla looked at them with a confused expression on her face and asked, Why? You all should already know what those two are capable of. And I think that against the Red Dragon Empress a dragon would be the best choice. Not to mention Mistita's RB Dash. Before she could finish Tetsaya looked at her with a smile on his face and said, You'll see. And then looked back ahead, making the entire room silent. Miyuki looked at Mislar and said, Don't think too much, he is just excited since he trained Asami himself this time around. Woke Mislar just nodded and focused on the game once again with curiosity, filling her to know what Tetsaya is so confident about. All three participants came in front and were instantly teleported to the raiding game field. Once all of them were there Mistita gave a bow and said, It's a pleasure to meet you Red Dragon Empress. I am Mistita one of Sarai Iksana's bishop, and this man beside me is Ladora, a rook. Ladora gave a bow as well and said, A pleasure to meet you. Asami hurriedly bowed as well and said, Ah, uh, a pleasure to meet you as well. I am Asami Hayadu, a pawn. Both the boys nodded and Ladora said, Since the introductions are over, let us begin. Mistita please stand back. Mistita nodded and then took some distance from Ladora. Seeing that Asami narrowed her eyes and said, Hey old man are you looking down on me? And started releasing a bit of her aura. Feeling the aura Ladora felt a bit excited and said, Not in the slightest. I just want to test myself against the legendary red dragon. And then transformed into his dragon form. Seeing him transform into a dragon Asami widened her eyes and said, So that's why you were giving off a draconic smell. Asami summoned her gauntlet and said, Drake let's do it. The jam on the gauntlet glowed and Drake said, Let's do it partner. It has been a while since I will be fighting against a dragon who I can defeat. Asami chuckled and said, Yeah, fighting against Tannen and Tiamat were not very happy memories. She then smoked and both her and Drake shouted at the same time, Wash Dragon Balance Breaker. And the red draconic armor surrounded Asami. Seeing the two dragon ready to fight Ladora got serious as well and was prepared to cancel her armor at any moment he felt that they were going to lose. Ladora smirked and took his stance seeing which Asami took flight and the gem on her gauntlet started blinking. Boost 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 boost. Asami who was now boosted up rushed towards the dragon with her full speed while readying her fist. In an instant she came in front of the dragon and said, "So let's test how durable are you." And punched Ladora's face with all her might sending Ladora flying a few meters away. Ladora, who was punched was surprised on seeing the power that the young brown haired girl possessed and smiled in excitement. He then prepared to maintain his balance. But before he was able to dash don't think I'm stopping just there. Isami came in front of him and started throwing a barrage of punches at the dragon, who was barely able to block the serious blows. But he still took a great amount of damage. Ladora then swiped Isami with his tail which she was able to dodge without much problem. But then she felt a huge amount of energy coming towards her, and immediately got away from her spot, which was soon covered by a very strong fire attack. Isami looked at Ladora and said, typical dragon, huh? And started firing a lot of dragon shots towards Ladora, who fired his flames to counter the attacks. Isami appeared behind Ladora and said, so typical dragon weakness as well, and fired a very big dragon shot from behind the dragon. But before she was able to Ladora used his tail to attack Isami, which she was able to dodge once again. But unfortunately she missed her shot. Ladora flew up in the air and said, typical countermeasures as well. Seeing the dragon above them Isami mentally asked Drake, hey, shall I hold back a little lesser? The old man is getting cocky. Drake just nodded his head and said, let's do that, this is getting pointless. Not to mention, if the best thinks that what we are doing is not up to his mark, then we are sown for. Hearing that a chill passed on Isami's spine and she said, for our survival, DDIAIG do your job. The gem on the gauntlet glowed, and Drake said, on it boost 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 boost
were shocked and were not able to process what was happening. Isami, who didn't give a shit about them being shocked, immediately flew towards Labora, clamped her fists together, and smacked Labora down towards the ground. Isami looked at Labora's falling figure and said, Don't take this personally, old man, and raised her hand towards Labora's direction. A small blaster appeared over Isami's armor, and she fired a green colored energy blast towards the dragon, sending him crashing to the ground a bit faster. Mistita, who saw that, immediately placed a defensive spell on Labora to reduce a bit of his damage, and then looked at Asami and thought, She is dangerous. There is no way that we can deal with her. Sorry, Labora, but I'm doing this. And used his sacred gear to seal Asami's sacred gear, making the armor wrapped around Asami immediately disappear, only leaving behind the gauntlet. By having her armor vanish, all of a sudden Asami was shocked and asked Drake mentally, What happened? Drake, are you there? Yeah, I am here, don't panic. It looks like somebody sealed my abilities. Asami widened her eyes in surprise and thought, Hukal. But suddenly she realized something and looked towards the bishop and shouted, It is you, right? Mistita, who was taking deep breaths since sealing a longinus to a lot out of him, gave a pained smile and said, Rather than that, don't you have to worry about something else? Asami then said, About Wadash. But before she was able to finish her whole body was engulfed in the flames fired at her by Labora. Seeing the girl engulfed in flames Mistita sighed and said, That was a close one. Whatever, this is over at least. But all of a sudden both of them heard, Oh, but we are just getting started. And both the dragon and the mage got shocked and looked towards the fire which was being eaten by Asami. Labora seeing that closed his mouth and Asami ate the remainder of the games and wiped her mouth. Now, I have got a fire in my belly. And covered her fists in flames. Asami looked at the dragon and the mage duo and said, I thought that I could do this the less painful way. But looks like you want to feel the pain. So be it then. The fire on her fists intensified and Asami smoked and said, Let me show you how real flames feel like. And fired a huge fireball towards the two. Labora who felt dangerous intent coming from the fire, immediately got away. But Mistita, who was already exhausted because of sealing a long linus, was not able to move, and took the hit head on. Ah, IT's burning, IT's burning, Labora looked towards his partner in panic and shouted, Mistita, but was not able to help him as his instinct was telling him that the fire was dangerous for him. Isami then turned towards Labora and asked with an amused expression on her face, You can feel it, right? You can feel that this fire is dangerous, right? She then started moving towards Labora and asked, Hey, why don't we do the same what you did with me engulfing you in fire? Labora, who was feeling afraid of the approaching Asami, started moving back seeing which Asami got more amused and asked, Now now, aren't you a dragon? Don't get cold feet now. Show some courage. If you want I can warm you up. And fired a wave of her fire towards the dragon. Labora, who saw the fire coming towards him flew away, but then noticed that the fire was following him. No getting away this time, dragon Kun. And I creased the intensity of her flames making them hotter and wider. Labora, who saw that there was no way that he was going to dodge the fire, turned around and opened his mouth to intercept it with his own fire. Asami who saw that smoked and said, it's useless, and started putty G more power in her flames, which immediately broke through Labora's flames and hit the dragon. Agasami then flew above Labora and covered her fists with flames. She then started descending towards the dragon and started emitting fire through the soles of her feet to increase her speed. Once she got close to the dragon she hit him with her flaming fists repeatedly making the already injured dragon wince in pain. She then grabbed his TAIL the back one, and then ignited it on fire, making the dragon immediately widen his eyes in shock and rush around in panic. Seeing the huge dragon acting like that the audience had a complex feeling, as they were not able to decide whether to pity the dragon, or laugh at the display. After Asami was done enjoying the show of the dragon running around with his tail set ablaze on dragon slaying fire, she looked towards Mistida, who was pretending to be knocked out after the attack and said, Want me to give you a wake up call Bishop Kun? And pointed her hand towards Mistida gathering a fireball in it. Mistida who saw the fireball immediately flinched and fired a lot of spells towards Asami, who took it head on. She smirked and said, Seems like you forgot about something. Mistita looked at her with a confused expression on her face, which soon turned to that of worry, when he saw Asami raise her gauntlet, balance breaker, and once again her red armor was back on her. Asami looked at the dragon and then at Mistita and said, Let's finish this now, and rushed towards Mistita and grabbed him by the collar. Mistita who was confused by Asami's actions was thrown towards Labora, and the dragon who saw his partner coming towards him shouted, Mistita do something about this fire I cannot touch this. Mistita to raise his staff and cast a water spell on Labora's tail, extinguishing the fire and revealing a tail whose scales were destroyed where the fire affected it. Labora sighed in relief and caught Mistida who was coming towards him and asked, any idea what to do now? How about going back and rest? Both him and Labora got surprised by the voice, and looked up only to see Asami in her armor with two blasters over each arm. Asami who saw their surprised faces smoked and said, bye bye, and fired a very huge flamethrower through her arm blasters towards the duo. Serei Sama's bishop and rook retired. The winner of the is round is Asami Haidu of the Ria Sama's peerage. Asami got out of her armor and stretched her body and said, that felt nice, ain't it Drake? The gem on the gauntlet glowed and Drake said, indeed the feeling of dominating the battlefield is the best after all. Hearing that Asami had an amused expression on her face, and she said, hey, even better than dominating Albion on the bed. Drake immediately got pissed and shouted, that's the worst thing ever that could happen I am not be dominating him on the bed. Asami clapped her hands excitedly and said, 
Oh, so you finally accepted to let Albion be on the top and dominate you. Not happening either I will kill myself if I ever get into such a situation. Isami started laughing at Drake Refusion, and was then sent back to the underworld. After Isami got back the others congratulated her while on the other hand, Sereg sent his Rook Laboro and Mestita were dejected at their loss. Though Sereg was a bit excited as he now knew that Asami had some new tricks up her sleeve, and was itching to fight her. A few minutes later Riaz and Sereg were once again called back roll the dice. Both the participants rolled a 2, making it a total of 4. Both teams have 5 minutes to discuss their strategy. And once again both the kings came back to their peerage and were enclosed in the barrier. Riaz looked at her peerage and said, Since it is a 4 they can now only send out the last remaining bishop of theirs, and as for us, we can only send in either the knights or Gasper. So who is up for it? The two knights looked at each other to see whether the other one was willing to go. But out of nowhere, Gasper raised his hand and said, I, I would like to G go. The whole peerage was shocked by Gasper's answer and Riaz immediately asked, Asked, are you alright Gasper? Is something wrong with you? With a worried expression on her face, Gasper immediately shook his head and said, I am totally fine Akeno then asked, then why are you volunteering to go? You wouldn't do that sort of thing normally Gasper Khan. Kaneko nodded and said, Gasper is not like that. If you are not feeling well I can give you some of my sweets. And gave a chocolate bar to Gasper. Gasper looked at the chocolate in his hand and then back at Ria's with a pleading expression on his face and said, I am totally fine. All of them were once again surprised by his sudden yell. And Asami tried to calm him down by making him take deep breaths. Once Gasper was back to normal he looked at the others and said, I just want to show the others that I am a man as well. I want to show that I am not a coward. I want to prove that I can be strong as well and can change. So don't trap Duddy like that. He then looked at the others who were surprised by his answer and then said, Plus Tetsaya Senpai taught me a few moves, and told me to show the underworld what I am capable of. I want to stand up to his expectations. Please let me do this President Rias stared at Gasper for a while, and then gave a tired sigh and said, Just promise me that you will not be reckless and take care of yourself. Gasper looked at Riaz with a smile on his face and nodded his head and said, I promise that I will win this. After the five minutes were up Gasper and Koriana came forward making some specific people in the crowd, making an uproar on seeing Gasper was up for fighting. Both the bishops were then sent to the raiding game field. Koriana looked at Gasper and with a smile on her face said, I am Koriana, one of Sarah Sama's bishop, and you must be the famous cross-dresser Bishop Gasper, right? Gasper nodded and then bowed and said, and nice to meet you. Koriana chuckled and said, oh my, don't be so nervous boy, you will make me want to attack you. If you know what I mean. Immediately Gasper's whole face turned red and he said, WW what are you talking about? ETT that is very I indecent. Koriana bent a little, but making her breasts jiggle, making Gasper focus on them. Seeing that a mischievous smile appeared on her lips and she said, Aren't you looking so intently on something indecent right now? Gasper immediately looked away and said, NN no it's not like that Koriana then stood straight and crossed her hands, lifting up her breasts a bit, while placing her hand on her cheek and said, it's fine you know. How about you give up the match, and then I can teach you some indecent stuff later. I can assure you that you will not dislike it. And then walked towards Gasper and lifted his chin with her finger and asked, so, what do you say? Want to have some fun with Onison after the game? Gasper looked at Koriana with some tears at the corner of his eyes and said, I, I will not give up. I will win this match. And then transformed into multiple bats and started tackling her. Koriana who saw Gasper transform into Bats was a bit surprised, but immediately went into a defensive stance and said, So you are a damper, huh? Bats tried to hit her, but Koriana easily blocked and dodged the Bats and put some distance between the two of them. Gasper who saw Koriana away from her started to fly towards her, but Koriana immediately made a magic circle and started firing a lot of icicles towards the Bats. The Bats who were caught off guard by Koriana were hit by the icicles, but still a few of them managed to dodge them. Gasper then turned back to his human form and made a shield magic circle to block the incoming icicles. Koriana seeing him go on the defensive smiled and said, Don't think that the shield will last LONG tilde. You need know what happens when you don't follow the 1E Sen's order. And increase the speed of icicles. Gasper's shield started to crack down making him furrow his brows. He bit his lips and said, No other choice. His eyes then changed and turned totally red with a tiny of gold in them, and just as it changed the time stopped for Koriana and the icicles. Gasper then moved away from his spot and got behind Koriana, and let the time flow normally once again. Koriana who saw Gasper disappear in front of her eyes, widened her eyes in surprise, but soon jumped up in the air and fired the icicles behind her when she felt something was there. Gasper who was surprised by Koriana's actions was hit by the icicles, but soon he stopped time once again, and got away from her, and let the time flow once again. Koriana once again saw the damper disappear in front of her eyes, and then looked towards the direction where Gasper was. You seem to have some unusual power there, damper Kun. Instantaneous movement. No, I guess it is something related to teleportation or time control, since you don't make any movement while disappearing. Gasper, who was bleeding from multiple spots, looked at Koriana, and activated his sacred gear to stop time. Once the time was stopped he fired some blasts of demonic energy towards her. But just as the blasts were about to hit a barrier surrounded her. Being surprised by the sudden appearance of the barrier Gasper's concentration got broken and the time once again started moving for Koriana, who immediately started firing her blast towards Gasper. Gasper who took the blast head on, got engulfed in the explosion, but was able to form a protective shield around him time to prevent any serious damage. Koriana looked at the struggling Damper and said, What you will do now Damper Kun, your time stopping won't work, since I have already placed a barrier around me. 
which will block your attacks even if I am stopped. The result will be the same, so why not give up and go back? Gasper looked at Koryano and said, I am not going to put Tetsuya Senpai's name to shame. I will prove you that I am a man, that I can be strong, I will show you that I can win hearing his declaration. Koryana looked at him with an amused smile on her face and said, Then how about this, if you are able to beat me? I will go on a date with you. Attractive enough for an unmanly boy like you, right? But just as she said that Gasper's aura changed and he shouted, I am a man. He then took out a small piece of paper and said, Tetsuya Senpai, I am going to use this, I guess. And then stared at the paper and said, Self-hypnotism art, activate. And passed some of his demonic energy through the paper, which started to glow and release a blinding yellow light. Once the blinding light was released, the audience were confused thinking what was going to happen. Tetsuya who saw the glow, started to laugh loudly and said, Koreana is done for seeing him laughing. The others in the room looked at him with a weird expression on their faces, and Miyuki asked, What is that Anaya-sama? Do you know what is happening? Tetsuya looked at Miyuki and said, You know what Gasper's greatest weakness is. Miyuki thought for a while and then said, Is being a pussy-like mentality. Tetsuya gave a wry smile and said, Being afraid of many things. And if that attitude is taken off from him, then he is very powerful. So I tried to help him with that, but Gasper is Gasper, so there was no progress in it. Tetsuya then smoked and said, But that doesn't mean that we cannot forcefully change his personality, right? Kirumi widened her eyes and said, Hypnotism to seal off his attitude. Tetsuya nodded and said, Yup, but don't worry. It is temporary and don't have any bad side effects. Back in the raiding game field, the blinding light started to die down, and a Gasper whose hair was standing up and being covered in golden aura was now visible to everyone. Koreana looked at Gasper and said, Well, you look a bit more manly now. And then formed a magic circle and said, But that won't help you win. And fired her icicles once again. But in the next instant Gasper appeared behind her and kicked her with great force, though the barrier blocked it. But she was still thrown a few meters away. Koreana looked at Gasper with a shocked expression on her face, to which Gasper responded with a smile and said, Mutada. Koreana narrowed her eyes and once again started shooting out her icicles, seeing which Gasper just activated his sacred gear and dodged them easily. He smoked and then slowly started to fly towards Koreana, who kept on firing icicles and energy blasts at Gasper. Gasper kept his sacred gear activated and easily dodged the attacks and said, What happened? Can't seem to hit me now, I guess. Why don't we just stop and you retire before I hurt you? And stood in front of Koreana. Koreana, who now knew that her magic attacks were of no use, tried to punch him. But Gasper just moved his hand and blocked her fist with his palm and said, You don't have the power to hurt me, you know. Want to see how a real punch feels like? And used his other hand to coat it with reinforcement magic, which was taught to him by Tetsuya, and punched Koreana in the gut while shattering the barrier in the process. Koreana, who was punched in the gut, widened his eyes in shock while some saliva spilled out of her mouth and was blown away. But before her body could crash to the ground, Gasper used his sacred gear to stop her fall, and pointed his hand in her direction and said, It's over now. And charged a very strong and huge orb of demonic energy in his hand, and fired at her, and let the time flow normally once again. Koreana who saw the huge orb coming towards her, was shocked but couldn't do anything. Her body was still a bit numb from the punch earlier, and the orb was too close for her to fire any attack at it. She just sighed and thought, Looks like it's over for me. Forgive me Sarah Iksama. She looked at Gasper for one last time before the huge orb collided with her, and her body dissipated in light particles. Sarah Exama's bishop retired the winner of this round is Gassi HHH. Back in the raiding game field the golden aura around Gasper's body began to fade away, till none was left. Once the aura was gone, his hair came back to the original position, and Gasper fainted and fell on the ground. Participant Gasper fainted. That means this round ends in a tie. In the room where Tetsuya and the others were sitting Kirumi looked at Tetsuya and asked, no side effects. Huh? Tetsuya looked at her and said, you didn't hear me properly I guess. I told you that there were no bad side effects from this technique. Using this technique takes a lot of mental toll on the body. So once the effect vanishes, the body is very exhausted. This combined with all the damage that he took before transforming resulted in him fainting just after the technique was released. Also he cannot use it for a long time. Right now, 15 minutes is his limit. Hearing that all of them looked at him with a deadpan expression on their faces, seeing which Shitsaya said, What? It is a great technique for someone like Gasper. It takes out his innate abilities. He can even stop normal mid-ultimate class beings in this form. All of them thought for a while and then nodded their heads, thinking that it was indeed a good technique, but only those who have a shy personality along with great innate abilities, could use it for their benefit. Back to the game. Riaz and Kiba rushed to where Gaspar appeared and checked whether he was fine or not. Once they were sure that nothing was wrong with him, they sighed and Kiba took Gaspar back to their seats, while Riaz walked forward to roll the dice. Both Sereg and Riaz got on the platforms and took the dice in their hands and rolled them back in the bowl. Participant Sereg Sama rolled a 6, and Participant Riaz Sama rolled a 3, making it a total of 9. Both teams are given 5 minutes to discuss the strategy. Both Riaz and Sereg then got back to their peerages, and then were enclosed inside the barrier. Riaz looked at the sleeping Gaspar for a while and then said, Since it is a 9 they will most probably send their queen. What do you think we should do? We have all of us left except for our bishop, after all. Akeno raised her hand and said, I should be going then, a battle between the queens should be exciting don't you think? Isami looked at Akeno and said, don't take this so lightly senpai. Kusha-sen is strong. Hearing that all of them raised their brows and looked at Asami. Akeno then asks, how can you say that? 
Have you seen her fight before? Asami shook her head and said, I have never seen her fight, but Tetsuya's very words about her were, Kusha is probably under the top 5 strongest youth devils I have met. And just for instance, Sereig is at rank 1 of his list while the current me is ranked 2. All of them remained silent for a while till suddenly Rias looked at Akeno and asked, So what do you want to do? Akeno looked at Rias for a while, and then with a smile on her face said, I want to see how one of the strongest in Tetsuya's list is. I will go for the next round. Rias nodded and said, fine then. Go, the time's up. And immediately the barrier around them disappeared, and both the queens came forward and were teleported to the game field. Once both of them were in the field, Akeno bowed a bit and said, Akeno Himajima, Rias queen. Kusha bowed as well and said, Kusha Abaddon, Serei Sama's queen. Akeno smiled and said, heard that Tetsuya think very highly of you. Kusha smiled and said, well, who knows want to find it out firsthand. Akeno took out her wings and said, with pleasure, I really am in a mood to hear some screams, right now, and took flight. Kusha took out her wings as well and got in the air and said, so you are Sodomus, it's just that Tetsuya told me about. Seems you are capable of giving some shocks. Akeno chuckled and said, ara ara. I really like to see the shocked look on others' faces. And soon holy lighting was clattered in her hand. Seeing the lightning and feeling the holy element in it, Kusha smoked and thought, this will be over in an instant. In the room where Tetsuya and the others were sitting, the whole of Tetsuya's team, except for Ross, was sighed and said at the same time, Akeno is going to lose. Hearing which both the mothers were surprised and looked at Tetsuya's group. Seeing them looking in their direction, Tetsuya said, plus you both know what Kusha's ability is, right? To which both the mothers nodded. Seeing them nodding, Vold said, and Akeno was able to use holy lightning just as her father. So just think what will happen when the said holy lightning will hit Akeno herself. Even though she is a part fallen, she is a half devil as well. And holy and devil don't go hand in hand. Asia nodded and said, in going by her sadistic tendencies, she would be falling down in. Karen looked towards the screen and with a sigh said, dash right about this instant, and saw Akeno dissipating in light particles. Participant Rhea's queen retired the winner of this match as Kusha Abaddon of Sarai Exama's peerage. After the match was over, Kusha came back to her peerage, and was complimented by her teammates. On the other hand, the Gremory group were worried for Akeno, and immediately asked someone to send her to the medical ward. Rhea's and Sarai had once again were back on the platform to roll the dice, and just like before rolled it in the bowl. Once the dice stopped rolling, e both the participants rolled a 6 that means a total of 12. A chance for Sarai Exama to come for the fight himself. Both the teams have 5 minutes to discuss. Both the kings got back to their peerages and were then enclosed in the barrier. The whole peerage was silent until suddenly Asami raised her hand and said, I will go, there is a better chance for me to handle him. Kiba looked at her and said, No, Asami you stay back let us take care of him. You told it yourself just now. Sarai Xen is stronger than you. Not to mention Tetsuya is guaranteeing about it. Let us go and exhaust him a bit. Hearing which Kaneko and Zenobia nodded their heads. Kaneko took out her gloves and wore them and said, You wait senpai, we will try to weaken him a bit. And if we got lucky we'll try to form a weakness for you to take advantage of. Asami looked at Kaneko who was now in her Nekishu mode and sighed, Don't force yourself. If Tetsuya says that he is strong. Then that means that he was holding back during my earlier fight with him. All three of them nodded, and then cams forward once the five minutes were up, and were teleported to the raiding game field, along with Sereg. Sereg looked at his opponents and said two knights and one rook, so the red dragon empress didn't came out. Huh? Kiba formed his holy devil sword and said, Don't worry about her, she will have her moment later for now you have to deal with us. Sereg looked at Kiba and soon a smirk appeared on his face and said, That's true as well. Let's save the dessert for the last. He then raised his fists, and then two glowing marks appeared on them. These are the weight seals that Tetsuya gave me for training, much more potent than anything in the underworld. I shall remove them now. And then two of the glowing marks vanished from his arms, and a strong gist was released from his body, making the surrounding surface crack up a bit. Sereig smiled seeing the extent of his restrictions and then said, Now let us begin. I give you all the first move. Hearing that the three of them felt a bit insulted, but knowing that the guy in front of them was on a whole another level, immediately took action and got serious. Kiba gripped his sword tightly and said, Zenobia start charging. Kaneko, intercept him with me. Both the girls nodded their heads, and Zenobia immediately raised her sword and started charging the energy unit, while Kaneko clenched her fist tightly and followed after Kiba, who was already way ahead of her. Kiba started slashing towards Sereg, who simply dodged the slashes without much difficulty and said, You certainly are fast compared to a normal night dash, and then clenched his fist and said, but not as fast as me. And punched Kiba sending him flying and said, and not even that durable. And saw Kiba's body dissipating in white light. He then moved his hand and blocked an incoming fist towards him and said, you certainly packed quite a punch young Nekashu. Kaneko looked at Sereg with narrowed eyes and said, you as well. You were even able to defeat Senpai in one hit even though he is quite durable now. Sereg smiled and said, I have known Tetsuya for quite a long time, meaning I have quite a lot of experience fighting with him and his group. You can't slack off if you want to catch up to those monsters. He then punched Kaneko as well who intercepted it with her own punch. Seeing that Sereg was a bit surprised to which Kaneko said, that punch was nothing compared to Shizuka-san's punch. Sarei ignored and said, like hell I can be at that level yet. But your punches feel heavy as well. Let's see who can punch better. And both Sereig and Kaneko started punching at each other, blocking each blow coming at them. A slash N. Yeah, both of them are doing the Oro Oro Muda Muda scene. 
Kaneko and Sereg kept on punching each other, but slowly and slowly, Kaneko's fist began to get numb under the force of Sereg's punches. Seeing the frown on her face, Zenobia, who was still charging the sword, began to get worried. But suddenly, out of nowhere, Kiba appeared and said, Keep focusing. I will handle him. And thanks for the sword. And rushed towards Sereg with his holy devil sword, and an Excalibur fragment which helped him in faking his defeat. Sereg, who noticed Kiba coming towards him, stopped holding back against Kaneko and punched her a bit harder. But Kaneko took advantage of him focusing on Kiba for a bit and transformed into a white cat, and got below him only to transform back and give him a punch in the face, sending him flying up in the air. She looked at Kiba and said, Now Senpai Kiba smoked as well, and formed as many of his glory dragon troopers, as he was capable of with each holding a holy devil sword and said, Thanks Kaneko. And all the troopers charged energy to the swords and fired a beam towards Sereg, while Kiba charged energy in both the Excalibur fragment, and his own holy devil sword, and fired a beam at him. There is no point in fighting him in close quarters. We have tried arranged attacks. Kaneko as well fired a beam made up of Senjutsu at Sereg, which combined with the rest of the attacks, forming a huge beam. Kiba then looked at Zenobia and shouted, Now Zenobia Zenobia clenched her teeth and sword, and a huge beam formed over the sword. She then looked towards Sereg and the beam approaching him and said, Take this extra handle, and fired the stored up energy towards the beam heading towards Sereg, amplifying the power of the attack. Sereg, who saw the multicolored beam heading towards him, took his wings out and got even higher at a very fast speed and said, let me show you what a true attack looks like. A move which Tetsuya taught to a failure like me. He then took a stance and brought both his hands close to each other, and a blue glow appeared in his hands. Kami Hami Sereig then smirked and shouted, Huh? And fired the blue energy wave towards the incoming attack, breaking through it almost instantly, and now heading towards the three devils. The three devils from the Gremory period who saw the huge blue wave coming towards them panicked and Kaneko and Kiba asked, immediately formed a barrier around them. Sereg looked at the barriers and said, that would not help, and the beam crashed to the barriers and shattered them immediately on contact, and hit the three devils retiring them as a result while also destroying a major part of the land. Either winner of this round is Sereg Sama. After Sereg returned back from the he field he looked towards Ria's peerage. And after making sure that his opponents were not fatally injured, he got back to his peerage. Ria's and Asami who were now the only ones left from their group, carried the other three injured members back, and asked someone to take them to the medical wards. Ria's and Asami looked at Sereg with a serious look in their eyes, and then Ria's said, time to roll the dice once again. And just as she said that both the kings were called by the announcer, Ria's and Sereg got on top of the platform and rolled the dice in the bowl once again. Participant Sereg Sama rolled a 6, and participant Ria's Sama rolled a 3, making it a total of 9. Both the teams have got 5 minutes to discuss. Both Riaz and Sereg got back and were once again enclosed in the barrier. Asami looked at Riaz and asked, So what do you plan to do? Riaz looked at Asami with a serious look in her eyes and said, I will go. I am quite pissed right now and want to blow off some steam. Asami widened her eyes in surprise and asked, Are you sure? If you are defeated then we will lose. Ria smoked and said, That is to say if I will be defeated, right. Sereg himself won't be coming which leaves us with either the pawn or the queen. And since he has not yet sent out his pawn in any of the games till now, then that means he is his trump card of sorts. And I have confidence that I can deal with the queen. Isami stared at Ria's for a while and then said, Are you really confident? Ria stared back at Isami and said, I am. Both continued to stare at each other for a while which finally ended with Asami sighing and saying, Do whatever you want. You are the king of the peerage anyway. Ria smiled and said, Then I should be going my cute and adorable pawn. And got off from her seat, and immediately the barrier around them disappeared. Ria's and Kusha then came forward with the audience surprised seeing Ria's coming herself instead of Asami. Looks like Ria Sama will be participating in this match herself then without further ado. Let us begin. And both of them were teleported to the raiding game field. Kusha looked at Ria's and with a bow said, Greeting to you Lady Ria's. Ria's nodded as well and said, Greetings to you as well, Kusha Abaddon. Let's not waste our time and let us begin. Oh, a warning just before we begin. If you are willing to retire, just do it now. I am not feeling very well, and am in a mood to blow off some steam, so I might not be able to hold back. Kusha smirked and said, we will see who is going to retire, and got ready to prepare a hole and redirect the attack on her. Kusha looked at Ria's and thought, she has not got much control over her demonic power, and fires beams at her opponents. It would be easy to take on with hold WH. What the hell is this? All of a sudden the ground started to crack up, and the pressure around Ria's began to rise. Her hair started to flow violently with her usual reddish-black aura surrounding her. She looked at Kusha with a smirk and said, I gave you time don't complain, later. Suddenly a huge magic circle appeared on the ground, with the symbol of Gremory inscribed on it. And a huge wave of power of destructing, was fired up in the sky like a tower which engulfed most of the raiding game field, and Kusha in it. A few moments later the Tower of Power of Destruction disappear along with the Magic Circle, and only a huge crater of the size of the Magic Circle from before was left behind. Seeing the crater in the ground Ria's chuckled and said, Looks like I let loose a bit too much dot asterisk -e -e asterisk. The whole audience as well as the announcer was silent even the room where Tetsuya and the others were sitting was totally quiet. The whole group just stared blankly at the screen except for Venelana 
who had a proud smirk on her face, and looked at the speechless expression on the faces of other with amusement. Titsaya remained silent, seeing the display of Rhea's power and thought, says it just really did a bit too much but who am I saying that? I do the same thing as well. Soon a sigh escaped from Titsaya's mouth, and he muttered, looks like I owe her a favor. Now, the stadium remained silent for a while when suddenly out of nowhere someone shouted, yeah, that's my Rhea Tan. Show them the power you have gained from the training and love of Oni Chan. The whole stadium snapped out of trance, because of that someone's shout, and the announcer shouted. The winner of this round is Rhea's Sama Rhea's, who was still in what was left of the field, had an intense blush on her face, and thought, Oh, oh Oni Sama I hate you just why did you had to shout like that? Fine then, I will tell Grafia to be stricter with him, and was then teleported back to the underworld. Once she was back she could hear the audience cheering for her making her happy and thought, It is my first step to be recognized as Rhea's, and not a Gremory. She then looked towards Asami who had a huge smile on her face, and showing her a thumbs up, Rhea smiled at Asami's action, and gave a thumbs up in return as well. Suddenly she heard a voice in her head, Good job, I was certainly impressed by you. Just don't lose focus and try to win. Ah, and don't get overconfident and mess the whole thing. Rhea's widened her eyes in surprise and thought, W8 Tetsaya, yeah, it's me. Bye. Good luck with the final match. Before Rhea's could say something Tetsaya cut the connection with her making the redhead sigh in disappointment. She walked back to his seat and Asami asked, what happened? Rhea's looked at Asami and asked, when this may is over tell me about Tetsaya's like and dislikes. Asami didn't understand what actually happened with her king, and just nodded her head. After a few minutes of rest the announcer once again appeared and said, now let's head towards the next match. Participants, please dash. But before he could finish Sereg stood up and said, may I request for a match with the remaining members of the peerage? It wouldn't be any fun now, since only the high value players are left. And Dash he then looked at Rias and Asami and said, I really want to see how much power these two have. The announcer then relayed the information to the judges, who after discussing among themselves told their answer to the announcer. The judges have no problem with Sarai Aksama's proposal. Does Rhea Sama agree to this? Rias looked at Asami who looked back at her and said, We don't know how strong his pawn is. Rias then replied, But the fact that we cannot beat him one-on-one -on -one is true as well. We might have a better chance if we work together, and we also don't know anything about his pawn, so it is better to cover each other's back. Asami just sighed and said, There are way too many assumptions and variables in this match. It is really pissing me off Drake what do you think we should do? The gauntlet appeared on her arm, and Drake said, just agree with it, even if there are variables in this fight. It is still better than to fight him head on one on one, as the result of that match is fixed, which is your total loss. Isami just sighed and nodded her head, seeing which Rias looked at the announcer, and nodded her head as well. The announcer nodded his head with an excited expression on his face and said, Gremory team has accepted FHE Bell team's condition. This means IT will be the last match of the game. Isami took a deep breath and said, Drake president, let's do this. Rias nodded her head and said, yeah, let's give our best. Both the teams were then transported to the raiding game field and Sereg stared at Asami who stared back at him. President take care of the pawn, I have some unsettled score with him. Rias looked at Asami and asked, and what about a plan to deal with him together? Asami looked at her and asked, do you really think that he is in the mood for that? He clearly wants to know how much was I holding back in our spa earlier. Asami looked at Sereg and saw the excited expression on his face while looking at Asami. She sighed and said, fine, I will try to take down the pawn as soon as I can, so that I can assist you in the battle. Asami nodded and said, that will help. Let's do this Drake. The gem on the gauntlet glowed and Drake yelled, Welsh dragon, balance breaker. Sereg came forward as well while cracking his knuckles and said, so shall we continue where we left out earlier Red Dragon Empress? Asami took her stance and said, and I hope that you are not going to hold back this time. Sereg took his stance and said, that depends on whether you can make me D-dash. Before he could finish Asami rushed towards him and tried to punch him, but he intercepted it with his own punch. You should let someone finish when they are speaking to you. Asami snorted and covered her fists in flames, and tried to make him back off by burning his hand. But Sereg immediately covered his hand with Taki, preventing any burns that could happen. So this is the flame which Obora was talking about. They are very hot indeed, probably hotter than the flames of an average phoenix. He covered his other fist with Taki as well and said, but that isn't going to stop me. And punched at Asami who immediately used her leg to strike Sereg's leg, and making him stumble a bit, which changed the trajectory of the punch, making making it miss Asami. Asami didn't wasn't any time, and immediately elbowed him which Sereg blocked with his hands, but still there was a small crater formed on the ground. Sereg then pushed Asami back and said, you really were holding back a lot the last time. Asami regained her balance and said, so are you. Your reflexes are on a whole another level now. Both of them once again got in their stances, and Asami said, so shall we take this up a notch, and started releasing her aura. Sereg smoked and started releasing his aura as well and said, why not? But suddenly both of them heard a loud roar and turned around to see what happened, and noticed Sereg's pawn turning into a giant golden lion. Asami looked at the lion and asked, what the hell is he? Sereg looked at Asami and said, that's Regulus, and started to explain to her about Regal's backstory. Once he was done Asami looked at Rias and asked, President, want me to help? Rias just made some magic circles in her hand and said, no need to worry, I can handle him. 
You are not the only one who was training under someone especially strong. And fired waves made up of her power of destruction towards Regulus, who started dodging them. But seeing him dodge, Rhea smirked and moved her hand. And at the same instant, the POD wave stared following the giant lion. Seeing that Regulus started to run and jump around in miscellaneous directions, but the waves still followed him. Rias took advantage of him being focused on the waves, and started placing various medium-sized magic circles on the ground, which fired a pillar made up of P.O.D. whenever Regulus gets near them. Both Sereg and Asami looked at the cat who was running away for a while me Asami asked, just what the hell happened to President when we were not looking after her? In the room where Tetsaya and his team were sitting the whole Tetsaya group looked at Venelana and asked, who the hell trained her to be this proficient in her demonic energy manipulation? I cannot imagine Sezich is getting strict with her to this extent in training. Venelana chuckled and said, that is the result of mine and Grafia's training. After all we cannot let Sezich is in charge of her training all the time, he has a lot of duties. We made sure to make her to be Atlas as proficient as low ultimate class devils during the warring periods. No leniency showed. Grafia even spanked her whenever she whined or made a blunder. You should have seen her butt at that time. It was as red as her hair. Fu 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 fu. All of them except for Tetsaya just gulped their saliva and thought at the same time. At least Tetsaya slash Tetsaya san slash on Isama don't spank us during training. All of them looked back at the screen and saw something which made all of them immediately become serious. Her breathing is getting erratic. She is losing her stamina and demonic energy at a very high rate. Venelana, Roswis and Misla looked at the children and he asked, you all can tell that just from that screen. All of them just nodded and said, looks like her she used too much fuel in that blast against Kusha. Back in the raiding game field, Rias had some sweat running down her forehead and thought, if this continues, then I will lose. Let's get on the close quarters and slammed her hands in the ground, and immediately all the magic circles that she had placed on the ground fired with P.O.D. towards Regulus, who immediately braced himself for the attack, as there was no way for him to dodge them. Regulus charged up his or own waited for the blast to get near him, and fired an area energy burst around him, which clashed against the P.O.D. and negated it. He sighed in relief and thought, the young girl from the Gremory family have grown a lot, and I am not talking about her breasts. Suddenly he felt something approaching him from behind and jumped away. In the same instant he jumped away loud noise was heard, and a lot of cracks appeared on the floor. When the dust cleared the figure was revealed to everyone with her hands covered in P.O.D. and clenched into fists. She looked at Regulus and said, It is not nice of you to get away from a lady who is trying to approach you, Regulusan. Seeing her like that Regulus and Tetsaya's group fought at the same time. What the hell did that Siscon did with her? Meanwhile the said Siscon. Yeah Rhea Tan kicked that lion's ass show her the power of love between US Oni Chan is cheering for you with all he had Tetsaya and his group who saw Rhea's hands covered in P.O.D. were surprised and Tetsaya immediately contacted Serzich's through his mental link. I, Serzich's what the hell did you train her with? That right there is something out of your super mode Serzich's, who heard the sudden shouting in his head was a big shocked, but soon calmed down, once he recognized the voice. Tetsaya. Huh? Nah, it's not like my super mode. In my super mode the P.O.D. covers my body and is released without my control. But what Rhea Tan is doing is totally different. Her P.O.D. is in her control, as she is only making a thin layer out of it over her arms so as to increase the power of her blows. Furthermore she can only do it on her two limbs right now, so either both her arms or both her legs or an arm and a leg. And that too must be taking way too much concentration. But I can say that its concept is based on my super mode. After all it is Oni Chan WHO taught Rhea Tan that move. Now when she win her match she will come to her Aniachan and will confess her feely dash. Before the 5GS escalated Tetsaya cut the connection with Serzich's, and looked back at the game and thought, that's a relief there. For a moment there I was shocked seeing her able to do something Serzich's do in his super mode. He focused on Rias who was fending off Regulus's attacks and thought, it is more of a strengthening technique using POD, rather than his super mode. In the raiding game field, Rias and Regulus were constantly attacking and blocking each other trying to overpower one another. And even though Regulus had the advantage in terms of power, Rias was able to overcome it, by making diversions using her POD which was annoying Regulus a lot, since it was also capable to follow him if he dodged it. Regulus as well was firing energy blasts at Rias, who was easily able to destroy them using her POD, and though he was able to land some successive blows on Rias, it was still not enough to defeat her. Seeing that Rias was able to hold herself pretty well, Asami focused back on her fight and said, let's continue DDIRG. Boost 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 she then charged towards Sereg who got in a defensive stance and blocked her onslaught of punches and kicks while also counter-attacking her which were blocked by her as well. That's IT Red Dragon show me what have you got oh. I will show you. Change Welsh Draconic Rook change solid impact to Sami's armor turned to a heavy one and she punched towards Sereg, sending him flying despite him blocking the blow. What happened Sereg and change Welsh Sonic Boost Knight? Asami got in front of Sereg in just an instant and changed back to her rook form and punched him in the gut making him cough out a bit of blood on crashing with the ground. Asami who's still in the air looked at Sereg and said change Welsh Blaster Bishop change Fang Blaster and a huge cannon appeared on her back. Isami bent her body a bit, aiming the cannon at Sereg and said, not yet, and formed two more blasters on top of each of her hands and pointed them at Sereg. Boost 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 bo
and fired a strong greenish blast from her back cannon, while firing concentrated flame blasts with her hand cannon. All three beams combined and rushed towards Sereg, seeing which Asami smoked behind her helmet and said, Not yet. Dreg do it. As you wish transfer. And added all the boosted power to her blast, making it cover more than half of the field. Seeing the blast coming down both Rias and Regulus panicked, and Regulus immediately rushed towards Sereg. Sereg Sama Rias looked at the fleeing lion and got in the sky as well and said, Didn't you went a bit overboard? Asami looked at Rias and said, Got a bit excited there. But all of a sudden a huge eruption of golden energy occurred making both the audience and the two devils in the sky, curious about it. But their curiousness was soon fulfilled when Sereg emerged out of the blast wearing a golden armor while looking at Asami, with an excited smoke on his face. That was a good attack red dragon. I can still feel my body being B-U-I and T in that intense heat of deep power Asami. And Rias looked at Sereg with a shocked expression on their faces, and said at the same time, How much are you still holding back you bastard? Hearing the two girls yell at him surprised Sereg. But soon he started laughing and said, Sorry sorry, I wasn't going to use this. But that blast made me excited. So now Dash he became serious and said, Behold the power of the Lion King Nemia's balance breaker. Regulus Ray Leather Rex, but contrary to his expectations of the girls being shocked, he felt a lot of killing intent aimed at him, and he immediately started sweating. He looked at Asami who was releasing immense amount of horror and killing intent, and gulped his saliva and started sweating. Asami looked at Sereg and said, Oi oi oi, you mean to say that you were not going to fight me at full power? You wanted to mock me. You are pitying me. Huh? Sereg immediately raised his hands in denial and said, No no, my intentions were not to look down on you. And I was not pitying you as well. It's due dash before he could finish Asami pointed her finger at him and said, That doesn't matter here you bastard what would have you done if you got caught up in that attack earlier before. That lion could have come to save your ass. If I defeated you when you were not at your strongest at Sire, and the other especially that bitch Tiamat ailed, not have been satisfied, and I would have been taught a dash train to death do you even know what you were going to do? And started taking deep breaths while she slumped her shoulders. Rias then started to caress her back and tried to calm her down. Sereg blinked in surprise, but because of all the killing intent that was aimed at him, he bowed his head and said, I don't what I did wrong, but I still apologize for not fighting you at my strongest. He then stood straight and said, now then let's show you my strongest. And soon a huge amount of aura started to build up around him, making his armor glow even brighter. Seeing that Asami glared at him and said, I will make sure that you pay for not going all out earlier. And a huge amount of aura started to build up around her as well, making her armor glow as well. The gem on her gauntlet kept blinking as continuous shouts of Drake yelling boost were heard by everyone. Seeing the two of them powering up Rias looked at the both of them with a dumbfounded look on her face and thought, these two are total monsters. There is no way that I could compete with them even if I had my demonic energy filled to the brim right now. Just what the hell are they planning to do? Rias got away from the two of them and immediately made a layer of barriers around herself to not get caught in the fight of these two monsters. She could not believe that the lion who was struggling against her earlier stored this amount of power in its balance breaker. Once the two of them were powered up to the maximum they looked at each other for a while. The whole arena was silent as the audience were curious about what was going to happen between the two Lonias wielders and were looking intently at the scene. Rias as well got in a defensive stance and covered herself with her POD reinforcement in the hands. Both of them looked at each other for a bit longer until suddenly both vanished from their spots. And in the next instant were clashing against each other, with Ismai being in her rook mode. Sereg had an excited smile on his face and said, Your power is really on a different level now good good show me. What else are you capable of red dragon? Isami who was still exchanging kicks and punches with Sereg, covered her fists and legs with flames, and increased the speed of her moves. By using her flames as thrusters which made occasional punches and kicks, hit the golden armored devil. Don't worry I really want to put you to sleep right now worry whether you will be able to keep up or not, Drake. The gem glowed and said, what you are already at maximum. Isami smirked and said, overload me. Are you insane? Are you going to do IT? Or I go juggernaut Drake fell silent at her response and sighed, you crazy brat, don't regret it later. Boost. And immediately blood spilled out of her mouth. But still a huge grin was on her face. And now for the grand finale. Let's fire up. And her whole body was now covered in flames. She then used those flames to reinforce her body, making her able to handle her boost, though her body started to heat up very quickly. The speed of her attacks started increasing along with the power behind the punches, which were now very hot as well. Sereg now was on total defensive, as he could not predict where Asami will hit next. Her speed and power were now at a totally different level as well. He glared at Asami and thought, how the hell is this happening? Her punches right now are feeling as heavy as Asia Sen's normal punches. What the hell did she do to gain this strength? Ha 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 can you feel IT bastard? This is the frustration of a high school girl WHO is being tossed around by a dragon king at a daily basis stomped under the feet of a dragon bath in the flames of a dragon, and holding on from being chewed by a dragon as a training for increasing strength. Can you feel IT? Not to mention Asia's Fist of Love sessions. Can you feel the frustration ha? Huh? Can you feel IT? Tell me bastard. And punched him with all her might making him immediately crash to the ground, with his armor mostly melted from the heat of Asami's punches. Asami raised her fists in the air and shouted, Give me a break from that F-U-C-K-I asterisk G training regime for a while you dragon hag. Tetsaya and the others who were looked at Asami and the whole group said at the same time, she finally lost it. Tetsaya looked at Asami for a while and said, Fine then, I will look over her for a while for her to become rational again. And Asia no fist of love sessions from now on. Asia looked at Tetsaya and said, Oh, and gave a pout. 
Back in the raiding game field, Ria's approached Asami whose armor was now giving off a lot of steam and said, Asami you alright? All of a sudden her armor disappeared, and an Asami completely drenched in sweat appeared and said, I'm fine, just a bit hot. The gauntlet appeared on her hand, and Drake shouted at her, you idiot what the hell were you thinking? Your body was going to explode fucking explode Asami smiled wryly and looked at her gauntlet, but then they heard an announcement. Serey Exama's born retires. All of them looked down and saw the golden lion dissipating in white light. Sereig, whose body was now filled with bruises and burns, looked at Regulus and said, Thank you for saving me there. Regulus smiled and said, Don't mention it my lord. And then disappeared. Sereig sighed and looked back at Asami, and used his phoenix tears to heal back his injuries and said, Let's get this over with. Asami got ready as well and said, Oh yay dash. But suddenly her whole body felt a huge amount of pain, and she said, Shit, not now. Riaz looked at Asami with a worried look on her face and said, here Asami used the Phoenix Tears. Asami shook her head with difficulty and said, No use President, I don't have that many injuries. It is the side effect of overheating my body, Phoenix Tears are of no use. Hold him for a while, I will be back up soon. Riaz nodded as she saw the falling body of her pawn, and then turned to look back at her cousin and said, Let's have a first fight in a while, Sereg. Sereg looked at Riaz and said, Riaz, huh? I am really surprised by the growth that you showed in this match. Your power is certainly great. He then turned serious as a layer of tacky appeared around his body, and he said, but that still is not enough to defeat me, and don't think that I am going to pull back my punches, since you are my cousin. Rias turned serious as well as she covered her arms with her POD, and took said, looks like it is going to get a bit rough. Sereg then took out his wings, and started moving towards Rias with great speed, seeing which Rias immediately made a magic circle, and fired multiple orbs of POD towards Sereg. Seeing the orbs heading towards him, Sereg crossed his arms in a defensive manner, and started deflecting the orbs coming at him. Don't waste your energy Rias, these types of attacks are of no use against me, not to mention your aim is not that good. But Rias didn't say anything and kept on firing the orbs at him, while also flying away from him, and dodging the blows whenever he got near him. Sereg stopped following her and said, Seems like you are in for a cat and mouse chase. Let's get this game over within an instant. He then took a stance and brought his hands together. Car blue glow then appeared in his hands as he brought the hands near his waist. Me seeing what he was going to do Rhea stopped and stood still in the air, and formed a magic circle in front of her and said, You know Sereg my aim is not that bad. And all of a sudden the orbs which were deflected or missed by Sereg, turned into magic circles, and all of them fired a ray made up of POD towards Sereg. Sereg seeing the rays coming at him stopped charging his attack, and was about to move away from there. But all of a sudden all the beams changed their course, and started to revolve around Sereg in the shape of a sphere, trapping him inside the sphere. Riaz looked at Sereg and said, you cannot escape this Sereg, not without suffering with enough injuries, and smirked. Seeing her smoke, Sereg smirked as well and said, You really are in a mood to surprise everyone, aren't you? Riaz narrowed her eyes and sent the magic circle that she formed earlier towards Sereg's direction. The circle divided into two smaller circles, and one of them got above the sphere and the other below the sphere. Bolts made of POD started to come out of the sphere, and soon a strong beam made up of POD fired at Sereg. Sereg who saw the beam tightened his muscles, and in a thick layer made of both demonic energy and tacky surrounded him. Once he was able to the strongest layer he possibly could at that moment, he rushed towards the wall of the sphere, and in the next instant, a huge explosion occurred. Rias widened her eyes in shock and shouted, Are you mad do you want to die or what soon the smoke cleared? And Sereg with one of his arm totally bruised and covered in blood appeared. There were bruises all over his body as well, but none were as serious as his arm. He looked at Rias and said, I am not mad I just have confidence in my strength. Your whole arm is totally damaged. Sereg looked at his damaged arm and said, Don't worry, I still have my other one to win the fight. Rias narrowed her eyes and said, You are saying as if you are going to win. Sereg smoked and said, It's because Dashi then disappeared from his spot and appeared behind Rias, with his body covered in tacky and said, I am going to win. And used his non-injured arm to punch Rias who blocked it with her POD covered arms in the last instant, and was blown away by the force of the punch. Sereg once again rushed at her seeing which Rias fired a powerful blast of her POD at Sereg, trying to slow him down as well as increasing her own speed with the recoil. But to her surprise Sereg just came out of the attack using his arm and said, this body is tough enough to not be affected by that power, and rushed towards her. Riaz immediately balanced her body and dodged the punch heading her way, and tried to attack him with her own punch. But Sereg used his leg to block her attack, and used the other one to kick her in the gut, sending her crashing in the ground. Blood spilled out of her mouth as Sereg's kick made a contact with her, but Riaz didn't black out, and used her demonic power to form a barrier to protect and slow down her fall. Sereg looked at his cousin and said, this ends here, Riaz, and used his demonic energy to form an orb in his hand and fired it at Riaz. But before the orb could make contact a red blade slashed through the orb destroying it in the process. Isami who had her Ascalon out, looked at Sereg and asked, Miss me Sereg-san. Sereg looked at Asami and said, Red Dragon Empress, so you were still in the game huh? But what happened to your armor? Asami scratched her cheek in embarrassment and said, Looks like overloading and overheating myself at the same time was not a good idea. My body can't take the strain of the balance breaker right now. She then turned serious and asked, but that doesn't mean that I am out of the game yet. She looked back at Riaz and asked, You still alive, President? Riaz looked at Asami with a pained look on her face and said, Shut up, don't kill me just yet. And got up as Asami offered her hand for her to stand up. 
Riaz looked at Sereg and asked, so any plans Asami? Asami shook her head and said, none, just going with old hacking and slashing. My body is not in a good condition right now. Riaz sighed and said, watch my back and I will watch yours. You ladies should know that a battlefield is not a place for idle chatter. Both of them looked at Sereg, and Asami said, give me cover, and took her wings out and flew towards Sereg. Riaz also started firing small attacks at Sereg in order to distract him. Sereg, who saw Asami coming towards him, also rushed towards her and punched her, to which Asami responded with blocking the punch with her gauntlet. After blocking it, she took the sword out out of her sacred gear, and used it with her other arm to slash at Sereg. Sereg being Sereg took the attack head on, but immediately in the next instant a deep frown appeared on his face, and he looked at the sword. Seeing his expression Asami smoked and said, what happened? Got so excited for the battle that you failed to notice that it is a holy sword. She then pushed him back with her gauntlet and fired a dragon shot at him, which sent him a few meters away. Asami didn't waste any time as she saw Sereg's movement slowing down because of the fatigue and the wound from the holy sword. She used her sacred gear and stacked up all the 10 second boosts that she could before she got on defense from Sereg's onslaught of punches. President a little help here. Riaz immediately used the phoenix tears to heal the few broken bones caused by by Sereg's earlier attacks, and rushed to aid Asami. My demonic power is just about to get depleted, we have to finish it quickly. She looked at Asami blocking Sereg's attacks, while also grazing him with her sword, which caused Sereg to flinch a bit in pain. Her eyes widened in realization and she thought, that's it. She covered her one arm in twice the amount of POD she used earlier and punched towards Sereg. Sereg seeing the approaching punch block her with his injured arm which only deepened the frown on his face. Riaz, who attacked with stop smirked and transferred her POD in her other arm, and snatched the sword from Asami's arm, making Asami surprised by her action. The moment she held the sword her arm was engulfed in a huge amount of pain, which was accompanied with a burning sensation. She gritted her teeth and covered the blade of the sword with the remaining of her POD, and slashed Sereg's chest with it. Blood splattered out of Sereg's chest as he also spilled a lot of blood from his mouth. He looked at the two girls and saw Asami having a shocked expression on her face, while Riaz, who had a pained expression on her face, dropped the sword. A huge grin appeared on his face. And he thought, this is fun, you both did good. Both the girls heard Sereg's low voice as they saw his body falling down. But this is my win. And in the next instant both of them saw a glowing blue orb in Sereg's hand as he fired the beam towards the two devils. Ah, Ria's Sama and her pawn retired the winner of the game is Sereg Sama. Sereg, who had a satisfied expression on his face, fell down on the ground and soon turned unconscious. After the game was over, Tetsaya and his group immediately went to the medical wards and found the members of both the peerages lying on the beds with bandages wrapped around them. Tetsaya looked at all of them and said, That really was rough for all of you, huh? Asia, if you don't mind. Asia nodded and said, Okay, everyone wait patiently for me to heal you all. Tetsaya then looked at the winner of the game who was still unconscious, and his hand was grabbed by Sikvera. He walked towards them and said, Don't worry, Arachan, he will be fine. And then removed the blanket from top of him and revealed his bandaged chest, which had a deep cut on it. Tetsaya placed his hand over the cut and then extracted the holy energy from it, and then started healing him. Once the deeper wound was closed, he covered his body with the blanket once again and said, There, all done, don't worry. And then fired a ball made of cold water at his face, which instantly woke him up. Sereg woke up with a panicked expression on his face, and then started looking around, but sighed when he realized where he was. He looked at Tetsaya and said, Was that really necessary to wake me up like that? Tetsaya shrugged his shoulders and said, Not really. But someone was worried about you. And looked towards Sikvera who was sitting beside Sereg. Sereg looked at Sikvera and then saw her holding his hand. He sighed and said, Don't worry I'm not someone to go down that easily. And gripped her hand lightly. Sikvera blushed when she felt him gripping her hand. And just pulled her hand back and said, Good for you that you are alright. Hearing that the rest of the girls chuckled making the green haired girl even more embarrassed. After everyone else was healed up and all of them were talking to each of the Sereg asked Tetsaya. By the way Tetsaya, who do you think improved the most in this game? Hearing that all of the ones who participated in the game looked at Tetsaya with an expectant look in their eyes. Tetsaya looked back at them as if they were idiots and said, Is that even a question to ask? And then got up from his seat and started walking towards Riaz. Seeing him walking towards her all of them especially Riaz was surprised by that. She looked at Tetsaya and said, No I mean I didn't do Thar Dash, obviously it's my favorite Danfa Gasper. And patted his head, making the Danfa blush at his compliment. The whole room turned silent at his answer and looked at Gasper who immediately hid behind Tetsaya when he felt the gazes upon him. Now, now don't scare him. He showed the best determination progress out of all of you. Not to mention he is not a person either used to fighting or hurting others, so him taking down an opponent as talented as Koreana is a great feat for him. Also a fun fact he is the only one among all of you who didn't retire during this game, and only turned unconscious because of overusing, an ability he is not used to plus he is the only one who don't have any deep injuries on his body. All of them looked at Gasper more intently, and Sereg said after a while, Gasper can is it. Fine then let's have a battle at a later date. Make sure to master that power of yours. He ate Tetsaya Senpai he is scary. Tetsaya looked at Gasper and said, Man up Gasper, don't you want others to look at you as a man? What better way would be there other than to defeat the strongest youth devil in a fight? He then turned towards Sereg and said, And you stop making that expression you are scaring him. Sereg who had an excited smile on his face, laughed out loud, and then apologized to Gasper for scaring him. Tetsaya then looked at Riaz whose bed was besides Gasper's and said, The next best improvement is definitely Riaz. You really did serp no shocked all of us by that performance of yours. That was really impressive battle you showed us. Riaz 
Maria smiled and puffed her chest proudly and said, Of course, what else do you expect? I really put my heart and soul to improve myself for the fight. Titsaya nodded and then looked at Asami and said, And you Asami Asami, who heard her name immediately tensed up and started praying inside her head, Please no hellish training. 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 No training. Titsaya smiled and said, Don't worry you will not be training under Tiamat from now on. Plus a week's break. Hearing that a huge smile appeared on her face, and she shouted, Hell yeah, no old hag from now on. But her happiness soon faded away when he heard Tetsaya's next words, From now on you will be training under me, and I will make sure that you train you thoroughly. She looked at Tetsaya with eyes which had lost all their brightness and remained silent. She then turned towards the rest of the members of Tetsaya's group and asked, Hey, this guy's joking, right? Asia, it looks like I'm dreaming a bit. Will you punch me to wake me up from this nightmare? Tetsaya walked towards her and placed his hands on her shoulders and said, Don't worry, Asami. This is not a dream. Let's work hard in the future. Asami looked at Tetsaya for a while, and then summoned her gauntlet and asked Drake. Drake, you really like training under Tiamat, right? Let's just continue that. The gem on the gauntlet glowed and Drake said, Why yeah, let's just train with her till we reach her level, and then we will think about training under Tetsaya. Tetsaya just smiled and said, I hope that you are excited for the training. And then walked away making Asami slump her shoulders and said, My luck must be totally FUC asterisk get up for me to get into worse situation each time. Tetsaya looked at Sereig and then said, By the way Sereig don't think that you are the strongest youth devil. Asami could have defeated you easily if she had used everything she had got in her arsenal. Hearing that all of them got shocked and looked at Asami with questioning gazes. Seeing which Asami got overwhelmed by them and said, WW what are you saying Tetsaya I used everything I had in my battle. Tetsaya looked at her with a neutral look on his face and asked, What all did you use in your game? Care to tell me about that? Asami thought for a while and then started listing the things that she used in the battle. I used my balance breaker, my triania, my dragon slayer magic, my holy sword. Tetsaya nodded and then said, And what about your pawn promotion? You could have promoted to queen and then used triania to defeat him easily. Not to mention using your holy sword along with just your regular triania would have done the job, and enhancing that with Dragon Slayer magic, would have been overkill for the match. Or you could have aimed for the face which was exposed to defeat him easily, and since I can heal him, you should not have the worried about that method either. The whole room turned silent once again and looked at Tetsaya while blinking their eyes. After that they all discussed about the match for a bit longer when suddenly Azazel and Serzichas came inside the room. Serzichas immediately went towards Rhea's and hugged her much to Rhea's shock. He patted her back and then said, Rhea Tan you did great. No matter what anyone says for Oni Chan you were the winner of today's match. So don't be sad, Rhea struggled in his embrace and said, Oh well, Oni-sama don't do that in front of everyone, you are embarrassing me. Azazel looked at the siblings and gave a fake cough and said, Serzichas, why don't we do what we came here for? And you can do that kind of stuff when you are back at home with your sister. Serzichas unwillingly stopped hugging Rhea's, and then looked at the others, and immediately turned to his dreamer back to the one of a male and said, You all did great in today's game. Even the higher-ups are satisfied with today's match, not to mention even the guests from the other factions were impressed by the show you put up in the game. He looked at Sereg and said, Congratulations on your win Sereg. You showed great spirit and power in the game. But then suddenly he pointed his finger at him and said, But just remember this, Rhea Tan will beat you the next time. I will make sure to train her well and make her extremely strong. And just after that he received a smack on the head from both Azazel and Tetsaya who looked at him and said, don't go to Siscon mode at important matters. The rest of them just looked at them with a wry smile, and after a while Sereg said, throw whatever you want at me, you want Lucifer so no. Serzich is nice San, but I will be ready to face all of them. Serzich was a bit surprised when he heard Sereg call him nice San after such a long time, but soon a smile appeared on his face, and he said, I am sure you will, so make sure to never give up. Serzich then looked at the others and said, and now to the more important matters. We have decided that Yuto Kiba, Kaneko Taju, Akeno Himajima, Asami Hayadu of the Rias Peerage, and Kushiro Abaddon of Sereig's Peerage to be promoted to mid-class devils. The said members of the team were surprised by the news, and were silent, while Serzichas looked at Gaspar and said, gaspar -kun. sorry, but even though you have done a lot of contracts, but since you were placed under a seal for a long time, we cannot give you a promotion right away, so don't get disheartened by that. Zenovia Kun you on the other hand have not done any contracts, so it gets difficult for you as well. And Regal's Kun, you being a sacred gear is what making us stopping from promoting you. I hope you understand. Both of them nodded their heads without showing any conflicted expression on their faces. For Regulus it didn't matter if he were to be promoted or not, and for Gasper, it was better as he did not want to face against any strangers. All of a sudden Kusha raised her hand and asked, Excuse me, can I ask why am I being promoted? If this was just because of my power then I think that my peerage members are close to my power as well. So why not them? Serzichas looked at her and said, Yes, all of them are ID powerful, but they don't have enough contract record. So we cannot help that, you on the other hand, have a good contract record. Hearing that the whole Sereg peerage looked at Kusha with surprise, making the blonde girl widen her eyes in shock as well, and say, Why wait a minute when did I do a lot of contracts? But this time instead of Serzichas it was Tetsaya who answered her. It seems like all those time I called you with that summoning leaflet for dates, or get togethers with a Scott counted as well. Am I right Serzichas? Serzichas nodded, and with a wry smile on his face said, I really was surprised when I saw that your client for the contract was Tetsayakin, but now it seems like your summoning leaflet was used as an invitation, and the rates got counted as compensation. Ha ha ha, truly a unique way for gathering contracts. 
The whole group was dumbfounded by this, and all of them thought at the same time, this really was way too lucky of her. After all of them talked for a bit longer, they decided to go back to their homes, as it was already very late, and all of them were really tired. A few days later in Kuo High School the recess bell just rung, and the students were preparing to go out and have lunch with their friends. In the hallway a student was running with a worried look on his face and was muttering, What should I do? What should I do? What should I do? He then came in front of Tetsuya's class, and rushed open the door, surprising all the students inside the class. But he didn't care about any of that, and just looked towards Tetsuya and shouted, Senpai IT is really a big trouble please help me. Tetsuya looked at the boy who called him and said, Become Gasper, and tell me what happened. It cannot be that bad. Gasper came closer to Tetsuya ignoring everyone else in the room and said, IT is a big trouble a very big one. Tetsuya held his hands up and said, Relax relax don't freak out. It must not be as big of a problem as Yodash. I am invited for a date by Koreana Sam what should I do? Hearing that the whole class turned silent and stared at the trap with a shocked expression. Before anyone could snap out of trance, the perverted duo started freaking out and both of them yelled out loud. That freaking trap got himself a date at that everyone else snapped out of trance and the girls started to make a commotion about him getting called out on a date. Gasper then realized that there were other people in the room as well, and immediately hid behind Tetsuya, when he saw the perverted duo heading towards him, as if they wanted to kill him. Tetsuya immediately stood up from his seat, grabbed Gasper's hand and said, Let go and call Kiba, we have to prepare you for everything. Don't worry both of us are good at handling girls. Let's go. And left the class along with Gasper. The rest of the class just kept on discussing about what all could happen with him on his date, or how even his date looked like. Tetsuya and Gasper then fetched Kiba out of his class, and once he heard what was the problem he too became shocked for a bit, but soon complied to help his fellow male peerage member. And thus the boys of the Ult gathered in their clue room, along with Azazel, who was already hiding there to have a drink, and also decided to help the boy for his date with his vast experience. After that the males of the Ult grouped together to give Gasper a lesson, so that he doesn't mess on his date, and even though he was freaking out a bit, he still decided to go on with it as Tetsuya and Azazel told him that it was his chance to gain more experience to become a man. A few days later on the day of the school festival, Tetsuya and the rest of the Orc were working in their maid cafe, with Tetsuya being the chef, while Kiba was helping Gasper getting prepared for his date, which would be soon. Gasper decided to have his date during the school festival, as it was possible for him to get help from the others easily compared to places somewhere else. Koreana who heard of his plan agreed with it much to Gasper's relief. Tetsuya who was working in the kitchen, felt something and immediately informed Gasper, Gasper, they are here in the school, get prepared soon and don't be nervous. He then looked at the others and said, alright prevention squad get working, don't let anyone interrupt his date, we cannot let him get intimidated from being interrupted by the others. As Azul, Kiba and Saji who were standing in front of him nodded and then went to the area where they were assigned to prevent the people from disturbing Gasper. Tetsuya looked at Gasper, and after checking his outfit was not girly and was looking appropriate for him, he nodded and gave him a ring and said, take this Gasper. Gasper, I have placed a nervousness reducing enchantment on the ring, it will help you. Gasper took the ring from Tetsuya, and then placed it on his index finger, after which the ring immediately got to his size. He stared at the ring for a while and then at Tetsuya with a determined expression on his face and said, I will do my best. Tetsuya smiled and patted his head and said, good luck, now go they are here, and pushed him a little. Gasper nodded and then went out of the kitchen and waited for her to arrive. A few minutes later the door of the club room was opened and seven people consisting of Sereig, Regulus, Sikvera, Koriana, Kusha and Serzages, who was followed by Grafia came inside. The girls who saw the group of boys enter the room were totally speechless and soon started making an uproar, much to the surprise of Sereig's group, as they were not accustomed to this kind of reaction in Underworld. Serzages being a person who frequently visits the human world was accustomed to it and didn't show any displeasure. All of them were greeted by Rias and Akeno, who decided to show them a table which would be far away from the girls, while also arranging a table for Gasper and Koriana separately. Koriana approached Gasper and asked with a smile on her face, Gasper come, ready for our date. The people who were near her looked at her for a while, when suddenly all of them heard a voice from outside. That trap got such a beautiful and mature girl as his date, everyone looked in the direction where the sound came from and saw the perverted duo peeking inside the room from the back door. Before anyone could do something, Tetsuya came out of the kitchen and walked towards the back door and went outside. A few moments later, screams of help and pain were heard by the people who were inside, making all of them sweat drop on hearing it. Tetsuya came inside and looked at the people and said, Sorry about that, please don't mind such commotion and enjoy yourselves. He looked at Gasper and gave a small nod to him, seeing which Gasper snapped out of trance, and looked at Koriana and said, Aya looks forward to tea today's date Koreana-san. Koreana looked at the small boy looked at her with a resolute expression in his face and smiled with amusement. She then took his hand and led him outside and said, We will come back later, firstly I would like to look around. Akeno who was going to attend them at their table chuckled and said, Ara Ara don't mess with him too much Koreana-san. Koreana nodded and then left the club room. After a while when there were relatively less people in the room Tetsuya came out and say with the rest of of Sereig's group and Serzichas and asked, didn't knew you have time to come here Serzichas. And immediately Grafia looked at him with an icy cold glare and said, some people really like to pile up their work and fall around. Serzichas looked at her and said, hey, if not for you constantly making me go through those papers like a robot, then I won't be that bored of my work. Let me have some rest. Tetsuya then looked at Sereg and asked, And you, I thought that you would be busy with those devils who are only good at bootlicking to get some favors out of you, and surrounded by flattery in exchange. Hearing that Sereg sighed and said, Those backers stop supporting me. 
so I am relatively free now. Seems like only getting a close win against a team whose king was considered four points less by the council is not worthy of the strongest youth devil or, so they said. The whole table fell silent as none were able to say anything. They knew that what the devil said was unreasonable, but nothing can be changed now. Cersei who wanted to help his cousin was also unable to do anything as him being a mayor made it very difficult for him to favor anybody. While they were contemplating Tetsaya broke the silence and said, then how about I support you? And immediately all of them looked at Tetsaya as if he grew a second head and Cersei's who was drinking his coffee spilled it out. Tetsaya used his magic to clean up the coffee and said, I mean, I may not have as much money as the devil families who have been doing business for such a long time, but I still have enough that I would be able to support one peerage. And regarding connections, I have a lot of them in both human and supernatural world, and most of them are quite useful. Suddenly all of them heard someone laughing and turned around and saw Azazel coming towards them. He patted Tetsaya's shoulder and said, you never cease to amaze me. A support from you. Huh? I hardly believe that there would be someone who know of you. And your strength would be willing to get on your bad side. And I believe that both the Devil and Fallen Angel factions know of you and higher ups of the Angel faction as well. Serzichis then looked at Azazel and Tetsaya and said, W8, we can't do that. First of all, there would be many who would be opposing you, as you are not the part of the alliance between the three biblical factions. Secondly, I don't want to see a massacre of devils only because they tried to oppose you. Thirdly, it would make the power balance of the devil society totally unbalanced with you supporting him, which will further give me more troubles. I oppose of this support. Titsaya looked at Serzichis and asked, Then what are you going to do to help my friend? Are you going to support him yourself? Sand without thinking Serzichis said, Yeah, let's do that. It would be much better than involving you and in causing a massacre. I can say that it is just me helping my cousin, and even though there will still be problems, it would not be as much as when you will support him. Azazel chuckled hearing him and said even Serzich has relented to this pressure. Huh? Looks like you got yourself one of the best backers you could get Sereg. Sereg chuckled and said, Yeah, it is much better than those bastard bootlickers. He then looked at Serzich's and said, Don't worry Lucifer Sama, I won't let you down. Serzich's looked at Sereg with a serious look on his face and said, You better not, because if you'll perform like anywhere the council will start pressuring me stop being biased, and I don't want that headache. After they were done discussing some more matters and the ingredients of the cafe were finished, the whole orc decided to close down the cafe, and then go on to their own yard during the festival. The girls were excited to go along with Tetsaya. But much to their annoyance Kusha already took him away with her before anyone was able to notice. Sighing at their displeasure the girls decided to look around together while Serzich's Azazel, Sereg and Regulus were left on their own much to Serzich's happiness as Great Fear was gone together with the rest of the girls. Titsaya who was walking around with Kusha while holding her hands was being glared by all the male students of the school, while Kusha was experiencing something similar from the female students. Titsaya looked at her and said, just ignore their gazes if you want to walk around happily. They will never stop that. Kusha looked at him and chuckled. Honestly, this is just too much that it way more uncomfortable than normal, especially the boys they weren't checking me out. Tetsaya shrugged his shoulders and said, Not their fault you are just that beautiful that you are attracting their attention, and it also not the case that I can just attack them for looking at my girl. Kusha smiled and said, I didn't know that you were able to control yourself this well dash. But before she could finish Tetsaya said, But don't worry, just even one of them tries to peek at your panties or get near you, then that is game over for them. I will make sure that a naked body is found hanging on the trees of the Kuo Central Park. Hum, you were saying something, and looked at Kusha with a smile on his face. Kusha looked at him with a deadpan look and said with a sigh, Nothing? Just realize that some things never change. Titsaya held her hand a bit tighter and said, What can I do? I am a bit overprotective of those who are mine. Kusha stared at him for a while and then said, Well that's certainly a good quality of yours. I will be relying on you if something bad befalls on me. Titsaya chuckled and said, I will do my best to protect you then. Both of them talked for a bit longer, while eating some food from different stalls and playing games, without using their supernatural abilities, so as to have fun. Titsaya put a seal on his and Kusha's body, so as to limit their powers to normal human levels, so that they can enjoy the festival like others. Suddenly both of them spotted Koreana and Gasper walking hand in hand with Gasper blushing like a tomato. Both Titsaya and Kusha looked at each other, and then said at the same time, let's follow them. Koreana and Gasper who were unaware of their pursuers, continued their date without any problem with Koreana. Who ASKED made, Gasper walk while holding their hands. Coriana would buy foods from different stalls, and whenever she liked something she would feed it to Gasper as well. And even though he felt extremely embarrassed during such acts, he was taught by his T-A-C-H-E-R-S Tetsaya, Kibber and Azazel to just follow along with such things if you are offered to. She would also ask for his opinions as well, and Gasper would tell her his preferences and other things, so as to keep the talk going. He had practiced for a whole week with his teachers, so as to not make his date boring. Tetsaya and the others made sure to teach him all the things they could, so that Gasper could have his first successful date. On one of the stall while walking Coriana looked at Gasper and asked, wanna do this with me. They say that they are holding a challenge of some sorts. Gasper looked at the stall and saw what the game was and said, you want to participate with me. It's a couple's game it says here. Corian flicked his forehead and said, and right now we are a couple as well, so why not enjoy ourselves? 
Gaspar rubbed his forehead for a while and nodded his head. Both of them then paid the money for the entry fees, and were then showed a pamphlet on which the list of the events which would be happening were written. Seeing the events Coriana looked at it with a deadpan expression and said, isn't this game totally in a favor? Both of them looked at each other and then chuckled. The boy who was in charge of the booth and was checking out Coriana said, then the first round is cross-dressing. The ladies would have to dress up in a man's costume which will be decided by the lottery, while the gents would have to dress up in female clothes which will also be decided by a lottery. Both Corian and Gaspar were then pulled by a girl and boy respectively to their lottery box from which they would have to choose a chit, which had their costume written on it. Coriana went first and took out a chit which said, high school uniform. Very easy. What did you got Gaspy? Gaspar looked at her with an embarrassed expression on his face and showed her the chit. Coriana who read what was written on the chit broke out laughing with the rest of the girls who saw it as well. Whoa. Gaspy come wearing a bikini even by your standards it is too much one of the boys then ring a bell and said, all right go inside and change. You will go to the next round of you. Both are able to make the judges let you pass. Both of them looked at each other and asked the same time, and what is the criteria for the judges to let us pass? It will depend on how convincing you look as that of an opposite gender in front of the judges. After both of them changed both of them came out of the changing rooms, with Coriana wearing Kuo High School boy's uniform, while Gaspar wearing a cloak. Coriana looked at Gaspar and asked, where's the bikini? Gaspar, who had a slight blush on his face looked at her and said, it's inside, this cloak. It is very embarrassing wearing something like this. Coriana who heard that immediately pulled his cloak seeing which Gaspar immediately tried to hide his bottom and said, don't do this Coriana-san. And once again wore his cloak. Coriana chuckled in response and then said, whatever let's get going, and pulled him by holding his hand taking him to the place where they were instructed to. When they reached there, they saw three people colon one boy and two girls sitting there. Coriana looked at Gaspar and then said, all right, Gaspar come time for you to do your magic. Gaspar looked at Coriana and was about to ask what she was talking about. But suddenly Coriana took his cloak off and threw it away, making Gaspar hide his bottom once again, and crouched down. Gaspar looked at Coriana with tears in his eyes and said, D don't be bully me like that Coriana-san. It's embarrassing to be looked by others like this. And used one of his hands to hide his chest. Coriana looked at the judges and saw all of them having a blush on their faces, seeing Gaspar acting like that. She smirked and crouched down to Gaspar's level, and placed the coat she was wearing over his body and said, Sorry about that Gaspy Kung. You just look too cute acting totally embarrassed like that, and patted his head making Gaspar's blush to intensify. All the three judges that held a green flag and said in unison passed both Coriana and Gaspar, looked at the judges, and then back at each other and smiled. Hearing the announcement the boy who helped them picking out the chits earlier came inside and said, Congratulations both of you, but now for the next round. The couple have to hold each other's hand for the whole time, while going through a trial route that we have made. The moment you lose your hands you lose. You both have 15 minutes to finish this round. Both Gaspar and Coriana looked at the boy, and then Coriana held Gaspar's left hand and said, remember to not let go of me for these 15 minutes, okay Gaspar Kun. Gaspar blushed a bit, but still nodded with a serious look on his face and said, don't worry. I won't let go of you no matter what. Hearing him the nearby student started to make an uproar and cheer for him, seeing which Gaspar realized what he had said and blushed in embarrassment. Coriana chuckled at his response and said, I would look forward to that, and pulled him to the start of the course. After going through an obstacle course like path which was made to be able to separate anyone, both Gaspar and Coriana came to the finish line without releasing their hands. Though the course was very well made for supernatural people of their level, it was not that difficult to overcome it without their powers. Seeing them come out the people managing the stall, clapped in appreciation for them, and then gave them a huge ticket, which said that they got a voucher for two people for an 80% off in a good nearby restaurant which surprisingly belonged to Tetsaya. Gaspar and Coriana who saw the prize were the least bit motivated about it, Tetsaya would always treat them on his own, or would give them considerable discount on food every time they visited him. But still they were a bit happy as it was really fun activity, and thanked the students for the fun time that they provided them. Tetsaya and Kusha who were watching them from afar chuckled on seeing their disappointed looks on seeing the prize that they got, and then decided to leave them alone. Later that day when most of the stalls were already closed, and the festival was about to end up all the supernatural of the Orkin Student Council, gathered together to see off a Sereg and his group. All of them talked for a while, and then Sereg and his peerage, along with Serzich's and Grafia, gathered together to go back to their respective territories. But before going back Gaspar came forward and gave Coriana a present and said, T thank you for spending time with me. Coriana smiled and took the box from Gaspar and said, don't be like that I enjoyed it as well. Let's go at some other time as well. Gaspy Kun. She then bent a bit and gave a peck on Gaspar's cheek, much to his surprise, making him go immediately red. The rest of them laughed at his reaction, and then the group went back to Underworld, leaving behind the Kua group. As Azul patted Gaspar's shoulder and said, Good job Gaspar, looks like your effort was worth it. Kiba nodded and said, Yes, she certainly looked happy, and you two were able to go out through the day without much problem at all. Good control at your shyness as well. Gaspar then shook his head and said, No, it only went well because you all helped me preparing for it, and because Tetsaya Senpai gave me a ring which helped in reducing my nervousness. All of them then looked at the ring and then at Tetsaya, seeing which Tetsaya said, Oh, that ring. That's just a normal ring made of iron, nothing more about it. Hearing which Gaspar widened his eyes in surprise and asked, Wah, then that means that I was unable to not get nervous around her on my own. Tetsaya nodded with a smile on his face and said, Yup, that ring was just there to make you make a bit more confident in your own ability. 
So Dashi then used his magic to summon the ring back to him, and put it in his storage and said, You don't need anything like this from now on. Gaspar looked at Tetsuya with a wide smile, and nodded his head happily. He then went out to help clear up the club room, as he was not able to help during the day because of his date. Azazel, who stayed behind once everyone was gone, looked at Tetsuya and said, Your way of helping him was just classic you know? I mean using a normal ring. Saying that it is a magic item which would help him read you dash. Before he was able to finish Tetsuya looked at him and said, Oh, that was indeed a real deal. That ring really helps reduce nervousness a lot, you know. Azazel stopped talking Ban stared at Tetsuya with a dumb expression on his face and said, Why why you use the cliché without actually using the cliché? Tetsuya shrugged his shoulders and said, I mean it is Gasper we are talking about. He is not going to lose his embarrassment so quickly we have to slowly erase it. And I think my idea was quite good. Azazel though for a while and then nodded his head and said, Indeed I think we can use this method for other people with shy personality, as well a very effective idea indeed. Both of them discussed about some more things with each other for a while, until suddenly a small magic circle appeared near Tetsuya's ear. Tetsuya thought for a while if something was wrong and asked, What happened Roswis? Roswis who had called him hesitated a bit and then said, Um someone from the Shiba family is here and is willing to meet you. Tetsuya widened his eyes in surprise and said, Wait there, I am coming, if they try something funny then handle them accordingly. You are allowed to let Raya take charge as well, if you see fit. He then ended the call and looked at Azazel and said, talk to you later, tell the others that I had some business to attend back home right now, and then teleported back to his house. Tetsuya immediately appeared in front of his house, and then was about to enter normally. But all of a sudden he felt something and thought, why the hell am I feeling multiple presences with magic inside them? He then got in the house and heard the sound of someone coming towards him, and saw Russ was standing and greeting him. Your family is he dashed at Sire, then raised his hand and said, first of all they are not my family. Second why the hell are there multiple magical presences in the house? Are there magicians with them? Russ was was surprised by how Tetsuya denied of him being related to the people who came to visit him. But then suddenly she looked at him weirdly and said, what are you talking about? Aren't Shibas a family of magicians in Japan? Though they are not as popular as most of them families, and are not too big as well. But still, this time Tetsuya looked at her weirdly and asked, Shibas are magicians. First time I heard of that. I mean as far as I can remember my father wasn't. But suddenly he realized something inside. He then massaged his temples and said, right, my father was adopted in the family, so he was not a mage. This also explains why Miyuki had much more magic in her when I met her for the first time. He then took his shoes off and said, anyway, they didn't try anything funny, right? Ross was shook her head and said, nope, even though they are a minor family with not much influence, they still have some reputation to uphold plus me. Raya-san and Tiamat-san didn't show any signs of her powers, so they are not wary of us. Tetsuya nodded and said, fine then let's go. Where are Raya and Tiamat by the way? Ross was nodded and then started leading him to Aunty living room while she said, they both are keeping company to your fangists. Tetsuya nodded and both of them then entered the living room, and saw the people sitting there silently while staring at each other. All of them noticed when Tetsuya and Roswes entered the room and looked at him, and immediately Raya said, let's go Tia. Tiamat nodded and then left the room along with Raya. Seeing them Roswes bowed her head and said, then I will leave please call me if you need me for something. Tetsuya nodded and just took a seat on a sofa, and stared at the people who were sitting in front of him. There were four people sitting on the room aside from Tetsuya, two males and two females, with all of them having a serious look on their faces. Though one of the males who was relatively younger than the other one, looked at Tetsuya with a mocking look on his face. Tetsuya they decided to start the conversation and asked, So what's your business for visiting the little Ormi? The younger man hearing the question looked at the other man and asked, I want to know the same thing as well, Tatsuru-san. Why do we have to visit someone like this? But the man called Tatsuru ignored him and looked at Tetsuya and said, Do you know who are we? Tetsuya didn't even took a second and said, Nope, no idea at all. But since you called yourself Shiba, then I am assuming that you are someone related to my father somehow. Tatsuru closed his eyes and said, as much as I don't want to say that I am related to that disgrace, but still you are true. You can say that he was my adopted brother. Tetsuya nodded and said, so, what is the business that you have with me? The younger man who was a bit annoyed on being ignored by Tatsuru, looked at Tetsuya with a glare and said, be a bit respectful, bastard. Not only is he older than you, he is your uncle as well. Not to mention that you are just a normal civilian. Tetsuya looked at the young man who shouted at him and calmly said, I don't know who the fuck you are, but did your parents didn't teach you to never interfere when two adults are talking to each other? The young man gnashed his teeth and was about to say something, but Tetsuya interrupted him and said, besides neither he nor I have any interest in recognizing each other as family, it is very easily understandable by how we talk to each other. Is your brain not able to comprehend even that much? And smiled at the young man. The young man was totally red in anger but was once again ignored by all the others, and once again Tetsuya and Tatsuru focused on each other. Tatsuru gave a nod and said, I will be straight here, I have no business with you as a matter of fact. I didn't even want to be near someone related to that disgrace, but I got information from someone that the one I am looking for is here in this town, and after checking the town we found out that you, though I don't know how nor I am interested in it, are still alive. So I think that you must be knowing where is she right? Tetsuya had already read their minds, but still with a smile on his face asked, and who might you be speaking about? Tatsuru stared at Tetsuya for a while and asked, I want to meet my daughter Miyuki, and take her back with me. 
Titsaya then stared at him with a blank expression on his face, making the man unconsciously fear him a bit and asked, Oh, you wanna know where Miyuki is, and want to take her back, and that too after so long? I really would like to know how the hell did the love for your daughter emerged in you all of a sudden? Tatsuru closed his eyes and said, There is no reason for me to T-dash. But before he was able to finish the other man crossed his arms, and with a smirk on his face said, Why else she is going to be my fiancé, you know. After all it is important for the benefit for both our families. There was a bit problem earlier. But we got information that one of the Shiba family daughter is still alive and is here in this town. So don't waste my time and tell us whether you know where that girl is. I don't want to waste my time on a worthless person like you. Tatsuru and the others looked at him for a while, but soon looked away from him. Tetsuya looked at Tatsuru and said, You know, you really are choosing an idiot for the daughter you suddenly had emerged love for out of nowhere. Tatsuru just narrowed his eyes and looked at Tetsuya, while the other man stood up and shouted, You really are pissing me off for a while. Now do you really want to die? You are just a normal human and are daring to insult a great magician like me. Titsaya looked at the man with a bored expression on his face and asked Mr. Whoever you are, shut up. I am not interested in what you do. So you can go and take out pigeons from your hat somewhere else. The boy with dark blue hair glared at him and said, I really want to kill you right now. Be thankful that the fact that you might have some information about my would-to-be fiancé is stopping me, Shinji Matsu, from killing a worthless human like you just this instant. Titsaya who heard his name mentally sighed and thought, Good, even his name is based on one of the bastards that I know of. But while he was in his thoughts the door of the room suddenly opened, and this team who were left back at school, came back along with Sona and Tsubaki. Miyuki looked at the people for a while, and then at Tsutsaya and asked, Ross was told us that someone from the Shiba family came here. Tatsuru looked at Miyuki and gave a nod and stood up from his seat and said, No doubts, she indeed have resemblance to Miya. He then looked at Miyuki and with a smile on his face said, Good to see you after such a long time Miyuki. Miyuki tilted her head a bit and asked, Who are you? And then there was total silence in the room, with only the sound of Tatsuya trying just best to hold back his laugh. One of the women who came with the Shibas, had a few tick marks on her forehead, seeing Tatsuya's expression while Tatsuru's face was twitching a bit. Tatsuru then gave a fake cough and said, What are you talking about? I am your father. Miyuki and the others who just came back blinked in surprise, and then Miyuki suddenly said, I have a father. And finally Tetsuya was unable to hold back and started laughing out loud. Tetsuya continued to laugh for a while, and finally stopped when he saw the girls looking at him for explanation. Miyuki looked at Tetsuya and asked, What are they talking about on Isama? And what is it about my father? I never had one right. Tetsuya shrugged his shoulders and said, Since you are alive then that means that you once had a father. It's just that it is the first time in 20 years that you are seeing him. So I think that is the reason. Before she could ask anything further the blue-haired man asked, Is she 20 years old? Tetsuya looked at him and said, Nope, she is 16, and that's my point there. They have not even met since her birth, this so-called father of hers. It's social distancing on a whole another level. Tetsuya then looked at his team and Sona and Tsubaki and asked, Anyway what are you all doing here coming so soon? And why are Sona and Tsubaki with you? Sona looked at Tetsuya and said, Azazel told us that you left saying that you had some work back at home. And it was then I realized that the Shiba family asked for my permission to enter the town, and realized that it was something related to that. She then lowered her head and said, I am sorry for letting them in. I thought that they were your relatives, and were willing to meet you, so I allowed them thinking that it would be like a surprise for you. I am really sorry. Tetsuya sighed and said, No harm done so no problem Sona, but please ask me about important matters like this from the next time. Sona looked up and nodded her head and said, So I told them about all this, and then they told me that you have no ties with the Shiba family, and then all of us rushed here. Tetsuya nodded and said, Fine then, no problems you all can go and have some rest, I will come once all of this is sorted out. All of them nodded, and then the girls started to leave the room. But Shinji stood up and said, Wait, 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 what the hell just happened here? I mean, wasn't that Sona Citru the heiress of the Citri clan? What is she doing here? And apologizing to a bastard like him, and pointed his finger at Tetsuya. The rest of the girls looked at him as if he was an idiot, and Sona was about to retort. But Tetsuya stopped her by raising his hand and said, Oh, nothing much, she apologized to me because her parents taught her manners unlike some people whom I met recently. Shinji immediately understood what Tetsuya meant, and at that moment his confusion turned into anger towards Tetsuya. But the rest of them ignored him once again, as Tatsuru looked at Miyuki and said, Anyway leaving all that Miyuki, the fact that I am your father is true, so why don't we go back to our home? And gave a sweet smile. But Miyuki didn't even took a second and said, No need. I don't know who you are. You all can go back. Bye and started walking out of the room with the test of the girls, as they lost interest in the conversation. The Shibas were totally surprised by the instant rejection by Miyuki, and were not able to think what to do. But Tatsuru came out of the shock soon and said, W8, why don't you think about it first? I mean wouldn't but be better for you to be with your parents rather than a person like him. Miyuki stopped and turned around, and with a smile on her face said, Family you say what family are you talking about? The one who left me all alone when my mother died or the one who left me alone in that orphanage all those years ago? Tatsuru and the others fell silent, while Tetsuya just sat back comfortably on his seat and let them do the talking. Miyuki then said, And don't tell me the man who is calling himself my father, didn't even know about mom's death, and me being left in the orphanage. 
Cause I don't think that I ever saw you come near the orphanage to search for me or something, nor any search requests in newspapers or something else. Tetsuya who was sitting comfortably said, not his fault Miyuki, don't blame the poor old man. Hearing which all of them were shocked especially the shivers as they didn't expect him to take their side. Seeing the expression on their faces Tetsuya smiled and said, he was busy in preparation for her marriage with his lover, then I think he forgot about his previous family. The old man was just excited for that. Hearing which Tetsuya's team looked at Tatsuru with a glare while the shivers did the same, but were glaring at Tetsuya. Tatsuru glared at Tetsuya and said, I don't remember ever telling about something like this to you. Tetsuya looked at him and said, yeah, you never told about this to me. But you just let it get published in a newspaper, and I being a curious child that I was while searching for people with similar surname, as mine found that. I mean there is just one Shiba family in Japan to begin with, so it was not all that hard. I even had all these things separated for as well. Tetsuya and Tatsuru stared at each other for a while, with none of them intending to back off from it. But Shinji who was getting annoyed by getting ignored by all of them said, All of this is irritating me. I already told you to not waste my time. We already found the girl take her and let's go Miyuki looked at Shinji and said, shut it seaweed. Oni-sama what the hell are they here for to begin with? Tetsuya continued to stare at Tatsuru and said, apparently that person suddenly had his fatherly love for his daughter evoked into him and wanted to get you back with him in it to marry that seaweed there. Hearing that all the girls blinked their eyes in surprise for a while and then looked at Shinji who had a confident smoke on his face. Miyuki pointed her finger towards Shinji and asked, this bitch, like hell I am going to be with him. Isn't he just a piece of shit WHO can't get his shit together because he was born into a shit of a family WHO must have some shitty influence making him that a shit like him is better than others and hence making him more of a piece of shit. That GE already is all of them turned silent after Miyuki's outbreak and Shinji looked at Miyuki with a shocked expression on his face. Miyuki who now had calmed down her breathing said, not to mention he is not even 0.1% like Onisama. And even if he were there is no way that I am going to marry someone other than Onisama seriously. You have some guts to come here and say that you are my father and want me to marry someone like him. What is even good about him? Shinji smacked the table gaining everyone's attention and said, You all really know how to piss someone off. This? This is why I don't like being with plebs like them. They don't even know where they even stand. He then glared at Miyuki and said, And you, you want to know what is good about me right? Then tell me is that bitch of your Onisama know how to use real magic? And made a fireball of the size of a football appear in his hand. The whole Tetsaya team looked at each other, while Sona just sighed seeing the blue-haired bastard dig his own grave. Tetsaya and his group looked at Shinji, and with a smile on their faces said, Really? You know how to use magic? How awesome. And all of them released a bit of their power, making the whole house tremble. Shinji fell on the ground along with the rest of the shivers, and then heard Miyuki saying, now what don't you show what kind of magic you can do? And looked at him a mocking expression on her face. Tetsuya and the others looked at the shocked and pale faces of their guests and smiled. Tetsuya looked at Shinji and asked, What happened great magician don't want to show us your magic? And then looked at Tatsuru and asked, And what about you why looking so pale in front of me? Both of them who were still speechless by the sudden inflation bin the magical energy near them, were not able to think clearly, and didn't answer Tetsuya's questions. Seeing them not answering Tetsuya was about to ask something again, but before he was able to an icicle just flew by their faces grazing their cheeks a bit making them snap out of trouble. Both Tatsuru and Shinji touched their cheeks and found fresh wound there which was bleeding. Both of them saw the blood on their hands, and then looked at the person who fired at them, and saw Miyuki looking at them with a smile. You are being rude to Onisama by keeping quiet here you know. If you continue to act like that I would be forced to teach you some manners. Both Tatsuru and Shinji gulped their saliva, and both of them thought at the same time, she is dangerous. Like hell I can handle a daughter slash wife like that Tatsuya who heard their thoughts looked at them and said, like hell I would let that happen even if you could. Both of them got surprised by Tatsuya's words, and looked at him with widened eyes. Tatsuya started at them for a while and then said, what I just read your mind, don't think too much about it. Now let's start the main talk here. Who gave you info about Miyuki's location? Tatsuru looked at Tatsuya with a hateful gaze, and wanted to say that he had no reason to answer him. But before he was able to Tatsuya said, just to let you know it would be better if you answer while we are asking peacefully. Or we can arrange for you to have a one-on-one -on -one talk with Miyuki. Hearing that Miyuki smiled and started releasing a cold aura and said, My, it has been a long time since I have got a Vic person who I can talk to talk to. Shall we do that gentlemen? Hearing which both of them shivered in fear and looked at Tatsuya with a pleading gaze. Tatsuya shrugged and said, Tell me what I want to know, and the matter ends here. Tatsuru was still not willing to tell him. But Shinji got scared seeing Miyuki's aura and said, I I will tell you I will tell you Tatsuru looked at Shinji with a glare and was about to stop him. But Tatsuya used his telekinesis to stop him and said, That's enough Tatsuru-san. See we'd go on say it. Shinji nodded and said, it was a devil a devil from Cow's Brigade, who told us that the daughter of Tatsuru Shiba, was living in this place, and since both our families were undergoing some negotiations, it was decided by the elders of our family, to go and bring back the daughter, so that we can form a relationship between the two families. That is all I know please tell her to stop glaring at me, 
Shinji looked at Miyuki with a fearful expression as with each word that he said, Miyuki's anger kept on growing. She really wanted to go to that devil and skewer him up all over his body. Tetsuya looked at Miyuki and said, Calm down Miyuki it is not something worth your anger. Tetsuya then looked at Tatsuru and said, Now then please go home as there is nothing else to talk. And then stood up from his seat. Tatsuru looked at Tetsuya and said, Yes, we don't have any business with you in the first place. Now then Miyuki let's go to our home the whole Shiba family is waiting for you. Miyuki looked at Tatsuru and said, Don't want to. Just get going I don't have any relation with you in the first place. And about the Shiba family. The only Shibas that I have a relation with are my mother and my Onisama. Tatsuru looked at Miyuki and Tetsuya who looked back at him and said, You do know that you are still legally underage, and is not under guardianship of anyone, right? I can still get you to come under the family through legal supernatural channels. After all it's not just me who wants you to come back rather the whole Shiba and Matu family are willing to have you back in the family. So be a sane person and come back to the Shiba family. Miyuki who heard that started to release her aura, and it kept on going higher and higher by each passing second. The whole room was instantly covered in ice, and even Tetsuya's teammates started to feel the coldness of the aura coming out of Miyuki. Tatsuru and the rest of them who now felt the aura which was much higher than the one which was released by her earlier, made him totally shocked, and he started releasing his aura in self-defense as well which was followed by the other people who came along with him. Miyuki made a magic circle and was about to fire at them, but Tetsuya gave her a head chop and said, Idiot, do you want to destroy the whole town control your anger a bit? Miyuki pouted at being reprimanded by Tetsuya, but still abided to his order, and lowered the power of her attack and froze all of them, while only letting their heads go unfrozen, as she still wanted to say something to him. Miyuki got closer to Tatsuru and said in a cold voice, Don't you even dare to give us such kind of threats, you want to send the whole family to us, send it. I alone am enough to brain freeze all of you. And don't ever and I mean ever give me the crap about my family when you are not a part of it. I don't even give a crap whether you are my father or not, so don't think that I will hold back when I would kill you. And placed her hand on his head and started to freeze him. But Tetsuya stopped him and said, now now, don't be that lenient with him. It would be too less if he just died like that, not to mention his family will annoy us to death. Since they came here after taking the permission from one of the people who lead this town, so us killing him right now would be way too annoying. Miyuki looked at Tetsuya for a while and nodded her head, seeing this Tetsuru on the other side. But then Miyuki turned around and said, Asia use your healing magic on them, while I freeze their bodies, and make sure that they die, but remain on the verge of death. Miyuki then looked at Tatsuru whose face was pale from both the coldness of the ice, and fear on seeing Miyuki's cold expression. Asia then came forwards and said with a smile on her face, You are lucky that I am not getting a chance in this. Miyuki-chan is way too lenient compared to me. Miyuki then looked at Tatsuru and said, Let us have you experience how I felt when I was on the verge of death when I escaped from the orphanage. And once again started freezing him while the other three just looked at him on horror. Miyuki then looked at Hamari and said, melt the ice and burn his skin to crisp, but don't let him die. Asia don't heal him too much and make sure that he is on verge of death. Hamari shrugged her shoulders and did as Miyuki told her, and started firing a blue flame towards the ice, melting it in the process which was followed by Tatsuru's screams. Miyuki then froze his body once again, and the process repeated for two more times, after which Tatsuru lost consciousness. Seeing that the lady who was from the Shiba family looked at Tatsuya and the others and said, why why you monsters just you wait. Shiba family and Matu family will surely make you all suffer for this. How dare you attack the next family head like this. Hearing which the lady from the Matu family and Shinji looked at her and said, Hey bitch, don't drag us in your mess. We are not related to all this. But Tetsuya stopped all of them using his telekinesis and said, You all must be tired right? Let me call someone to get all of you. He then made multiple magic circles, and small projections of people started to appear over them. The people in the projections were surprised seeing Tetsuya being the one calling them, and that to all of them together, and wanted to ask if something was wrong, for which he needs some help. Tetsuya looked at the people and said, Hey guys, you see we caught some people who are telling that they had some interactions with the Cow's Brigade, and they tried to kidnap Miyuki, and were trying to threaten us. So you want to interrogate them for anything else that they know? We have already made them confess that they interacted with Cow's Brigade. The people who Tetsuya had called were the leaders of various factions who have signed the peace treaty, and were fighting against Cow's Brigade. All of them when they heard that someone tried to kidnap Miyuki and were even trying to threaten them, had a sweat drop and thought at the same time. Which bastard had such an unlucky day to that against this group? Their idiotism must be over 9000 if they thought of doing something like this. Tetsuya then looked at a particular group of three people consisting of Susanoo, Tsukiyomi and Amaterasu. He looked at the frozen people for a while, and then said, Ah, uh, another information, these people are from the Shiba and Matu family, Susanoo Naisan, make sure to pay them a visit who knows how much contact they have with the Cow's Brigade, and don't worry about the Shiba family. Neither I nor Miyuki have any ties with them, so who is coming to get them? All of them just gave a silent prayer for the Shiba and Matu family, as they knew that now both the families are on Tetsuya's bad side, which even these leaders didn't want to get on to. Serzichs and the other Maus then decided to take care of them, as it was related to devils from the Cow's Brigade. Tetsuya then cut the call and looked at the frozen people who were now totally shocked by what just happened. He smiled at them and said, don't worry, 
Your ride must be coming shortly to fetch you guys. A few days passed away since the people who came to visit Tatsaya and the others were taken away by the devils. Both the Shiba and Matsu family were held under custody for being suspects of being involved with the Cow's Brigade and were being interrogated by various factions who were part of the Alliance. And even though Tatsaya himself didn't pursue the matter any further, it was very clear to the supernatural world that the both these families were now totally in ruin. It was a weekend, and currently Tatsaya is accompanying Riaz as she asked him to go out with her on a date is the promise that both of them made before the raiding game with Sereg. Riaz was walking beside Beside him with a smile on her face, seeing which Tatsaya said, you certainly are enjoying. Riaz who wore a simple white dress looked at Tatsaya and said, of course, I am. It had been so busy lately that I didn't even have time to get a proper sleep. So relaxing like this is feels very good. She then moved her hand forward and said, plus it is my first date as well, so I'm kind of excited for it as well. Tatsaya who understood what she meant held her hand making the redhead smile and said, well then, make sure to enjoy to your fullest today. Riaz gave a nod and then started dragging Tatsaya along with her to all the places that got her interest, though Tatsaya as well, sometimes dragged her along with him whenever he saw something that got his interest, or he thought would be interesting for the redeed. Riaz happily went along with him as they were just looking around the town without any aim, and it was kind of fun for her to guess where Tetsaya will lead her next. Both of them went to different stores, had some food from any store that grabbed their attention, and went to watch a movie which Riaz insisted upon, as it was an anime movie which she was quite fond of. Both of them then decided to go home, but on the way Tetsaya gave her a bracelet as a memento for her first date. Riaz accepted the gift with a smile on her face, and gave Tetsaya a peck on his cheek, and then was dropped off to her home by Tetsaya, after which he went back to his house. But when he got back to his home he found some guests sitting in there. Since when have you guys been here? Hearing his voice all of them turned around, and immediately someone jumped on him. Tetsaya Naya Tetsaya caught the black haired Nekishu and said as energetic as ever, Ah Kuroka. Kuroka chuckled and then let go of him. Tetsaya then looked at the rest of the Vali team and said, How come the battle junkie got the time to visit us? And good to see you Arthur, Lafay and Biku. Arthur bowed his head and said, It's nice to meet you again Tetsaya-san. I hope that you are doing well. Lafay who had the three gold killer pups in her lap, smiled and nodded her head as well. While Biku who was eating some sweets, just gave a tired wave of his hand, and then got back to his rest. Vali looked at Tetsaya and said, Nothing really just got some time off on my schedule, and decided to see how some gods were doing, and looked at Loki who was sitting on a chair while drinking tea. Loki glared at Vali and said, Shut up bastard. If not for my powers being sealed right now, I would have killed you this instant. It is only because of you not telling me about H.I.M. pointing at Tetsaya being there at the party that I was trapped by him. Vali looked at Loki and said, It is your own fault for gathering enough information about your mission. You got caught because of your own foolishness. You really pissed me off. You know that white dragon emperor. Hearing what Loki said Biku answered, Oh, being a jerk is one of his innate abilities. Don't think too much about it. Which earned laughs from everyone in the room and a glare from Vali who wanted to kick Biku's butt. Tetsaya soon stopped laughing and asked, So but Dragon, what is the real reason for you to be here? Vali looked at Tetsaya with an annoyed look on his face and said, Don't use that title, you jerk asterisk sigh asterisk whatever. The thing is since the time office has started living here permanently with you all, and have not been acting as the leader of the brigade, there are various problems that have arisen in the organization. Tetsaya nodded and said, I mean it has been a few months since office gave up on the cow's brigade. I would have been more surprised if there were still no problems in the brigade after such a long time. So, you are here to ask office to lead you all once once again or what? Vali just shrugged his shoulders and said, Nah, it doesn't bother me whether she leads us or not, since my group neither took her snakes, nor are we working on someone else's plans. As long as I have a front to do my stuff without any problems, I don't mind this small stuff. Also Dash he then looked at Tetsaya with a deadpan look on his face and said, I am not an idiot to go against you to force her back to be the leader. Tetsaya nodded and said, Good choice, anyway continue. Vali nodded and said, I am just here to check that there are no problems here for office. Many of the groups in the brigade are getting rather annoying since she has left the organization and want her to come back or more correctly want her power. Tetsaya snorted and said, like hell anyone can do something on my turf. Is there someone back there who was planning something like that or what? Vali nodded and said, now getting on to the second thing that I came here for, there are some people who would like to meet you. Lefei? and looked towards the blonde magician. Lefei nodded and let the pups get off her and stood up. She then made a magic circle on the floor, and after a few moments a few people appeared out of it. Tetsaya looked the people who had multiple injuries on their bodies. Seeing them he sighed and said, the hero faction how? What happened to them for them to be in such a beaten state? And it seems like all the core members are not here as well. He then looked at Vali and asked, you are not planning to turn your back on me and attack us are you? But Dragon. Vali had a tick mark on his forehead and he said, don't use that title you bastard. And like I said earlier, I am not that foolish to do something like that. I know I can get a fight against you pretty easily compared to that way. They just told us that they had some business with you and being in such condition. I don't think there would be much of a threat anyway to you. So I thought, why not? It looked pretty interesting to me as well. So here we are. Tetsaya looked at him with a deadpan bloom on his face, seeing which Vali said, What? I even brought my whole team for your protection. Tetsaya smorted and said, Protection my ass. Like hell I need protection. He then sighed and looked at Asia and said, Anyway Asia heal them first. They are just about to pass out any insta dash asterisk thud asterisk asterisk thud asterisk asterisk thud asterisk asterisk thud asterisk Tetsaya. 
Then looked at the unconscious bodies in the ground and said, Anyway, you got what I mean right? Heal their bodies, seal their powers, and keep all of them in the guest room for now. We have no choice but to wait for them to recover first. Asia nodded, and then she dragged the bodies to Dispo heal them and keep them in the guest room. Once she was gone Tetsaya sighed and then cleaned the trail of blood that was left behind by the bodies which were being dragged by Tetsaya. He then looked at Vali, who had an amused expression on his face, seeing which he asked, just curious. I just wanted to know why the hero faction didn't attack Kyoto. Looks like you were behind it. So how did the battle went? How did you beat their asses? After which the rest of them also looked at him with an anticipatory gaze as they too wanted to hear about the story as only Kurumi and Roswas knew about that incident. Tetsaya nodded and then started to tell them about the incident. After Tetsaya told them about the incident with the hero faction and Indra all of them had an amused look on their faces. Vali was even laughing his ass off when he heard how easily Kao Kao was beaten. Since he has been challenging Tetsaya and the rest of his team for fights for years. Now he was quite a bit better than Kao Kao, and easily defeat him with his full power. Vali looked at Tetsaya and asked, Oh, by the way, can you ask the Red Dragon Empress if she is willing to have a fight with me? Her fight in the raiding game against the Bell Peerage made me very excited for a battle against her. Tetsaya thought for a while and said, I will tell her, but none of you are allowed to use the Juggernaut Drive, understood. Just weapons and balance breaker. Vali who heard him gave him an annoyed look, but still accepted the condition. The chance for a fight was much more valuable for him compared to arguing about prohibitions. Tetsaya and the others then had their dinner together with the Vali team, after which Tetsaya showed them their rooms for them to spend the night. The next morning Tetsaya woke up early as he felt the hero faction being conscious and decided to welcome them at his home. Tetsaya got off from the pile of bodies lying all around him after their night exercise and then changed his clothes before going out of the room. He then went to the room where the members of the hero faction were and entered after giving a knock to the door. In the room he saw the member of hero faction lying in their beds and looking at each other with a confused look on their faces trying to analyze the situation. Once all of them saw Tetsaya a subconscious fear crept into their mind and all of them immediately became tensed. Tetsaya just waved his hand and said, good morning, and then fetched himself a chair and and sat down on it. He then gave a yawn and said, you all are at my place right now. Now what is your story for coming here totally injured? Cow Cow looked at his teammates who were just as surprised as him and asked, did Volley Team brought us here? Tetsaya who now had a cup of coffee in his hand nodded his head and drank from his cup. He then looked back at the members of the hero faction and said, well, I don't mind talking like this. But I think it would be better if you all change your clothes first, especially you, and looked towards Jian, who had most of her clothes ripped, which showed a lot of her cleavage. Jian and the others looked at their clothes, and Jian immediately covered herself with the bed sheet that was on top of her and asked, D, do you have a change of clothes? Tetsaya nodded and snapped his finger, and a partition was formed around all their beds, and a set of clothes appeared in front of them. Seeing the clothes and the walls surrounding her, Jian released a sigh of relief, and started changing her clothes. Once they were done changing the walls surrounding them disappeared, and all of them looked towards Tetsaya's direction only to find that he was not there. Cow Cow moved towards where Tetsaya was sitting and found a piece of paper there with something written on top of it. Discuss among yourselves if you want to and once you are done walk straight out of the room. Tell me what you want once all of us are gathered there. Yes. Your powers are currently sealed so don't waste time in thinking about making some trouble. Once he read the what was written on the paper he showed it to the rest of the team and all of them silently looked at each other when Secret suddenly asked. Are you really sure it is really fine to tell them Cow Cow? Cow Cow looked at Secret and said, We have no other choice, Indra is currently out of reach, since he has some things to deal with. Also, he is related to this matter in a way, so it should be better to take sides right now, than regretting it later. The others looked a bit dissatisfied by the answer, seeing which Cow Cow added, Plus he is a human as well, so no harm done to our motto. All of them looked at their leader with a deadpan look on their faces, and gave a tired sigh. After they discussed with each other for a bit longer, all of them left the room and walked straight and soon found Tetsaya. But all of them got surprised when they found all the people that were sitting there and talking to each other. Vali who was now awake as well, looked at Cow Cow and the others, who were now wearing some casual clothes, and said, Whoa, didn't think that I would ever find you wearing something other than your battle gear Cow Cow. Cow Cow looked at Vali and said, Shut it White Dragon. What are you doing here anyway? Vali rested his head on top of his hand and said, Be more respectful to me. After all it was me who brought you all here when you all were beaten so badly. Aren't I a very kind devil? Cow Cow and the others snorted, and Cow Cow said, Kind my ass. Anyway we still have so dash. But before he was able to continue a small girl passed by hit and walked towards that sire and sat in his lap. Cow Cow and the rest of his team were surprised seeing the little girl and said in unison, Oh oh office office looked at the people who called her out, and gave them a nod and said, The group of heroes I think. To which the rest of them just dumbly nodded their heads. Office nodded once again, and then started playing with the gold killer pups who came towards her. Tetsaya looked at them and said, Why don't you all sit down for now? There are still some people who have yet to come. All of the hero faction members snapped out of trance on hearing Tetsaya, and nodded their heads, and took a seat around the table with Cow Cow, sitting beside Vali. Once all of them were gathered around the table except for Biku, who was still asleep, Tetsaya's clones started to bring out the breakfast that they had prepared for them and started putting it on the table. Soon Biku came out as well when he smelled the aroma of the food and immediately take his seat on the table. Tetsaya then looked at the heroes and said, Eat something first, we will discuss what you want to talk about after this. All of them nodded and were about to begin, but all of them suddenly felt some disturbance in their surrounding and immediately got serious. Oh, I didn't think that kids of your generation wake up this early in the morning. 
All of them looked in the direction where the voice came from, and saw two men having silver hair standing there. Seeing the two men, Vali's aura subconsciously started to leak out a bit, as he started to get angry, and immediately rushed towards the older man, and tried to punch him only to face through his body. Oh, I didn't expect my grandson to be this excited to meet his grandfather, but sorry grandpa is just a projection right now. Vali glared at the man who called him his grandpa and asked, What are you doing here, Rizavim, Euclid? The older person who called himself Vali's grandfather smiled and said, Now, why am I here? I wonder about that. But before Vali who was about to argue with him could say something Tatsaya interrupted them and said, So what business do you have, Vali's gramps and my brother-in-law, for you to come unannounced? Immediately, the whole room turned silent as they were confused as to why he called the other one his brother-in-law, though Raya was laughing her ass off, as she knew what all was going through Euclid's mind. Euclid looked at Tatsaya with a shocked expression on his face and asked, Wait, what do Yomi dash? But before he was able to finish what he was saying, Tetsaya severed their connection, making the projection disappear immediately. He then looked at the rest of the people in the room and said, Just finish it up for now, we will talk to them once we are done. All of them looked at Tetsaya with a deadpan look on their faces, and Vali wanted to argue about it as well but stopped himself from lashing out to not cause any problem, and followed Tatsai's command. Meanwhile, in the headquarters of the old Satan faction, a certain silver-haired Siskon was getting too much impatient and frustrated, as he was unable to connect back to Tatsai's house. After Tatsai and the others were done with their breakfast, Tatsai stopped bothering the Link, which was trying to connect to his house for a while. Just as he did that, the two silver-haired men appeared once again with Rizavim sitting on a chair while having his own breakfast and Euclid with a frustrated expression on his face, as he had been trying to connect to his house for all this while. Ha, IT got connected, said Euclid with a maniacal expression on his face. But but soon he calmed down and went back to his cool expression and said, it's connected once again. Hearing which Rizavim stopped eating and got up from his spot and walked towards Euclid and stood beside him. He gave a fake cough to clear his throat and said, once again good morning to all of you. And it was not very nice of you Tetsaya Shiba. Do you know how sad Euclid Kun felt when we were not able to form a connection? Tetsaya looked towards Euclid and said, Sorry for all that brother-in-law we were having breakfast and didn't want to get disturbed brother-in-law, and hence I had to cut off the connection brother-in-law. I hope you understand brother-in-law. Each time he said those words a new tick mark appeared on Euclid's forehead. He could understand why the black-haired brat in front of him was calling him like that, but there was no way that he was going to accept that fact unless he is totally sure of it. He still had some hope left, but Tetsaya being Tetsaya, showed a friendly smile and said, Don't worry brother-in-law I will Take good care of Grafia. You can be rest assured. As if someone spilled some salt of his wounds, Euclid's whole body trembled a bit. Rizavim looked at Tetsaya and said, Oh, so that's why you have been calling him brother-in-law. Congratulations Euclid Kun, your sissy alright? Why are you shaking like that? But just as he heard that he stopped trembling and looked up with a calm expression on his face and said, It's nothing. Please continue your conversation. I have some things to take care of, if you will excuse me. And then his projection vanished. Rizavim looked at Euclid, who was now going out of his room, and soon shrugged his shoulders and said, Well he must be happy for his sister. Anyway let's begin where we left off earlier. He then looked looked at Tetsaya and said, Tetsaya Sheba give offers to us. Asterisk dead S-I-L-E-N-C-E asterisk all of them got silent and looked at the old silver-haired man, as if he was an idiot, while the man in question had a smile on his face. Tetsaya shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know what are you talking about. I don't know the dragon god's whereabouts. And I am not helping you find her as well. That statement made all of them silent once again, as they looked at the black-haired lowly who was eating cake with a blissful expression on her face. Then who the hell is that lowly sitting over there, was the thought that came to all of them. Rizavim pointed his finger at the said lowly and asked, then who is she? Tetsaya pretended to follow where he pointed and said, oh, that's my cousin, who came here to live with us. Rizavim's smile now vanished, and he now had an expression which said, you think I am an idiot or what? But soon a smirk appeared on his face and said, that's strange, you taking care of your cousin. Last time I checked you used your connections to take care of your whole family, when they just came to find their missing daughter. Aren't you too ruthless with your family? Tetsaya snorted and said, shouldn't it be me who should ask that question to you? And by the way you are talking about that incident, it looks like you may know who was the one who was behind the scenes informing them of our whereabouts. Rizavim had an amused smile on his face, and he said, Well, you could say it was one of our new recruits who took pity on the family who was searching for their daughter and tried to help them. See, how kind we are. Tetsaya narrowed his eyes a bit and asked, And who might be this new recruit of yours? But Rizavim immediately raised his hand and shook his finger to and fro and said, Now now, let's not get into those deeper details. There are a few things which we should not tell to others. Tetsaya was about to ask something else. But Kao Kao and the rest of the hero faction came forward, and Kao Kao asked in an angry tone, Rizavim where the hell are George and Leonardo? Your people were the ones who took them right. Seeing Kao Kao's angry expression, Rizavim immediately got excited and asked, Oh, the heroes huh? Actually you were the ones who I was trying to contact. But seeing Tetsaya Shiba I forgot about you all. So, ah, uh, why Tilda? Kao Kao and his team gritted their teeth and wanted to attack them. But the fact that the person in front of them was just a projection stopped them. Seeing the frustrated expression on their faces Rizavim smirked and said, You all must be feeling frustrated, right? Like how when a person is forcefully stopped from ejaculating when he is just on the verge of coming. That dreadful feeling is immense for a person's mind. And gave a satisfied nod. Hearing the example he just gave Vali and the rest of the hero faction frowned a bit while Tetsaya and Biku thought at the same time. Sounds like something that Massacre's Fallen would do. Meanwhile in Kyoto, a certain fallen angel was tied and hanged on the rope while a fair-skinned diminutrix 
outfit woman was pushing her pointed heels on the man's body. You feeling good little P.I.G. tilde. H tilde A.H. tilde A.H. tilde absolutely miss dash asterisk A.C.H.O.O. asterisk who the hell is thinking about me? Is this their SM club lady that I visited last time? But all of a suddenly a large amount of electric current passed through his body, making him screech in pleasure. Now now little P.I.G. tilde I don't think that you would be thinking of some other lady, while I'm stepping on you right? The lady asked with a smile on her face. Seeing the smile on her face the fallen angel shuddered a bit and thought, oh boy she is going to make me go through hell now looks, like I will be squeezed dry today. Back to Shiba residence. Rizavan once again have a cough to get back their attention and said, don't worry about your teammates me and the others are treating them very well. But you know I was very sad when you all rejected to cooperate with us. Luckily I found you all and invited the two of them to know about our offer. Oh and don't worry the other members of the hero faction are ready to help us as well. After all two of their main members asked them to cooperate. But at that moment Siegfried was unable to hold back and tried to attack Rizavim only to pass through him once again. He glared at the silver head projection and said, You dare take advantage of their loyalty and our name I will fucking kill you. Devil Rizavim looked back at Siegfried and said, All, looks like the someone got a bit too angry. Well whatever, I just wanted to convey a message anyway. He then looked at Tetsaya and Kao Kao with with a serious expression on his face and said, listen here hero faction, I will just urge once again, are you all going to work with the cow's brigade or not? Cow Cow who heard his question, glared back at him and said, like hell we are going to work with someone like you, and returned George and Leonardo back to us. But Rizavim ignored that and said, so you are against us like my grandson as well huh? Now then Tetsai Shiba, are you going to hand over the infinite dragon go dash nah, not gonna help you, and like I said, I don't have the whereabouts of the dragon god. Rizavim narrowed his eyes and said, so be it, just make sure to not regret your decision later, brat, and let me tell you our new recruits are really pissed off with you, so make sure to take every step carefully. And then the projection vanished, but a note dropped on the ground attracting everybody's attention. Titsaya picked up the note and saw something written on it. One Isama does not belong to you so be in your limits human. After Tetsaya read that note, he burned it and said, Anyway, looks like all the things we had to discuss earlier are done by that devil geezer. So what's your next step of action knowing that pointing at Kao Kao? He has your comrades and your wild faction under him right now. And that he is planning something big. Hearing that both Vali and Kao Kao clicked their tongues as they didn't know what to do about this situation. Kiroka looked at Jian and the her team and asked, Can't you contact anyone from your faction and tell them about this? Jian looked at Kiroka and said, We tried it earlier when we wanted to call for backup when we were attacked but it looks like they have already taken all of them to a location where it is impossible for us to contact them. She said in a dejected manner and once again tried to contact the members of her faction only to sigh at her failure. Vali was gritting his teeth knowing that his grandfather was up to something, and yet he was unable to even know where he is currently hiding. That damn old bastard, just as coward as ever. Titsaya clapped his hands to gather their attention and make them snap out of their negative thinking and said, now now. Don't get affected by the negative emotions, otherwise it might be possible that you would take some wrong steps, and would end up in failure or even die because of that. You still have to save your teammates and settle score with someone, right? All of them looked at Tetsaya with their eyes a bit narrowed and asked, then what do you think we should do her? Huh? He pointed towards the hero faction and said, first of all rest up that fatigue bodies of yours, and then start improving your strengths before searching for your teammates. Even if they are kept somewhere, you cannot contact two doesn't mean that they all have been gathered at one place. Some of the members might be on a mission or something, and would not have been captured yet. So gather them first and start searching for their hideout. He then looked at Vali and said, and you, get a bit stronger if you want to take on that geezer. He at the very least is high Satan level, if not a super class like Surzage's. Plus you still need to find out where he is hiding. You all have got a lot of work to do. And just to warning you, if that geezer comes in my way asking for his ass to get kicked, then I will do so if you are not able to take him on at that time, so it would be better for you to get stronger as soon as possible. Hearing him Vali got pissed as he now knew that currently his grandfather was at a level where he can do nothing about him. Plus knowing how Tetsaya is involved with the three factions and about him keeping office at his place, made it sure that Rizavan will cross Tetsaya's path, and meet his end by his hand. He looked at Tetsaya with a serious expression on his face and said, this is the second time that you have made me piss this much. Tetsaya just smiled in reply to his statement and said, my pleasure. Tetsaya then looked at his team and said, anyway regarding the warning that he gave me, it might be possible that he would be trying to kidnap any of you to gain my weakness. If that does happen, there is only one thing you have to do. That is to make them regret for ever being born in this world. You are free to go all out against them. Well then I have some things to care of now, so I would be excusing myself. Asia heal their remaining injuries and Loki, you are getting late for your shift. Loki immediately looked at the clock and got shocked. Fuck I am late my pay will get cut hey boss can you please give me back my magic for a while SI, that I can teleport. But Tsutsaya just smiled in response and said, move your ass now, or I might even cut something from your bonus. Loki clicked his tongue and grabbed his bike keys, which was given to him by Tsutsaya and immediately rushed outside. Once he was gone Tsutsaya once again looked at the others only to see Asia knocking down to hero faction members, by punching them in the gut and then dragging them back to their room for treatment. Jian who was the last one left immediately carried Siegfried's body over her shoulders and said, I will help moving them there. Asia just gave a beautiful smile which was not a bit convincing, as she was dragging the motionless bodies of Cow Cow and Heracles and said, Oh my, you are a very cooperating person, unlike these pieces of shit, who should be buried six feet under the ground. Well then let's go Jian-san. 
Jian was totally speechless hearing the words that came out of the angel like Asia and asked her, You were a former nun, right Asiason? Asia nodded her head and asked with an innocent expression on her face, Yes, is there some problem with that? The corpses that you are dragging right now are the problem, was the thought that came to Jian's mind. But she just gave a wry smile and said, And nothing. It's just that I was a former exorcist as well, so I was just a bit curious about it. Asia just nodded with a smile on her face and said, Then we have very much in common. The rest of them looked at the blondes talking to each other inside. Titsaya just smiled seeing them and said, well, looks like she made a new friend. Good for her? Well, then I will be going out for now. Roswiss, you can take a day off today. And then walked out of the room. The rest of the people who were left behind looked at each other, looked at each other, and Vali said, it's troublesome. Here after all that, hey, is there a training room here? Ingvald looked at Vali and nodded her head, and then led him and the other two boys of the Vali team to the training ROO and the non-time chamber one. The girls who were left behind looked at each other, and Kiroka suddenly said, Suo, shall we go out as well? Just as girls. I will call Shuren as well. All the girls looked at each other, and then Miyuki said, Then we might as well call the girls from the Gremory and Citri Peerage as well, and have a party today. Who knows when Onisama will make us go for training once again. The others nodded their heads, but Raya raised her hand said, Sorry, but I'm going to Dimensional Gap today. There might be some problems that could have arisen because of my absence. Office got up from her seat as well and said, I will go with Barker Red as well. I want to see what happened to my home since she is here now. And then both of the dragon gods teleported two away. Miyuki looked at the rest of the girls and asked, So anyone else who have to take care of something? Hearing which both Kirumi and Tiamat raised their hands and Kirumi said, Yasaka wanted to have a sparring session today, so as to not get rusty, so I will be going there. Tiamat looked at them and said, I have to take care of the baby dragons at the familiar forest, and clean my treasures, so I will be busy as well. And then both of them teleported as well. Once both of them were gone Ingvald returned back and asked, So what are we doing today? All of them looked at each other and then said, We are having a girls only outing with the girls from Citri and Gremory Peerage, wanna go with us? To which Ingvald nodded her head and agreed to their plans. Meanwhile in a coffee shop where hardly any customer was there two people were sitting at a table while drinking their coffee. One of them was TATSUYA now in his adult form who was looking at a man in front of Han with a serious expression on his face and asked, so even you don't know which of the new recruits leaked away the information. The man shook his head and said, sorry, but as far as the new recruits are concerned, I have not seen anyone being specially close to Rizavim and Euclid, so I cannot pinpoint who's doing is this. Titsaya just sighed and asked, anyway what the hell are those two planning right now? The man shook his head and said, I don't have that much information, they are still a bit wary of me to tell me what they are planning right now. But one thing is clear. What they are doing is going to be big and destructive, since the movement of the members of the old Satan faction is speeding at a high rate. The man then took a sip from his cup and said, Sorry for not being that useful in this case. But Tetsaya just shook his head and said, No need to apologize, you are doing very well being undercover under them. Just make sure to not get caught by them, and closely watch their every step and report it back to me. The man just sighed and said, It's very troublesome, but still I am indebted to you. He then showed a small smile and said, Very well then I will try to dig a bit deeper in the organization once I get back there. He then finished his cup and got up from his chair and said, Anyway thanks for the coffee and once again thanks for saving my cousin back then. Tetsaya got up from his seat as well and shook the man's hand and said, mention not and just stop with the thanks and all about you cousin, you have already told that to me a million times Die Horsa. Die Horsa laughed a bit and said, I am just showing my gratefulness to you, so don't mind it that much, and then teleported back to Underworld. He then lay back a bit on his seat and said, don't you know it's bad to eavesdrop on someone. The person who was sitting behind him laughed a bit and said, well, I got curious when you entered here and took a break from the bar for a bit. Don't mind me that much Tetsaya Khan. Tetsaya looked back at the person who was sitting behind him and said, So you're gonna tell Azazel about this Tobio. Tobio Arcus, the member of Slash Dog team which was under Azazel, looked at Tetsaya with a smile on his face and asked, if you didn't want me to tell him, you wouldn't have allowed me to hear your conversation in the first place, isn't that right? Tobio who was now in his bartender outfit, looked at Tetsaya with an amused expression on his face. Tetsaya chuckled at this and said, perceptive as always. Huh? But just inform him to keep all this to himself. There is a reason for why this is called undercover. Tobio nodded his head and said, so trying to gain a witness for this undercover operation, huh? Not bad Tetsaya-kun, not bad at all. Tetsaya nodded and was about to get up. But Tobio stopped him and said, Why not stay here for a bit, the others should be arriving here in a while. Tetsaya thought for a bit, and after he made sure that there was nothing else important to do today, he sat back on his seat and chatted with Tobio, until the other members of the Slash Dog team arrived. A few days have passed since Tetsaya was contacted by Rizavim and Euclid, and still nothing strange has occurred. Seeing that Tetsaya and the others just put all the tension at the back of their minds, and focus more on preparing themselves for anything that could happen. Vali and the others were specially preparing themselves so as to not let the opportunity to kill his grandfather pass on to Tetsaya. Kao Kao and the others on the other hand, were now back to their proper health, and were busy finding the people from their faction who were still not caught, but were only able to find one or two people yet. Currently Tetsaya and the others were sitting in the Orc club room with the others, discussing about the promotion the devils were supposed to go through in a few days. The group who was supposed to take the test was busy studying, except for Kaneko who for some reason, had a feverish look on her face, and was clinging on to Tetsaya while lying in his lap. 
Tetsuya on the other hand was a bit worried about her as he knew what was happening with her right now. This must be the call for her mating season way the minute, doesn't that mean that Hamari and the others would be going through this soon, as well no 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 more importantly, it is Kaneko's first mating season, but with a body like this. I don't think that she would be able to handle me. I can actually suppress her urges, but it might mentally affect her as well, making her think that she is lacking somewhere making me refuse her. Not to mention the others who will go through the session will make her feel left out as well. Should I accelerate her body growth? Titsaya caressed Kaneko's hair making her purr in delight. And while this was happening, Ravel was looking at her with a slight blush on her face, and slight bit of anger. Kaneko who noticed that someone was looking at her opened her eyes and saw Ravel. Both of them stared at each other for a while. But soon Kaneko gave a snort and showed a victorious smoke cake. Her face, making Ravel grit her teeth in anger. Just as she did that Tetsaya smacked her head lightly and said, No picking fights Kaneko-chan. Don't think that just because you are undergoing that will let you do as you please. Kaneko looked at Tetsaya stick out her tongue, and then looked away with a slight blush on her cheeks. Tetsaya looked at Ravel and said, Don't get angry at her Ravel-chan, she is just a bit sick right now. Ravel looked at Tetsaya and immediately shook her hands and said, No, I am not angry at all Tetsaya-sama. It's just that I was a bit displeased seeing the thieving cat acting disrespectfully towards you, that's all. Kaneko didn't open her eyes and said, Shut up bird brain, Tetsaya-senpai, don't think of me as acting disrespectful. Just admit it that you are jealous. Ravel immediately glared back at Kaneko and said, This thieving cat. And once again Kaneko received a light smack on her head by Tetsaya making her pout. Acting cute won't save you from all this you know. And ruffled her hair. Gasper who was looking at them from the side, looked at Asia and asked in a low voice Asia Sen Asia Sen Asia, looked at the cross-dressing damper with a confused look on her face and asked, what happened Gasper Khan? You want to ask something? Gasper nodded her head and asked, what is wrong with Kaneko-chan? Tetsuya Senpai just said that she is sick. Hearing his question all the people who were sitting there looked at him, and were wondering how Asia will answer the question. Asia being Asia looked at him with a smile on her face and said, oh, don't worry about it Gasper Khan, she is fine, it's just that she is just craving for a thick, long dick dash. But before she could finish Kagura shut her mouth with her hand and said, Gaspakan, it would be better if you ask Kibisen about this, being a boy he should be able to make you understand it in easier terms, since you are a boy as well. Gasper nodded and then went towards Kiba to ask him his question, and immediately batter that Kiba took Gasper outside with him as he was a butt embarrassed talking about such things in front of so many girls. Once the two were gone all of them looked towards Asia with an expression which said, don't you know how to sugarcoat words. But Kagura who was keeping her hand over Asia's mouth, had a few tick marks on her forehead, and suddenly yelled, stop licking my hand you idiot, and pushed her away. Asia who was now free to speak looked at Kagura and said, then don't block my mouth in the first place. Titsaya who was at the side listening to all of this, didn't think much about it and was silently eating sweets that Ravel made for him, along with her and Kaneko. Later that day Tetsuya returned home a bit earlier, since the others were busy doing their homework, while also assisting the devils who skipped the classes, so as to prepare for their promotion exam. Though he brought Kaneko back with him since he thought that Kuroka might make a better decision compared to him, since they were sisters and Kaneko could relate better with her. Tetsuya then entered the house with Kaneko following him silently with a feverish expression on her face. As soon as Tetsuya entered he saw the male members of Vali and Hero faction beaten Black Blue with Li Fei bandaging them up. Kuroka was just laughing her eyes off seeing them, while Jian was sighing while massaging her temples. Loki who saw Tetsaya coming inside stood up from the sofa and said, Boss, give me my power back for some time. I really want to beat the shit out of these punks. They broke all the alcohol bottles Tetsaya looked at Loki for a while, and then snapped his finger and said, Show them hell. Loki who felt the surge of power within his body, now had wide grin on his face and said, Hey white dragon and the god killer spear, I will show you what ill really is. How dare you destroy all my alcohol bottles you punks and then used his powers to teleport the two leaders and himself to a separate place. Tetsuya then looked at Kuroka and said, Kuroka, Kaneko would like to have some advice from you. Since you know it is that time of the year. Kuroka who heard what Tetsuya said, immediately perked up as soon as she knew that he knows which time it is. But then she looked at her sister, who had a feverish look on her face, and immediately calmed herself down. She gave a nod and took Kaneko's hand and said, Let's go to a different room Shirin, one Isen will help you. And then took her away. Tetsuya then looked at the other boys who were lying on the ground and asked, So what happened? Biku and Heracles immediately pointed at each other and said, They started it, huh? We started it? Like hell we did it was you stop copying me, you bastard. Tetsuya sighed seeing them acting like that, and then looked at Lefei and Jian. Both of them who noticed Tetsuya looking at them with an expression which said, Explain. Lefei nodded and said, You see Tetsuya and Isan. Arthur Nyasen and Seek San were having mock battle, seeing which Biku San and Heracles San got excited as well, and decided to have a mock battle as well. Jian then continued the story and said, but while having the battle by Mistake which was totally intentional, that monkey's staff hit Heracles' dash. Suddenly Heracles looked at them and said, he signed that fu asterisk king staff of his, on my balls. Arthur who was still hurt and was being treated by Lefei, immediately poked up and pointed his sword at Heracles and said, I advise you to not use such vulgar words. There are children here. But then another sword clashed with Arthur's and Siegfried said, and I told you, to not ignore me during a fight, you fucking idiot. Tetsaya who saw that snapped his finger making all them paralyzed and fall back on the ground and said, so let me get this straight, Arthur and Siegfried were having a mock battle. 
Seeing them Biku and Heracles got excited and decided to have a battle of their own, but by an intentional mistake, Biku hit his staff on Heracles. Inappropriate place making him curse which enraged Arthur since a fae was there as well. And Siegfried who was now ignored by everyone, got lonely and picked fight with Arthur, but used some inappropriate words to taunt him, making Arthur go total serious to kick his and Heracles butt, with Heracles determined to kill Biku for hitting him there. Am I correct? Hearing his deduction all of them dumbly nodded their heads with me Fei having a huge smile on her face. Titsaya nodded his head as well and asked, but how the hell are Vali and Kao Kao involved here? To which all of them said in unison, oh, nothing serious. They were just trying to kill each other off, the usual thing, you know. Titsaya just nodded his head and thought, I really live around some of the weirdest people in existence, and just shrugged his shoulders. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.